You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Attention shoppers, Mason's department store will close in 10 minutes. This is your last chance for all red tag items in 4 minutes. Here you are, ma'am. Thank you. Who's next? Just these things, please. One child's bathrobe, pajamas, and a pair of slippers. Will that be all? Yes, thank you. And how would you like to pay? Um, how much does it come to? With tax, your total is $57.63. Oh, is that the sale price? L let me see. Children's wear... Uh, yes, that department's on markdown. The slippers, too? Where did you find them? On the clearance table. There's a red tag. Very good. That'll be an additional 40% off. I I'll just adjust the total. Oh, that's better. Every little bit counts, doesn't it? Children grow so fast. If that's all... Christy? Christy, where are you? Here, Mommy. Time to go, darling. Mommy, look! What have you got there? A dolly. My, isn't she cute? She's the best doll in the whole world. Yeah, well, you better put it back now. Daddy's waiting. Can I have her, please? Uh, you already have a doll. Not like this one. Her name's Tina. Is it? Listen. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. Oh, please, Mommy. She wants to go home with me. She said so. Maybe next time. But she wants to go now. Uh, shall I add the doll? Well, no, I don't think so. My name is Talkie Tina, and I want to go home with you. See? What will they think of next, hmm? Excuse me. I'm in line here, too, you know? I'm sorry. Just a second. Will that be cash, ma'am? She's just like a real little girl. Aren't you, Tina? My name is Talkie Tina, and you're my new best friend. Oh, for the love of... I'll have someone restock it for you. Will you accept a charge? Certainly. Here's my card. If you'll just sign here, Mrs. Streeter. All right. I'll put everything in one bag. Would you like to carry it, honey? Oh, yes, Mommy. Thank you. Who's next? Well, it's about time. Do you have any more Shake Me Bake Me sets? Oh, I'm afraid not, sir. They sold out this morning. Well, come on. I only came out because of your advertisement. But I, I can give you a rain check. I don't want a rain check. I drove 15 miles to get a Shake Me Bake Me toy kitchen for my daughter, and I'm not going to leave without one. If you'd like to speak to the supervisor, I... You bet I would. I can't believe this. Come along, honey. We're holding up the line. We will, I promise. Yeah, as long as your daddy doesn't find out. Come on, Tina. We're going home. Meet Talkie Tina, the doll that does everything. A lifelike creation of molded plastic with a beautiful painted smile. For an only child named Christy, she's a brand new playmate. For her father, however... This particular doll is about to become a most unwelcome addition to the family. But don't worry, because without Talkie Tina, chances are he would never find his way into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Living Doll, starring Tim Kazarinski, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. This is where we live, Tina. See? Put her back in the bag with your other things. But Tina wants to see her new house. Just until we get inside. Okay. Come on, Tina. Honey? Yes, Mommy? Why don't you run upstairs with your doll? That way she can see your room. Can't Tina meet Daddy first? No, not yet. He's very busy today, remember? Okay. And a grand total for one month. Oh, I can't believe it. Eric? Hi. Oh, sorry we took so long. It doesn't matter. I'm still working on the taxes. Oh, did you make yourself lunch? Not yet. What'd you buy? 
Oh, nothing much. Just a couple of things Christy needed. Mm, what kind of things? Uh, go on upstairs, darling. Yes, Mommy. Come on, Tina. Now, wait a minute. Christy? What do you got there? It's nothing, Eric. No? <laughs> it's just a doll. A doll, huh? Show Daddy, honey. Her name's Tina. She doesn't need another doll. <sighs> she fell in love with it. What was I supposed to do? Her birthday's not for months. I thought we agreed. She's only a child. She's just like a real live girl, Daddy. For heaven's sake, Annabelle. A doll like that cost... <laughs> it was on sale. Oh, so that means we can afford it, huh? What was it, free? I put it on the account. Tina does everything, don't you, Tina? Her arms move and her eyes open. Watch. She sees you, Daddy. And she can even talk. My name is Talky Tina, and I love you very much. You have to admit it's adorable. <laughs> See? I just love her already. My name is Talky Tina, and I want to go home with you. <laughs> Isn't she cute? All right, all right. How much? Well, not that much. I know. It was on sale. You charged it. How much? Eric, that's enough. Christy, go to your room, please. Yes, Mommy. My name is Talky Tina, and you're my new best friend. Christy, hold on. What, Daddy? Let me see that doll for a minute. Eric, please. Hey, I've been doing the income and expenses while you were out. And now I have to write a check to the IRS. I can almost cover it if we don't go to the movies or eat out for a month. This is hardly the time to talk about... I asked you a question, Annabelle. How much did it cost me? You? I earn the money around here, don't I? I don't think it's the price of the doll that's upsetting you. Uh, here it comes. Here what comes? Some more of that Freudian gibberish you've been getting from her doctor. It is not Dr. Lubin's fault that she feels rejected. My name is Talky Tina, and I love you very much. Will you shut that thing off? Her name's Tina. Don't yell at her. Give it to me. Daddy, please. She's my dolly. Not until I decide if she's going to stay. Mommy. Go on. It'll be all right. I promise. <laughs> Eric, how could you? <sighs> what would you suggest I do? Start printing money? Charge accounts have to be paid, you know. We'll talk about this later. After you've had a chance to think about what you've just done to that little girl. More toys. More of everything for Christy. That's what she needs. Another doll. One that talks. My name is Talky Tina, and I don't think I like you. What? My name is Talky Tina, and I think I could even hate you. What kind of doll is this? Get out of here! What do you say now, huh? You all broken up about it? <laughs> My name is Talky Tina. You'll be sorry. Why, you... Eric? Yeah? Did you just throw something? What if I did? You broke the base. So I'll get you another one. <sighs> just tell me why. I don't like what it says. The doll? You might be interested to know it has quite a vocabulary. Listen. My name is Talky Tina, and I love you very much. I suppose that offends you in some way. That's not what it said a minute ago. Eric, I don't know how much more of this I can take. Oh, and exactly what is it you're taking? Your anger toward Christy. I know you're having a difficult time adjusting to her, but I can't let you treat her this way. She's my daughter, Eric. I love her. Oh, you love her, but I don't love her. I'm only your stepfather. I'm incapable of loving children because I can't have any of my own. That's what you're saying, isn't it? No, Eric, believe me, it's not. You could love Christy. I know you could if you'd only give yourself half a chance. Good. Then I'm not the cold, cruel ogre mommy and daughter think I am. Whew. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your faith in me. Eric, please, give us a chance. Christy and me. I know you got more than you bargained for when you married me. Two for the price of one. But we'll do anything to make you happy both of us. Daddy? Honey, just a minute. I'm sorry, Daddy. What? I'm sorry if I made you mad. Oh, Christy, I, I wasn't mad at you. Do you understand that? Sure, Daddy. Oh, there you are, Tina. No, 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 don't do that. Why? My name is Talky Tina, and I love you very much. 
Why not, Daddy? Uh, nothing. Uh, nothing at all. Come on, Tina. Let's go upstairs. Almost finished, Christy? Almost, Mommy. We are. Aren't we, Tina? Eat your vegetables so we can have dessert. What kind? Hmm? Tina wants to know what kind of dessert. Oh, your favorite, banana cream pie. Mmm. Be a good girl, Tina, and eat your supper. You eat your own supper, Christy. I am, Daddy. <laughs> I didn't know your doll could laugh. Oh, Daddy, Tina can do everything. Well, tell her not to do it at the table. What's the matter, Eric? Forget it. I didn't hear anybody laugh. Really? I thought I... Uh... You thought what? N nothing. Where'd you buy her? Mason's. It seemed like a good idea. Mm, did it? She'll be a good playmate for Christy. Lacking a brother or sister. Is that what you mean? I didn't say that. But it's what you meant. It's why you bought the doll, isn't it? So I'd have a reminder? It hadn't occurred to me, but if that's what you think... Give me your plate, Christy. Yes, Mommy. Here's Tina's, too. She ate all her food. Did she? Who's that? I'm sure I don't know. Who do you think it is, Tina? Well, stop talking to her like that. It's only a doll. No, she's not, Daddy. She's my new best friend. Can Christy come out and play? Hear that, Tina? It's Linda. Goody! Don't you want your dessert first? Later, Mommy. Can I take Tina? Not outside. But she wants to meet Linda. Well, Linda can meet her later. Okay. How about you? Uh, what? Do you want some dessert? Oh, sure. That'd be fine. Well, I'll bring you a piece of pie. Yeah, you do that. My name is Talkie Tina. Hey! Nobody pulled your string. And I'm beginning to hate you. Yeah? Well, my name's Eric Streeter. And you know what? I think I'm going to get rid of you after all. You wouldn't dare. Wouldn't I? Just watch. Don't pick me up. This is my chair. No, it's not. It's Christie's high chair. Or it was until she grew out of it. But you'll never grow because you're just a piece of plastic. Got that? What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? My name is Talkie Tina, and I think you're a very bad man. Shut up, you little wretch. Here's your pie. Thanks. What are you doing? Just seeing how it works. I thought you didn't like it. I don't, but it's pretty clever for a toy. Is there any coffee? Yeah, in the kitchen. I'll get it. You're nothing, understand? A kid's toy. I could twist your arm off or your leg. Ow! Don't tell me you have feelings, too. Doesn't everything... Oh, I see. Then I could hurt you. Not really. We'll see about that. But I could hurt you. <laughs> Tell me another one. Threats from a doll. Who were you talking to? Well, who do you think? Eric, please be careful with Christie's doll. Yeah, you can have it. I don't want it. I only meant... It means a lot to her. The game's over. The game? Oh, come on now. How dense do you think I am? I wish I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> Some invention, this thing. I guess I haven't kept up with the times. They must be doing great things with technology now. I didn't know they were putting walkie-talkies in dolls. Walkie-talkies? Voice chips, whatever they are. But there's hardly any technology to it. You've seen these before. Just a, a string that goes into the back of the doll. You pull it, and it plays a little record inside. Come off it, Annabelle. Didn't you think I'd catch on? Catch on to what? Well, all that stuff about hating me and the last bit about feelings. Doesn't everything. That was a nice touch. You should be a regular ventriloquist. Really, Eric, I don't know what... <laughs> Linda wants to see Tina. Can I? Can she, please? All right, dear. My name is Talkie Tina. 
Anna, and I love you very much. <laughs> I told you. She's so sweet. You can both play with Tina tomorrow after school, if Linda would like to come over. Oh, yes, Mrs. Streeter, that would be so neat. Oh, come on, Linda, it's the ice cream man. <laughs> that doll is sweeter, right? Especially with a speaker inside. What is it, one of those little transistor receivers? <laughs> think whatever you want, but it isn't true. It doesn't matter what I think. It's what I hear that counts. I have ears. I'm not stupid, you know. I didn't say you are. You don't have to. Nobody's playing tricks on you. Go ahead. Keep it up. I know you got a microphone around here somewhere. You and Christy are getting even with me. Isn't that right? That's ridiculous, Eric, and you know it. Is it? I noticed the doll never talks when you're in the room. Of course it does. It just did. Yeah, yeah, the pre-recorded line, sure, but not what it says to me. You're really serious. Sure I am. So tell me, how do you do it? There's nothing to tell. All right, don't tell me. Keep your secret. Play your little games. But I promise you one thing. Keep this up and you'll be sorry. Christy? Christy? My name is Talkie Tina, and you'd better put me down. Or what? What are you going to do about it, huh? Christy's not around to help you, and neither is her mommy. You'll be sorry. Nah, you're the one who's going to be sorry, starting right now. What are you doing? What I should have done the first time you mouthed off, put you where you belong. In the trash with the rest of the garbage. Where's Tina? I wouldn't know. You had her, Daddy. Go ask your mother. She's already asked me. And what did you tell her? That I don't know where she is. Then I guess that settles it. Do you know, Eric? Now, would I? Where is she, Daddy? If your mother can't tell you, neither can I. Tina must be around, Christy. Let's find her. I'll look in the kitchen. What do you think you're doing? Trying to read the evening paper. Is that all right with you? She's not in here. I'll help you look. You should be ashamed of yourself. About what? If anything's happened to her, doll... Hello? My name is Talkie Tina, and I'm going to kill you. Say that again. You heard me. How did you get out? Wouldn't you like to know? Who is this? Hello? Hello? Not there. Then where? Annabelle? Annabelle? Yes? Where is she? She's still looking. I'm not talking about Christy! We haven't found the doll, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I mean. You knew I put it in the trash can outside. You and now what? And now it's gone! Which means somebody took it. More games? Oh, Eric, I can't bear this. Neither can I! I am tired of... I'm tired of all this nonsense. A, a joke's a joke, but you've carried it too far. I have? You and Christy. Will the two of you stop it? <sighs> Eric, I didn't touch the doll. I haven't seen it since dinner. Am I, am I supposed to believe you? I swear. You're telling the truth? Of course I am. You really didn't take it? I didn't take it. And who? The phone call. What phone call? Well, you were on the extension. You said... What are you talking about now? Didn't you do that either? Do what? No. Of course it couldn't have been you. How could you make the phone ring? You couldn't even call unless it was from an outside line. But you were in the house the whole time. I didn't hear the phone ring. There must be an explanation. Some electronic device that taps into the line. Eric? The phone rang. I answered it. The doll's voice was loud and clear. It said, My name is Talkie Tina, and I'm going to kill you. What? That's what it said. Why would I lie? Oh, 
Eric, I don't know what to say. Or what to think. Well, one way or another, the doll's disappeared. If you didn't take it, that leaves Christy. Eric? Christy? Christy, are you awake? Did you... I told you you'd be sorry. Get away from her. Get out of her bed and out of this house. Tina? I'll be back. And when I do, I'll have some questions for you, little girl. Christy, wake up! Daddy? Stay where you are, Christy. I want Tina. Don't worry about that thing. I have to borrow it for a while. But she's mine. Lie back down. Tina belongs to me. Daddy? Daddy? What's happening? Daddy, please! Where are you going with her doll? To do what I should have done. Daddy! Get one thing straight, Christy. I am not your daddy. There, there. He won't hurt her. Tina! Tina! Know where you are now, baby doll? Where? Take a look around, if those eyes of yours can even see. Welcome to my workroom. You don't scare me. This is a garage. Right, and this is my workbench. And these, these are my tools. What kind of tools? Well, let's see what we have here. Know what this is, doll face? A vice. That's what. What are you going to do? What does it look like? I'm going to put your cute little head in it and crack you open like a ripe tomato. You can try. We'll see about that. You better stop. Yeah? Or what? Get ready to die. Don't say I didn't warn you. You're the one who's going to die. How's this? What's the matter? Can't finish the job? A big, strong man like you? <clears throat> Why won't it close any tighter? I want to see those plastic eyes of yours pop out of your head. You can't hurt me. I thought you said you had feelings. I can stand it if you can. Mm, something else, then. How about a torch? That's it. A little butane. This'll raise your temperature. You'll melt like a rubber band on a hot stove. All we need is a spark to light it. Now we turn the nozzle till we get a nice blue flame. <clears throat> no problem. Just give it a spark one more time. Ah, that's okay. Third time's the charm. Ah, the lighter's empty. <laughs> You're funny. We're wasting time. Time for the big guns. How about a table saw? Diamond tip blade? That'll do the trick. Cuts right through solid steel. <clears throat> now, you lay there. Go on, close your eyes, because this is the last thing you'll ever see. I'll make it a clean cut. Straight through that little pink throat. Say your prayers. Why won't it cut? Why? Eric? Get away from me. What are you doing? Only what I have to. Eric, no! Give me that doll! Leave me alone! So I can't cut you, but you're still done for. You don't stand a chance. Now what, you funny man? Try this on for size. I got a burlap bag somewhere and some rope. Yes! You know what people do with kittens, don't you? Well, let me show you. Say they don't want them around anymore, because they're always in the way. They put them in a sack and they tie it up real tight. Lots of rope, and they make a knot that nobody can untie. There. Then they cut the rope with a pocket knife. And they take the sack outside and put it in the trash can. Only this time, they put a cinder block on top of the lid to make sure it stays put. Now let me see you get out of that. 
What are you doing? What does it look like? Uh, you're packing your suitcase. But why? Are you joking? N no, I'm not joking. I'm asking you a simple question. I think I deserve an answer. Think about it, Eric. How could I go on living with you after what you've done? Well, I, I had to. Had to? You had to show your hatred for me and for Christy? It's over with. Things will be better now. You'll see. Oh, will they? Listen, Annabelle, that doll... What about that doll, Eric? It's a toy, nothing more. One that means a great deal to her. And you've destroyed it. That was a hateful thing to do. She'll never forgive you, and neither will I. The doll talked to me. It said things that no toy would say. Don't you see? I had to get rid of it. Yeah, I see a great many things now. You've become a stranger to me. A sick, neurotic stranger. You're full of blind, unreasonable hate. Hate? But I did it for us. I love you and Christy. Well, then you've got a strange way of showing it. I don't believe you know what love is anymore. And you're suffering from some very dangerous delusions. You'd better find a good psychiatrist. Delusions? I couldn't have imagined it. You tell that psychiatrist you tried to kill a doll. I, I couldn't have. What did you do with it, by the way? So I can get the remains out of this house before Christy finds what's left. It's still in one piece. I'll bring the doll inside if that's what you want. I'll give it to Christy myself. How magnanimous of you. Will that make everything right? I don't know, Eric. I honestly don't know. I want things to be right between us. All three of us. It's a little late for that, don't you think? Just let me try. Give me one minute. That's all I'm asking. Oh, Eric. Eric. There. The trash can. Cinder block on top. Same as I left it. No problem. Cut the rope off. Oh, thank God. Good as new. My name is Talkie Tina, and I don't forgive you. Shut up. Shut up! Just until we get inside. Christy, are you awake? Yes. Oh, Christy, honey, listen to me. Where's my dolly? Daddy's bringing her. You'll see. He was mean to her. Oh, honey, he couldn't help it. Sometimes Daddy gets mad. It's not your fault. Why doesn't he like her? He's got a lot on his mind. You know how hard he works, but he's going to be better now. He's going to see a doctor, and this doctor's going to make him well again. Promise? We just have to be patient with him. Dry your eyes now. Christy, look what I've got. Tina! Did you miss her? Well, now she can sleep with you, right next to your pillow, all night long. Is that okay? Oh, Tina, Tina! Thank you, Eric. Uh, satisfied? Yeah, we'll talk about it in the morning. But I, but I did what you wanted. In the morning. Did you hear that? No. Oh, what is it now? I heard something. Well, I didn't hear anything. Go back to sleep. Well, I haven't been to sleep yet. Oh, Eric, it's late. Now, you heard that, didn't you? It's nothing. Somebody could be in the house. Did you lock up? Of course I did. But somebody could have broken in. It's probably Christy. I'd better see if she's all right. I'll go. No, you stay here. Christy? Christy? Mm. Oh, you're okay. Good, that's good. But, but where's your doll? Tina. Where is it? What? Who's there? Somebody's downstairs. I'm calling the police. Do you hear me? Eric? Shh. Stay there. 
I'm going downstairs to check it out. What is it? I'm not sure. If I don't come right back, call the police. Maybe I left the door to the garage unlocked. Yeah, that's it. Don't turn on the lights yet. Catch them red-handed. <laughs> Try to move. It was the doll. The doll. I tell you, get it, get it out. Lie still. I'll call the doctor. Out of the house. Do wait for me. My neck's broken. You have to promise to get rid of it. The doll. <sighs> Eric! My name is Talkie Tina. <gasps> you! Get, a get away from him! You'd better be very, very nice to me. No! No! <laughs> of course, we all know that dolls can't talk. Not really. Nor can they lie in wait and trip a man on a dark stairway, because that would be murder. And that's one thing no doll can do. That is, unless her name is Tina, and she happens to have been manufactured in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Living Doll, starring Tim Kazarinski with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Jerry Saul. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, Christian Stolte, Deb Dotzer, Amy Sparrow, and Paul Patch. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Our local headlines for the hour, it looks like that rainstorm from the northeast has dissipated. 
So we can expect scattered low clouds in the a.m., clearing by early afternoon and followed by some sunshine. I'm waiting, Henry. In a minute, Mama. Barley's going to be on the news. Henry, come in the kitchen right now. One more minute. And in sports, here's a flash from the past. One of the city's favorite sons is set for an important boxing match tonight at St. Nick's Arena. Mama, come here. What is it? Quick. For this battling middleweight, tonight's the night, the one that counts. I thought you were going to help me with the dishes. Look! Henry, I need you now. Look! Why, that's a picture of Bowley. But after such a checkered career, can he make a comeback? I know. To put it another way, is this bout really necessary? No fighter lasts forever, and sports fans don't want to see a good man take a beating in the ring. So here's this reporter's advice to Bowley Jackson. It's time to pack it in. Find another line of work if you have to, but take care of yourself and stay out of the game. Get a job behind the scenes, training younger, stronger, talented young bloods whose careers are ahead instead of behind them. Now. Yes, Mama. You're a good boy, Henry, but you gotta learn. Don't get your hopes up too high or you'll... Where are you going now? I gotta see Bowen. Leave him alone. He must be busy getting ready. But he needs me. Listen to me, Henry. Some things you just can't wish for. They're too big. You just set yourself up for a big disappointment. Please. He's my friend. Well, just for a second. But don't you get in his way now. I won't. In and out of the ring, it's been up and down. After a string of early victories, he found it hard to keep getting up again and again. So read the handwriting on the wall. Don't get hurt this time, champ. You proved you could do it. Now it's time to step aside. Oh, Bully, please, please listen to the man. In this corner of the universe, a prize fighter named Bully Jackson. 183 pounds, a little over his best weight, and an hour and a half away from his chance for a comeback at St. Nick's Arena. Mr. Bowley Jackson, who now lives in a tenement building and by the standards of his profession is an aging, over-the-hill relic of what was, and who now sees a reflection in his dresser mirror of a man who left too many pieces of his youth in too many stadiums for too many years before too many screaming people. Mr. Bowley Jackson, who might do well to look for some gentle magic in the hard-surfaced glass that stares back at him from somewhere in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Big Tall Wish, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hey, Bowley, you in there? Uh, Henry, what you doing here? Want to help you get ready for the fight. Can I? Yeah, sure you can. We're friends, aren't we? Come on in. Okay. Go on, sit down on the bed while I finish packing my gear. You feeling good, Bowley? You feeling sharp? Take a tiger tonight, huh, Bowley? Take a tiger, Henry. You're gonna take me a tiger? Show me how you're gonna do it. Left, right, and one in the stomach. Bow! Just like that. Yeah! Then lift him up by the tail. And then what? And throw him all the way out to the night row! Looking at yourself in the mirror, huh? Yeah, you're looking good, Bully. You're looking sharp. You gonna watch it on TV? You fooling? I'll yell so loud, you'll hear me all the way to St. Nick's. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what I see in the mirror? A fighter don't need a scrapbook, Henry. You want to know about what he's done, where he's been? You can read it right in his face. He's got the whole story right there, cut into his skin. Yeah. Well, where'd you get that scar anyway? Which one? Over your eye. Ah, oh, that's St. Louis. Guy named Sailor Levette. Real fast boy. See this nose? 
that was Memorial Stadium, Syracuse, New York. Italian boy, fought like Henry Armstrong, all hands and arms, just like a windmill all over you. That was the first time I ever had my nose broke twice in one fight. Did it hurt bad? Sure it did. What you think? Gee, Bully, that's tough. Moving south, Henry, moving south. Now, this ear, Miami, Florida. Boy got me up against a ring post, did this here, with his laces on the face. That's where you read it. Start at the first match and move across Pittsburgh, Boston, Syracuse. I'm a tired old man, Henry. Tired old man trying to catch a bus. But the bus already gone. Left a couple of years ago. Aw, oh, that ain't true. Here, look for yourself. Hands all heavy. Legs all rubbery. Short breath. One eye not so good, and there I go running down the street trying to catch this bus to glory. Stop talking like that. I'm only telling the truth. Bowley, you're going to catch a tiger tonight. I'm sure going to try. I know you are, because I'm going to make a wish. I'm going to make a big, tall wish. And you ain't going to get hurt none either. I'm going to make a wish that you don't. You hear? I don't want you getting hurt. You've been hurt enough already, and you're my friend, Bowley. You're my good and close friend. You are a good boy, Henry. Good boy. And I thank you. Nah, nah you go on. I gotta get my gym back packed. I'll wait and walk you downstairs. Okay, boy, okay, okay. I like that just fine. There you are, Henry. Hi, Mama. Where did you run off to? I'm helping Bowley. Well, don't get in his way. You got quite a boy there, Francis. Quite a boy. I hope he didn't bother you too much. Him? No, no. He, he talks like a little old man sometimes, you know. Real intense. Says I'm his good and close friend. Well, you are. You know, he's mine, too. I don't think I ever had a friend like him. You're good to him, Bowley. You're real good to him, taking him to ball games all the time, taking him out for walks. Hard for a boy not to have a father around. He never did know his. I know he didn't. He won't be going to bed tonight till you get back. Uh, don't let him stay up too late. Take care of yourself, Bowley. I hope, I hope you don't get hurt none. I'll work hard on it. I'm going to make a wish, Bowley. I'm going to make a wish nothing happens to you. So don't you be afraid, understand? Don't you be afraid, no matter what, because nothing can hurt you. You hear me? Nothing. That boy. You're more than his friend, Bowley. He's got you in a shrine. Why would he do that? Because you deserve it. Scared old man who don't remember nothing except how to bleed. I don't fit in no shrine, Francis. Don't talk like that. But you tell him. You tell him how I'm obliged for his wish. I think he already knows. Because that's what I need right now. Just a little magic. He's been talking about making a wish all day. Has he? He's all the time making wishes, Bully. I see him standing there in the bedroom in the dark, looking out of the window. I come in real quiet and I say, Henry, why don't you go to sleep? And he turns around with that serious little face of his and he says... Making a wish, Mama. Making a wish for this, making a wish for that. Oh, he's all the time wishing. Why, just the other night. What? Oh, it was nothing. Tell me. Well, I needed some more money for the rent. Fifty dollars. Henry said he was going to make the big, tall wish. That's his biggest kind, the big, tall wish. He don't waste it on just anything. It's what he calls the most important one. That was last Friday. And then what do you know? A woman I did some nursing for out on the island sent me a check. Just like that. A check for fifty dollars. And that was exactly how much I needed. I was real lucky. Yeah. That's what it was. Luck. Little boys are something, huh? Yes, they are. Little boys with their heads full up with dreams. And then... When does it happen, Francis? What do you mean? 
When do they suddenly know there ain't any magic? When does somebody push their face down on the sidewalk and say to them, Hey, little boy, it's concrete. That's what the world is made out of. Concrete and gutters and dirty old buildings and tears for every minute you're alive. Oh, bully. When do they find out that you can wish your whole life away? But sometimes, what we wish for, it can come true. You know that part too, don't you? I know I'm all wished out. That's the only thing I know for sure. Good luck tonight, Bowley. We'll be waiting for you. Sure, I appreciate it. You kiss him goodnight for me now, if it gets too late. I will. Hey, Bowley, knock him out for me. Yeah, no TKO. Out cold. I got a bet down on you. That <laughs> no good bum. I thank y'all sincerely. You folks are good neighbors. Bowley, we all know you're the best. Well, just don't bet too much now. Why not? You're gonna beat him, aren't you? Yeah, which round? Wanna call it? How about the first round? Put him out of his misery. I do the best I can, boys. Best I can. Hey, Joe. There you are, Jackson. What's happening? What you standing back here for? You're supposed to be getting ready. Just checking out the house. Well, forget about it. Thomas won't cut you a piece of the action. Not tonight. How come? Not much box office. Too many people at home watching on TV. So all you get's the guarantee. Ah, that's all right. Just wanted to check it out. Been a while. Ah, a while. But it's always the same. Cigars, beer, hot dogs, sweat, canvas. Never forget places like this, the way they smell. All this time, I guess I missed it. Go on in the dressing room. In a minute. I'll give you a rub down. We got time. Something wrong, Jackson? Like what? You're not freezing up on me. I'm here, Anna. I've been working out all month. No offense. I just thought, seeing as how you've been away for a while. Don't talk down to me, Joe. You might have a slight case of the jitters, that's all. Not me. Never did. Never will. Don't worry about it. You'll do fine. Sure I will. You look good. You really do. How was the weigh-in, Slugger? Right on the money. Like I said, you're looking real good. He didn't last long. He never does anymore. Slugger Malone. Never could take a punch. That's why he's on the mid-card. Ever since you put him away in Philly. That was a long time ago. Longer for him. How's that boy I got tonight? Nothing much. He still don't know what he's doing. All over the place. Still pretty young. Yeah, he's just a kid. <laughs> Better take it easy on him. Never see that left jab coming. All right, stand back. Let him through. How you doing, Malone? That you, Bully? Yeah, it's me. Hey, man. Saw the fight. Sorry about that. You did all right. Stay on your feet. Let me see that eye. Get away from my boy, Jackson. He's hurt. It tagged me pretty good. Eh, it's not too bad. Clean cut. Time heals up fast. Come on, Malone. Hold up. Slugger. You're gonna be okay. You hear me? Hey, Bully. Where you been anyway? I ain't seen you around. Ah, here and there. You know how it is. Yeah, I know. You just take it easy for a while. Be good as new. You'll see. You still got that left jab? Sure I do. You sure, Bully? I got a bet down on you. Well, I was gonna, but I... Let's go, Slugger. I see him alone. Yeah, I see you in the funny papers. Move it. Hey, Bully, when you gonna give me a rematch, huh? Anytime, Slugger. Anytime. He was never that much. He did the best he could. All he can do. Yeah, well, you better lace him up now. Sure, Joe. Thomas will be waiting. I bet he will. It's almost showtime. Hurry up, Mazel. I got it. There, Bully. Your hands are taped real good, just like old times. How's it feel? Feels okay. Feels good, Joe. Sure it does. Nice and tight, the way I like it. Ready? I'm ready. What did I tell you? He's all ready, Thomas. 
Uh-huh. Put out that cigar, will you? What do you care? I gotta breathe in here. Well, you hired me to rep you for the night, Bowley. It's a package deal. Me and the cigar. I told you to butt it out. Yeah, maybe you can back that up. Maybe not. Ain't no maybe. Give it to me. Yeah, you got attitude. I'll say that for you. I like that in my boys. This one here, <laughs> he's a pretty feisty old man. He ain't old. You know what I think? The older they are, the louder they talk. And the more they want, the less chance they got to get it. How'd I get you tonight, Bowley? Just lucky, I guess. I'm a bargain, Bowley. I'm the expert on has-beens. I've seen your boys. Have you? Catchers, aren't they? All of them. Guaranteed two rounds each. Shovel them in, shovel them out. Then sew them back together for the next time. <laughs> that's the way to do it, if that's all you got to work with. He don't mean nothing, Thomas. Maybe I do. Month or so from now, Bowley, maybe I'll sign you at the back door. That's what you think? Well, why not? You're long gone. You've had it. Wait till after tonight. You'll want to get in the stable, too. That's right. All you have to do is guarantee two rounds. Two! Three prelims every month. Do that standing on your head, can't you? I thought the smell came with the cigar, but you wear it all over you, Thomas. You know something? You stink. Mm-hmm. You tell him, champ. Let's see if you can do it in the ring. Johnson, ten minutes. Yeah, he'll be there. I pulled you for a manager this time. Well, just lucky, I guess. So let's see if you can do your job. Now, what about tonight? What about tonight? Better sit down and lace him up. What should I look out for? <laughs> you serious? I only seen this boy fight once. That was a couple of years ago. I could say. No? I ain't never seen him. Are you sure? I'm sure. What about it, Joe? That's true? Well, uh, I don't know. You've watched him fight, all right. Hey, let go of me. A matter of fact, you've seen him six times in the past year. I keep up, see? Hey, hey, you're imagining things. You are a piece of garbage, Thomas. You're betting on him, aren't you? Aren't you? You got a mouth on you, Jackson, you know that? Yeah? You think so? Bowley, what are you doing? You better listen to Joe. It ain't enough he sells Rex by the pound. He comes in here for some dirty money, supposed to help me, and then he bets on the other guy. I may be a bum upstairs in another ten minutes, but I'm gonna fight a beautiful first round in here. Hey, hey, you touch me again, I'll have you up for ten years. Yeah? Yeah, I swear to you, Bowley, I'll fix your wagon good. Lay off me, Bowley. You're digging your own grave, you crummy tanker. Bowley, please, don't hit him again. You just got lucky you hit the wall instead of me that time. Bully, your hand! See you later, Jackson. Let me see it. Aw, oh, man, what'd you go and do that for? Don't worry about me. It wasn't enough you had to spot him all those years. It wasn't enough, huh? Now you gotta walk in with four busted knuckles. Oh, you're bleeding right through the tape. So what? You've seen blood before? I'll put a bandage on it. Leave it. Bowley, come here. I don't care, Joe. Somebody's got to teach that lowlife a lesson. Maybe so. Maybe. But not you. Not tonight. Okay, Jackson, you're on. Well? Well, nothing. Let's do it. You sure, Bowley? Give me my gloves. Right here. Ah, uh, careful. Poor little Henry. Who? Oh? I put two strikes on his magic already. What are you talking about? Nothing, nothing, Joe. It don't matter. Because he's got to learn. Who's got to learn? This friend of mine is named Henry Temple. He's got to learn that there ain't no such thing as magic. Watch any more, Henry. Stop it! 
Please, turn it off now. He's down! Jackson is down! It's as good as over! Henry, do you hear me? Get away from the TV. Please, Bully! What are you doing? Somehow he reached way, way down, sucked it up, and landed a left jab in a combination that put the lights out for Simmons, the favorite. Ladies and gentlemen, Foley Jackson has done it. He's back. It's all over, Bowley. I'm sorry, Joe. What are you sorry for? For letting you down. You did it! Who? You did! Did? Did what? Knocked him clean out! Are you sure? Look at him! Where? Hey, drag that bum out of here! Which bum? Simmons! Get an ambulance while you're at it! He ain't going nowhere! Joe, I, th I think I blacked out. I don't, I don't know what happened. Well, I do. Everybody saw it. You put the old one-two on him, but good. Way to go, champ. Knew you could do it. Way to go! Joe, my, my hand. My hand. Is it broke? Oh, it, it don't even hurt. <laughs> then raise it up! And the winner, by knockout, at 1.23 in the second round, our own Bowie Jackson! Jackson, winner! Come on, Bowie, put on your robe and let's go. Take a shower and get dressed. We got some celebrating to do. Something's not right about this, Joe. What do you mean? I, I don't know what it is. But something is just... Something's not right about this. How do I look, Joe? Like a million bucks. You didn't need a shower. Never even worked up a sweat. <laughs> Look in the mirror! Not a mock on you! Oh, you're beautiful, Bowley! Yeah, but he kept on hitting me and hitting me. When? All through the first round and the second. But you was bobbing and weaving. He never laid a glove on you. You positive? Yep, you done dandy. Joe, look at this hand. My fingers are fine. They sure are. You were wrong, huh? I just bruised it, I guess. It hurt like anything, but somebody said I got him with it full on. It couldn't have been broken after all. Who said it was? You did, and it, and it felt like it too. I could feel the knuckles coming up through the bandage. I don't know, I, I could have sworn it was busted. And when he knocked me down... What? He did what? Knocked me down, Joe. When he knocked me down, I, I don't even remember getting up. And the next thing I knew, there was Simmons laying on his back. Well, then you and me, we was in different arenas tonight. What are you saying? You didn't get knocked down, Bowley. You was never off your feet. I wasn't. No, you sure wasn't. This one you carried all the way, baby, just like the old days. Who's that? Your fans. Who'd you think? I don't believe you. You want I should open the door and let him in? Hey, Jackson. Show us how you did it. What a job. What a right. I knew he could. Bobby, when you gonna fight again? Hey, you gonna get a title shot. How about a picture? Wait, Joe, close the door. Uh, just a minute, folks. The champ will be right out. Let me get this straight. What's to get? You hear that bunch? Enjoy it! I wasn't off my feet. Nope. I didn't go down. Not once. Would I lie to you? All these years, you ever know me to lie to you? No. Then what are you waiting for? Let's go and paint the town red. No, I, I, I don't know, Joe. There's something I gotta do. Like what? Well, I sort of promised somebody I'd see him later after the fight. <laughs> you don't mind if I have a good time, do you? Ah, of course not, Joe. <laughs> You're entitled. Just remember me to all the guys, okay? Maybe I'll hook up with you later. You got it. Good night, old-timer. Just remember, I'm real proud of you. Hey, 
Hey, there he is. Beautiful, Bully. I watched the whole thing. Didn't take long. Second round. Thank you. Oh, you were great, Bully. We seen you on the television. You was really great. Just beautiful. Let me feel your muscles. Wow, you clobbered him good. That was a real right hand. Where'd you get a right hand like that? You know something? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know. Ha, yeah, he don't know. Thank you all. I gotta get inside now. Somebody I want to see. Francis, I just wondered if... You should have seen him, Bowley. He liked to went out of his mind. He was so happy. Whole building was shaken. You'd never believe it. Is he... He's up on the roof, waiting for you. I'll see to him. Send him down soon, Bowley. It's real late. Bowley! What do you say, Henry Temple? Come here and give me a hug. You were a tiger, Bowley. You were a real tiger. Look okay? Sharp. Sharp like a champ. You was Armstrong and Lewis and Ali and everybody all wrapped up into one. Oh, <laughs> well, hey, 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 you know something? That boy must have hit me so hard, he knocked the hurt right out of me. How come? Because, Henry, I don't remember a doggone thing. I mean, I must have really been punchy for a second because I thought he had me on my back. And there I was, I was looking up at that old ref waving his arm down on me, and I was staring up at the light blinking my eyes, and it must have been some kind of dream or something. I don't know nothing about that. Henry, I was never off my feet. I never got knocked down. Is that right? I gotta go. Henry, look at me, boy. Look at me. I was never off my feet. Say it. Am I your true friend? Yeah! Friends don't tell lies to each other. Now tell the truth. Henry, I'm asking you, was I laying on my back and on the way out? Y yes But nobody remembers it. Nobody at all except me. I thought it happened, but it didn't. I thought I was laying there on my back getting counted out, but everybody tells me... Bowley, I made the big wish then. I had to make the big wish. I wish you were never knocked down. I just shut my eyes and I... And I wish real hard. It was magic, Bowley. We had to have magic right then. No. Oh, no. Had to, Bowley. Nothing left for us then. Had to make a wish. Crazy kid. Don't you know there ain't no magic? Bowley, you're hurting me. There ain't no magic or wishing or nothing like that. You're too big to believe in fairy tales. If you wish hard enough, Bowley, it'll come true. If you wish hard enough and then believe it, it'll stay that way. Somebody's got to knock it out of you, don't they? Somebody got to take you by the hair and rub your face in the world and give you a taste and smell of the way things are, don't they? Listen, boy, I've been wishing all my life. You understand, Henry? You understand? I got a gut ache from wishing, and all I got to show for it is a face full of scars and a head full of memories of all the hurt and all the misery I've had to eat with and sleep with my whole miserable life. Oh, you crazy kid. I'm not. Crazy, crazy kid. You, you, you telling me you wished me into a knockout? You telling me it was magic that they got me off my back? Uh, now, listen, boy, there ain't no magic, huh? No magic, Henry. I had that fight coming and going. I had it in my pocket, man. I was the number one out there, and there ain't no such thing as magic. Bully, if you believe, understand? You've got to believe. If you don't believe, Bully, it won't be true. That's the way magic works, Bully. You gotta believe. Please, please believe. Little nutcase. That's what you are. How come I got mixed up with you? Ain't I got enough trouble without getting mixed up with some dopey kid that... <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, Henry. Henry, come here, come here, come here. Henry, look at me. I can't believe 
I'm too old and I'm too hurt to believe. I I can't, boy, I just can't. And Henry, there ain't no such thing as magic. God help us both. I wish there were. Bodhi, you got to believe. I can't. You got to. Bodhi, you got to believe. Or else... I told you. I can't. Then if you can't, Bodhi, if you can't... Eight, nine, ten, he's off! Come on, Jackson. I'll help you up. Oh. What happened? Ah, the kid got in a lucky punch. Don't worry about it. Don't mean nothing. You should have stayed in bed, Bully. How come you didn't use your jab and you're right? I broke my hand, that's why. He do that to you? No, no, I did it to myself. It was a, it was an accident. Oh, man, Bully, are you kidding me? You ought to pack it in, Bully. Get yourself a real job. Excuse me, I, I gotta go in. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I was afraid you got hurt. Me? No, 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 I'm too tough for that. You sure? Let me see. Oh, Bully, that's a bad cut right there. And those bruises? Let me clean it up for you. Maybe later. Where's Henry? He's in bed, Bowley. I, I have to tell you, that's a sad little boy in there. Can I see him? Sure. I expect he's waiting for you. Bowley? Yeah? I'm real sorry. I know you are, Francis. Me too. Henry? You're not talking to me? Sure I am. Uh, I pulled a rock, Henry. Threw a punch before I should have, hit the wall. See, I, I busted my knuckles, and I went in with half my artillery gone. You still look like a tiger. You look like a real tiger. I was proud of you. I was real proud. That's good. I better go now. Night, Henry. Bowley? You go to sleep. Tomorrow we'll go to the hockey game, and we'll get some hot dogs in the park. Just, just you and me. Sure thing, Bowley. That'll be great. And Bowley, I ain't gonna make no more wishes. I'm too old for wishes. There ain't no such thing as magic. Is there? No, I guess not, Henry. Or maybe, maybe... Hey, maybe there is magic. Maybe there's wishes, too. I don't know. I guess the trouble is... I guess the trouble is, there's just not enough people around to believe. Hey, good night, boy. Good night, Bowley. Mr. Bowley Jackson, who shares the most common ailment of all men, the strange and perverse disinclination to believe in a miracle. The kind of miracle to come from the mind of a little boy, and now perhaps only to be found in the Twilight Zone. We'll be back to the Twilight Zone after these brief messages. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663.
The Big Tall Wish, starring Blair Underwood with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Maestro Harrell, Cheryl Lynn Bruce, Richard Hensel, Doug James, Turk Muller, Rich Kominick, Rick Peoples, Linda Ryder, Peter DeVito, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, and Roger Walski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcheson, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Don Longo, Terry Jennings, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Hands plus shipment receipt. Uh, Franklin. Equals a total inventory. Franklin, dear, would you like something to eat? Uh, not just now. Minus the number of products can. And we have a total sales from the period from. It's no trouble. Flora, please. I have to bring the books up to date before I go back to the store. The auditor's coming this afternoon. The period from the previous quarter through. But it's almost lunchtime. Take a break, Franklin. You know what they say, all work and no play. All right, make a sandwich if you want. Just let me finish this. I'll get it, dear. For the quarterly sales period in... Yeah, for the quarterly sales period in... Yes. Yes, this is Mrs. Gibbs. Do you want to talk to my... Oh, my. Uh, if it's for me, tell them I'm busy. Are you sure? Why? I can hardly believe it. When? You send all the information? Yes, that, that would be wonderful. But how... It was? You did? Well, I didn't think I had much of a chance. Oh, for the love of... I suppose that will be all right. I'll have to ask my husband. Oh, how exciting. Thank you so very, very much. Goodbye now. Ask me what? Franklin, you are not going to believe this. That was the salesman, wasn't it? No, Franklin. Well, not exactly. It was a sales representative. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'm going to report this to the phone company. They call at all hours, and the misguided believe that we can be talked into anything. What was it? Swampland in Florida? Gold and silver futures? <laughs> chance to get in on the ground floor? Franklin, sit down. What? I have something to tell you. Oh, no, no, you didn't. You filled out a coupon, and now some charming young pickpocket wants to stop by and show us a set of encyclopedias. Flora, I don't know how many times I've told you, those con artists have got one goal in mind, to relieve me of my wallet. Now, I've worked hard to save for our retirement. I'm not going to risk one penny of it to... Franklin, will you kindly be still? This isn't anything like that. I, I entered a contest why I use new season liquid soap for all our personal and impersonal cleansing needs. A contest? Don't you know that the odds are at least several million to... I do know, Franklin, but I couldn't resist. And this time, this time... Considering how much postage stamps cost these days, you might promise me that from now on... But, Franklin, we've won. What are you saying? Won what? A vacation. Flora, listen to my words and try to understand. I have no room in my life for such nonsense. 
This vacation, as you call it, is simply a clever way to sell us a timeshare in some godforsaken alligator-infested... Three days and two nights, including hotel, meals, and plane fare. And the catch? Franklin, I'm trying to tell you, there is no catch. I did it for us. Do you know how long it's been since we've had a vacation? Let Sherwin watch the store for a few days. You'll see. This will do wonders for you. And what, pray tell, is the location of our dream come true? Are you ready? Franklin, we've won a vacation for two in the fun capital of the world. Las Vegas, Nevada. Flora, Flora, why do I bother? You haven't heard a word I've said. Mr. and Mrs. Franklin Gibbs. Three days and two nights, all expenses paid at a Las Vegas hotel, won by the lady's special talent, her knack with a phrase. But unbeknownst to either Mr. or Mrs. Gibbs is the fact that there's an additional item in their prize package that was neither expected nor advertised. For as soon as they arrive at their destination, one half of this couple will succumb to an illness worse than any virus, more insidious than any flu, and impossible for medical science to cure. An inoperable, deadly, life-shattering affliction known as the fever. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Fever, starring Stacy Keach and Kathy Garver. Franklin, look. Look at what? The Las Vegas Strip. So many lights. There must be millions, and all of them flashing on and off, even in broad daylight. Electricity is cheap here, Flora. Yes, yes it must be. As is everything else. They have a hydroelectric dam nearby, enough to light up the entire state, with no need for a sales tax to pay for it. As if the income from gambling wasn't enough. Oh, uh, Triver? Yes, ma'am? May I ask you a question? Shoot. The people who come here, the tourists, such as my husband and myself, uh -huh. do they, well, do any of them actually win? When they gamble, I mean? Flora. Sure, some of them. That's why they keep coming back. Ridiculous. The percentages always favor the house. If it were otherwise, none of these towers of Babel would exist. Of course, you don't have to gamble. This town has plenty to offer. All you can eat, fabulous entertainment. Your taste runs to half-naked showgirls. Franklin, please. Strictly class now, sir. There's something for everybody. Stage shows, magicians, even a circus with lions and tigers. Stuff for the whole family. I'm sure. This is the first time for you folks? It certainly is. We won a trip here as part of the contest we entered. As you entered, Flora. That's so. Well, yes. I've never won anything before in my life. Sweepstakes Central? I beg your pardon? Or the other one, what's it called, uh, Publisher's Cleaning House? <laughs> we got a lot of prize winners here. You do? Flora, you're talking the young man's ear off. And you know something? They all have a great time. So, my advice to you is, live it up. You may as well if it's on the house, right? Yeah, it is. As long as people keep their wallets and their purses tightly closed. Remember that, Flora. I will, Franklin. Here we are, front of the hotel. Oh, my. Drinks? Drinks, anyone? One more Scotch Rucks. Yes, sir. This here silver dollar is all yours. Why, thank you, sir. If you make it fast. I only got a few more left and I'm out of here. Be right back. Drinks? Here goes nothing. Joe? Yeah, boss? Get your camera ready. The couple over there. Which ones? The old guy with the pointed shoes and the part in his hair. <laughs> Looks like the president of the Rotary Club. And his wife with the corsage. More contest winners, huh? You got it. Why I love something or other in 25 words or less. Couple of real charmers. The last of the big time spenders. Come on. Oh, Franklin, isn't it exciting? If you like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, well, Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs. All checked in, I see. 
Oh, yes. Yes, we are. Is your room comfortable? It's lovely, Mr. Henson. Just lovely. You make us feel... Well, you make us feel... Important. You are important, Mrs. Gibbs. After all, it's not every day we welcome a celebrated contest winner. No, just every other day. <laughs> I've brought our hotel photographer so we can get a picture of you and Mr. Gibbs for your hometown paper. That's so considerate. Isn't it, Franklin? Positively magnanimous. Can you stand closer together? Move right in, Mr. Gibbs. That's it. How about this, Joe? Looks good to me. Go ahead and take it, then. Watch out for the flash. This is so exciting. You said that, Flora. I see nothing but spots in front of my eyes. If there's anything else I can do... It's the Elgin Bugle, Mr. Hansen. How's that? Our newspaper, the Elgin Bugle. Of course. We'll send a copy right out to them. Enjoy yourself, folks. There's such a flavor to this place. Don't you think so, Franklin? This is one flavor I can do without. You know I've never approved of gambling. But this is different. It is no more different than it is moral. Gambling is gambling. However, Flora, it's your vacation. You want it. In good conscience, I must repeat to you what I've been saying all along. It's a miserable, terrible waste of time. But it's what you wanted, so... Franklin, try to enjoy it, won't you? For me, we haven't had a vacation in such a long time. That's quite correct. And isn't it a shame that we have to spend it this way? In a roadhouse whose chief stock and trade is semi-clad chorus girls and the sound of one-armed bandits. I must tell you, Flora, I must tell you, at this given moment, I feel, I feel somehow uh, unclean. Oh, Franklin. Now what? Why, oh, I, I don't know. I won! I won! She did it! You sure did, Marge! Some sort of commotion. Uh, wait here, Flora. The jackpot! I just knew! She had her lucky rabbit's foot. Well, it sure was! I gotta get one of those. Over here, Mr. Henson. Which machine? Number 13. Excuse me. Yeah? Oh, hello, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, exactly how much did the young lady win? Uh, three specials in a row. That's uh, five Gs. Five? Five thousand. Five thousand what? Dollars. What'd you think? For doing nothing but standing here and pulling the handle of this mechanical contraption? <laughs> you got it, pal. Could be you next time, huh? Have a good one. I don't believe it. Surely it's some kind of publicity stunt. Flora. I'll bet it's down. Play the combination. It's red and black. I mean. Flora, where? Place your bets. Who wants insurance? Flora, where have you gone? What do you think you're doing? It's just a nickel machine, dear. Ah, we go to Las Vegas. We waste three days and two nights. We do it because that's your silly way of enjoying yourself. And it doesn't cost us anything. All well and good. But now you're spending money. Not even spending it, you're just throwing it away. This is when I have to take a firm hand. You're obviously not mature enough please, to... Please, please, Franklin, don't make a scene. I won't play. I, I promise. Very well, then. The nickel's already in. All right. Go ahead. Throw it away. There. You see? Nothing. Not very lucky, am I? I'm going back to the room. Franklin, it was only a nickel. <laughs> Twenty of them to make a dollar, and I work hard for those dollars. Kindly watch where you're going. Sure, buddy, sure. Hey, come over here. I want to show you something. I'm on my way to my room. You want a hot tip? Look at this machine. I've been working it for an hour and 30 minutes. This miserable, crummy money grabbing. Ah, yeah, you want it, you can have it. Really, I'm not a... It's all set to pay off. Only thing is, I'm tapped out. So I'm turning it over to you. I'm in a hurry. Go on, give it a try. It's a sure thing, I tell you. Please, I wouldn't even know how to. It's easy. Here's my last dollar. You put it in the slot right here. Hey, hey, hey let go of my hand. And drop it in. Then you pull the handle. I, I, I tell you, I'm not interested. God, I'm giving you a gift here. It's all yours. Drinks? Anyone? Drinks on the house? Hey, sweetheart. You got one more for me? Now, what's this supposed to mean? Two cherries, indeed. What in the world? Well, 
There you are, Franklin. Oh, my. You are lucky. Now, Flora, I, I want you to watch this. You're about to see the difference between a normal, mature, intelligent man and these wild idiots around here. Of course, dear. These baboons would throw it away. They, they'd compulsively put it right back into the machine, all of it, but not the Gibbses. No, we know the value of money. We're going to take these and put them safely in our room and go home with them. Come along, my dear. It's late afternoon already. I'd like to shave for dinner. Yes, dear. Yes, there's my machine. Your machine? Oh, hi there, buddy. I thought you were finished with it. I was. But I went and cashed the check. Gotta get my money back, right? Thanks for watching it for me. Let's go, Flo. Come on, baby. Yeah. Yeah! Franklin. Did you say something? What, dear? Just now. Did you call my name? Why, no, dear. That's odd. I thought I heard... Uh... Heard what? Oh, no, nothing, Flo. No, nothing at all. Come along. Just, just watching a little mindless television, Flora, to calm my nerves. Uh, did I wake you? No, oh, that's fine. Put on your pajamas and get under the covers. You need your sleep. Uh, of course, dear. In a, in a moment. See you in the morning, Franklin. Franklin. What? That's enough of that. Franklin? Something the matter? Um, nothing's the matter, except this money. What money? The silver dollars from that machine. This is not the kind of money I like to have in my possession. No, no, no. It's tainted, Flora. How can you say a thing like that? It's only... It's immoral at best. Nothing good can come of money won like this. I'm going to go down there and feed it back into the machine it came from. Get rid of it. Do you really think that's necessary? Of course I do. If there's one thing I know, Flora, it's morality. I will not have tainted money smelling up our pockets. I won't be long. You go back to sleep. Oh, Franklin. Franklin. New shooter coming out. Nine bets down. Hard ways. Any craps. Field bets. Come on. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. Yo, Lev. Winner, winner. Pay the line. Front line winner. New bets down. Seven follows eleven. Same shooter coming out. Seven. Give me a seven. Seven, seven. Winner, seven. Pay the dues. Collect the don't. Drink, sir? Oh, oh no, no. Thank you. I'm just passing through. Do you know where the machines are? The machines? The ones that accept silver dollars? I, I seem to have gotten turned around. Oh, the slots. Right over there, sir. Past the Wheel of Fortune. You can't miss it. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry to trouble you. Same shooter coming out. Come on, one more time. Baby needs a new car. Eight, eight's the point. Big and red. Get the odds down. Place bets hard ways. Place your bets, please. All numbers zero and double zero. Dealer busts. Dealer S23. Uh, here we are. Silver dollar machine. It shouldn't take long. Change. Change right here. Uh, miss, I'll take some change. How much this time, sir? Uh, let me see. Uh, another $20 worth, please. Uh, no, make it 40 Yes, sir. Oh, wait. I don't seem to have anything more in my wallet. Uh, I'll write you a check. Well, you can cash a personal check at the cashier's cage. Well, why can't you take it? I assure you I'm good for it. Here's my identification. Mm -hmm. You'll have to see the cashier about that. No, but, but I can't leave this machine. 
I put so much money into it already. You see, it's, it's a matter of mathematics, uh, the law of probability. If you'll just show your ID to the cashier. Franklin, there you are. Oh, Flora, thank God. You stand right here. Don't let anyone touch this machine. When you didn't come back, I got dressed and came downstairs. Never mind yet. Stay here and guard my machine. Your machine? I don't understand. Uh, trust me, Flora, this won't take long at all. There. This time I bought a larger amount. Should be more than enough. Franklin, that's the third time you've cashed a check. I know. Do you know what time it is? Doesn't matter. This will all be over in another minute or so. It's 12.05. After midnight, Franklin. You've spent a great deal of money already. I know that, too. Don't you think you ought to stop? Uh, how can I stop? As you say, I've lost a great deal of money. Uh, temporarily invested is a better way to put it. i got to win it back. But what if you don't? What if you don't win it back, Franklin? You've been standing here for more than three hours. I'm well aware of that, too. Darling, you know how awful you feel in the morning when you've been up too late at night? Flora, would you kindly shut your mouth? I can't stand a slow. I'm sorry, Franklin. I'm only trying to... I know exactly what you're trying to do. I hate a woman who stands over my shoulder and sees to it that I have miserable luck. That's what you're doing to me now, Flora. You're giving me a wretched run of luck. Why don't you get out of here? Leave me alone. Please. People are listening. Yeah, the, the devil with them. I'm not concerned with people or what they think. I'm only concerned with one thing, and that's how to restore our bank account. Or don't you think that matters? I do. I, I do. Then stand aside, woman. You're not going to stop me, are you? No. No, dear. What I'm concerned about right now is this, this, this machine. It's infernal, inhuman logic, the way it lets you win a little and then takes it all back. It teases you, Flora. It holds out promises. It wheedles and controls. It sucks you in and then when it has you in its grip. But I, I will not give up. It thinks it can wear me down? Well, perhaps it can with the rest of these buffoons, but not Franklin Gibbs. No, sir. This is a battle of wills between man and machine, between the human and the unhuman, and the machine will not win. Oranges, lemons, pears, the occasional cherry, all wasted on me. I will not be fooled. I know how to calculate the true odds. As for this one-armed bandit, your time is near. After that, you'll be relegated to the junk heap where you belong. Another stack. Quickly. Silver dollars again, sir? That's right. Silver dollars. Certainly, sir. Only, uh... Only what? Well, you've reached your limit. If you want to cash any more checks after this, you'll have to talk to the floor manager. That won't be necessary. It's a mathematical certainty. What do you make of that one, Julie? The old guy? Give him till dawn, maybe. It's already been five hours. He was here before you started. I believe it. Did you see his eyes? He's running on empty. <laughs> man, oh man. When those straight arrow types get hooked, they really get hooked. He tells me he's got it figured out mathematically. He's bound to hit the jackpot if he just keeps at it long enough. Poor old fella. Him and his wife, he should pack it in and go back home while he still has a home to go to. Oh, Franklin, I don't know how much longer I can stand here. Then sit down on a stool, but stay close by. I want you to watch this, Flora. You're about to witness the last round in a battle between my will and this machine's. It's almost over. And when it is, only one of us will be left standing. This, I swear. Franklin, you look so pale. Somebody give me a drink of water. Why don't you sit down? You see what the sign says? Special jackpot, $10,000. She's bound to come up. You just got to stay with her long enough, that's all. Here's your water, sir. Oh, thank you. Can I get you folks anything else? The restaurant's serving breakfast. Nothing for me. On the house, steak and eggs, whatever you like. Take it easy. Recharge the old batteries. What do you say, dear? You go ahead if you like. I'm going to see this through. 
How's he holding up? He's still standing, but just barely. How about his credit line? Well, the check guarantee card says he's good for it. To tell you the truth, I don't mind taking the man's money, but if he stands there another hour, we may have to take it out of his estate. What time is it? It's eight o'clock, Franklin. In the morning. I swear, Flora, it's not just a machine. It knows. No, it, it, it mocks me. It, it teases and beckons and cons. You put in five, you get back four. You put in six, you get back five. But I'm on to it. It's got to pay off, understand, Flora? It's just got to. Franklin. Franklin, darling, please. Give me back my dollar. That's my last one, you miserable, dirty... Look at Flora, look, look, Flora, it's watching, enjoying this, you see? That's his face, and the wheels, those are the eyes. And down below, that's the mouse. I tell you, it's not just a mechanical thing, it knows. Give it back, give it back, give it to me. No, Franklin, you, you'll hurt yourself. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Franklin, watch out, it's going to tip over. <laughs> Franklin! Get him off that thing. Sure, boss. Be careful with him. He put a pretty good dent in it, Mr. Henson. It's all right, folks. Just a little accident. This machine's out of order till further notice. He took my dollar. Get him out of here. He needs a doctor. You want I should help him to his room? Bring him to my office. Find a doctor and tell him to meet us there. He don't want to go, boss. Master, monster, it owes me a dollar. My last dollar. <laughs> His blood pressure's down. Are you sure? I've given him a sedative. What this man needs is rest. That's what he'll get, Doctor. Is it okay if we move him? I'll give him a few more minutes on the couch, keep his feet elevated, then you can help him to his room. Will do. Yeah, well, it's not me you should be worried about. It's that infernal device out there. Oh, Franklin, don't talk that way. Maybe he should see a specialist. But you said his vital signs are normal. You said that, didn't you? I was thinking of, well, perhaps a, a psychiatric examination. Hogwash, there's nothing wrong with my mind. He's right. I've seen things in this casino. People lose track of time, forget to sleep. Well, then I suggest you let him do exactly that. Sleep. Sleep, yes. Yes, that's all he needs. Here are some pills to help him relax. Give him one along with a light meal and see that he drinks plenty of fluids. The most important thing for now is no more stress. Thanks for coming, Doctor. Here's my card, Mrs. Gibbs. If you have any more problems, anything at all, you give me a call. I will. Problems? What problems? All I need is for you to get that machine working again. Then you'll see. You'll all see. It's ready to pay off. Franklin, that's enough of that kind of talk. Listen, Mr. Gibbs, it's a game of chance, all right? Think of that slot machine as a random number generator. Sometimes your number comes up, sometimes it doesn't. That's why they call it gambling. If anyone could predict it, we couldn't stay in business. But look at it this way. You're here to have a good time. Please, try to think of it that way. A great time. On us. Your room's comped, so's your food. How about if I throw in a couple of show tickets? What kind of show? The French can-can, I presume? Franklin. I could even... Well, I guess I could extend your stay by another day. That way you'd have time to rest up and enjoy yourselves, the both of you. Yes, oh yes. You're very, very kind, Mr. Henson. Now, Franklin, as soon as you're ready, we'll go up on the elevator to our lovely room and have a real night's sleep. For as long as we like. Won't that be wonderful? Franklin, are you sleeping? No, Flora, I'm not. Then why don't you take another pill, darling? Not now. I'm thinking. Whatever about? That machine. Franklin! It was ready to pay off. It deliberately broke down so it wouldn't have to. You don't really believe that. Don't I? It isn't even a machine, Flora. It, it, it's an entity. It's a thing with its own mind. 
its own will. Please don't talk this way, I beg you. It deliberately broke down rather than return my money. Our money. That thing, that monster, that thief, a dirty, rotten thief. Stay in bed. The doctor told you. Took the last silver dollar. The one it was going to pay off, it swallowed, and then it broke down on purpose. The thief took my last dollar. What are you doing? Get away from me. Franklin. Where? Franklin, no. It's outside the door. I can hear it. Franklin. No. Darling, what's the matter? Don't you hear it? No. No, I don't. I don't hear anything. Of course you do. You must. It's in the hall. I just saw it. It's out there. It, it, it followed me. Pack a suitcase. We must get out of here. Franklin. It's inside. Quickly, quickly. Stop it. Franklin. Franklin. Help me. Help me. we got to get away. The window. Yeah, the window. Franklin. 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 No. Franklin. Franklin. No. Gibbs, Franklin J. Tourist. What happened? Or jumped. Or fell. Hard to say. That's the wife over there. In the room when it happened. Some sort of seizure or something. Can we get a stretcher, Sheriff, and move him out of here? Right away, Mr. Henson. Let's go, medics. Yes, sir. He doesn't need a stretcher. He needs a body bag. His wife said he hadn't slept in 24 hours? That's right. I've seen them get hooked before, but never like this. Okay, everybody, let's clear the area. Back to bed. Go on inside. Show's over. What's that? Looks like a silver dollar. Where did it come from? It fell. From up there. Right about the 13th floor. Yeah? But how? Don't worry about it. Like the man said, just get him out of here. Mr. Franklin Gibbs, visitor to Las Vegas, who lost his money, his reason, and finally his life, to an inanimate object variously described as a one-armed bandit, a slot machine, or, in Mr. Franklin Gibbs's words, a monster with a will all its own. For our purposes, we'll stick with the latter explanation, because after all, this is the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Fever, starring Stacy Keach and Kathy Garver, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Roderick Peoples, Christian Stolte, Rich Komenik, Jeff Lupiton, Meg Falcon, Heath Corson, Susan Hart, Beth Katie, Nancy Center, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, 
Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hey, Miller. Yeah. Hey, your copy ready? Almost. Well, the old man wants it on his desk now. The old man drinks too much coffee. Ooh, easy, pal. Hey, I'm just passing it on. So what's your column about? Read it in the morning edition, like everybody else. <laughs> hey, that ain't very friendly. I'm not the friendly type. You get too friendly and guys like you start stealing my angle. <laughs> Would I do that? Hey, let me guess. Uh, the new baseball commissioner. No, no, no. The shakeup in the NFL. Sounds like every sports page in the country. Oh, then you must have a juicy one. Say, what's that file you got there? Nothing that it interests you. Uh, jockey disqualified, banned from all U.S. tracks, racing commission denies appeal. Wait a minute. I remember that guy. He got bounced for doping horses in the Triple Crown. What was his name? Brady? Something like that? Write your own story, Maze. Now get lost. I got work to do. All right, all right. I'm going. Me? I'm taking a dinner break. Some people know how to meet their deadlines around here. Huh? Yeah. What do you want? If this is the front desk, I already told you. I'll pay up tomorrow. For the whole week. Got that? Tomorrow. Grady, this is Rich Miller calling. Who? I read a column for the Post. Which paper? Oh, yeah. I seen that, Rad. I wonder if I could ask you a few questions. Miller, huh? Wait a minute. I know who you are. You're a creep. Mr. Grady, I just want to set the record straight. I said creep. Don't Mr. Grady me. I can read. Yeah, I can read, all right. Every now and then, I get a look at your column, and afterwards, I need a stomach pump, you know? Because it makes me sick. If you give me a minute, I'm willing to print your side of the story. Look, Fink, don't nuzzle up to me. Three years ago, you stuck in the first shift, only you got it wrong. I didn't have nothing to do with horse doping. I didn't say you did. You didn't, huh? Get off your elbows, you Judas. You had me hung out to dry from the start. A couple of fast pages on the old typewriter, that's all it took. And I got a 60-day suspension. I think you have me mixed up with somebody else. Oh, is that a fact? Well, listen, baby. You can play it real safe now. You're 50 blocks away. But if you was in my room here, I'd fix it so they could scrape you off the wall and spoon you into a cup all by myself. Some people say you got a bum deal if you'd care to make a statement. Yeah, here's your statement. This is Grady to the press. You're all a bunch of great digging finks with delusions. Print that, hyena, and don't forget to spell my name right. Chump. Yeah, you in the mirror. Some jockey you are. A couple of lousy fixes, and you fall off your mount. The big boys walk away with all the money, the bills, the bundles. What do you get? Chump change and black and blue silks, like a real patsy. Look at yourself. Nothing plus nothing equals nothing. So what do you do now? Maybe, maybe rent a carriage? Drive lovers through Central Park? Yeah, right. Grady, you kill me. You really knock me out. You dumb little shrimp. There isn't a mother's son in the whole world as dumb as you are. Now what am I supposed to do? Will you tell me that? 
What in this stinking world can I do, huh? The name is Grady. Five feet short in stockings and boots. A slightly distorted offshoot from an old and honorable breed of humans who raise horses. But this happens to be one of the rotten apples in the barrel, bruised and yellowed by dealing in dirt. A short man with a short memory, who somewhere along the line forgot that he worked for the sport of kings and helped turn it into a cesspool. Used and misused by certain two-legged animals who have hung around sporting events since the days of the Colosseum. So this is Grady in a flea bag hotel room on his last night as a jockey. Behind him are Hialeah, Hollywood Park, and Saratoga. Just now he's rounding the clubhouse turn and coming up fast in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Last Night of a Jockey, starring Bruno Kirby with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Around the far turn, it's Baby Needs a New Pair of Shoes, Two Lengths Back, Jazz Bakery, followed by Janine L., Lovely Lita, Stratisfaction, Red Dreams, Double Edge, and trailing is Taz. Now, Lovely Lita makes a move on the inside, passing up Janine L., Jazz Bakery, and challenging the favorite, Baby Needs a New Pair of Shoes. Grady's really using the whip. It's Lovely Lita, and Baby Needs a New Pair of Shoes. Lovely Lita bearing down the stretch, they're neck and neck, and it's Lovely Lita, the winner by two lengths. Get a shot of the winner. Look this way, Grady. Smile. Who would have thought? Even the number one horse. You did good out there, Grady. Yeah. Didn't I, though? Yeah, I never saw Lita run like that before. Well, she had a good jockey this time. Well, at 12 to 1, you sure made some folks happy today. You don't know how right you are. Good boy, Grady. <laughs> you did the job. Sure I did the job. What did I tell you? So, Mr. Hanacek, you got an envelope for me? Cool it down first. Then come over to the trailer. The grooms can walk. I got... I gotta take care of some stuff. So I was thinking, Mr. Hanacek, if, if it's all the same to you. What's the big hurry, Grady? I just like to get paid, is all. Don't worry about it. You'll get what's coming to you. Like the man said, what's the big hurry? No hurry. I gotta put my gear away. Like maybe a uh, needle? What are you talking about? Sure came to life in the stretch, didn't she? I wonder where she got all that speed. Some people might say it was amphetamines. Say, so you better watch your mouth, fella. I don't like what you're inferring. No? No, I don't. Who do you think you are, anyway? We're from the Racing Commission. Nice meeting you. Now, if you'll excuse me. Hold up. Just till we do a urine test on the horse. You can wait in the car. We don't want any trouble. Get your mitts off of me. Hey, hey! Hey, hey! Hey, hey. How goes it, Mr. Grady? <laughs> what? Bunched up at the turn? Slowed down by a muddy track? Who in the... Just an interested observer, that's all. With a question for you. How goes it in your world? All right, what's the gag? What's the gag? I just thought you might appreciate some company. A little conversation, perhaps. Okay, wise guy. You made your point. Now, where are you? Hiding under the bed? Where? Why, here I am, Mr. Grady. Between your frontal lobes. Take a look in the mirror. What? Nestle securely among those gray convolutions you've gotten there. Between the temples. That's it. See? And that's supposed to mean what? Don't I speak clearly enough? My apologies. But I thought you'd know this voice well. It should be very familiar to you. Talk straight! You got something against the English language? To put it simply, I'm in your head, Mr. Grady. Oh, is that a fact? You're inside my head. So how is it in there? Comfortable enough for you? Comfortable? <laughs> hey, cut that out, will you? 
This room ain't big enough for the both of us. You're making my head hurt. You'll forgive me, Mr. Grady, but you must admit it is a funny question. What's funny about it? Comfortable inside your head? It's like sleeping in the middle of 42nd Street during a parade. Noisy, crowded, and quite uncomfortable. To be blunt, I'm sick of it. Time to come out for a while and have a stretch, if you don't mind. What do you mean? Where? Look in the mirror over your dresser. Ah, that's much better. Hey, what is this? Some kind of trick? No trick, I assure you. But you... You look just like me. Except you're all dressed up. And the way you got your hair combed, like some kind of uptown guy with bucks. You like the effect? I picked the jacket and tie with you in mind. And the hair. The way you used to wear it. When you still cared about your appearance. Say, what's going on here? I must be going wacko. Oh, why don't you just get out? Go on, move it. Out of my room. Now, scram. And go where? Back in your head? Why, this is much better. And so much roomier than that pea brain of yours. Enough with the insults. Who the heck are you? <laughs> I'm you, Mr. Grady. Your memories, all your recollections, and all your aspirations. Big deal. I'm every one of your failures and defeats. And yet I also wear the wreath of all your victories. In short, Mr. Grady, I'm what you'd call your alter ego. Me? I wouldn't call you nothing like that. No, I suppose you wouldn't. Yeah, sure. So what do you want? I think the more apt question would be, what do you want? Are you kidding? What do I want? That's right. After all, you are a dumb little toad, aren't you? Watch it, buddy. But that's what you call yourself, an ugly little toad. Or was it shrimp? Why else would you wear elevator shoes and stand on your suitcase in front of the mirror? The bathroom mirror? I have to. When I shave, uh, they hung it wrong. Sure they did, Mr. Grady. Why don't you knock it off? Take a hike. Go for a walk on a short pier. How do I get you out of here? In a word, you don't. You live with me, knowingly, from this point on. You might even come to find me interesting. That'll be the day. After all, I know you pretty well. There isn't one secret thought that's crossed your mind, not one, that I don't know. There isn't a painful memory, an unpleasant recollection, or a bitter little shame that I'm not aware of. Bitter little shame. You don't know me from Seabiscuit, buddy boy. Just so we understand each other, I got no little shames. I got no painful recollections either. Oh, come now, Mr. Grady. I mean, really. Shall we look it up in the little old record book? Two years ago, suspended from Hialeah, riding infractions. They never even heard my side of the story. Last year, six months suspension. Failure to report a bribe offer. They set me up. And most recently, Mr. Grady, the triple crown of an illustrious career. Lifetime suspension, race fixing, and horse doping. I never had a trial. So here you sit, on an unseasonably hot September evening, in a dirty little room, rent overdue, essentially friendless, career kaput, roughly six to eight dollars in your jeans. This, in a nutshell, is the odyssey of Grady the Jockey. 100 million miles from the winner's circle, without so much as a withered wreath to your name. Is it any wonder, Mr. Grady, that an occasional phantom will spring out from the woodwork? Or should I say, from that solid mahogany head of yours? And offer you at least a modicum of solace? You don't have to offer me nothing, and I mean nothing. No? I don't need you. A year from now, you hear me? A year from now, I'll be back up. I'll be right back where I belong, riding six winners a day. <laughs> You'll be driving a carriage in Central Park, Mr. Grady. Or perhaps a fast milk wagon out in the Bronx. 
unloading homogenized dairy goods. Get out of here. Oh, no, Mr. Grady. I wouldn't think of it. You need me. I'm one of the few uniquely welcome things to happen to you since you first saw the harsh light of day. In short, Mr. Grady, you have desperate need of me. Very desperate indeed. I said split. <laughs> Fink, where are you now, Fink, huh? Like pneumonia, I need you. Like a fractured leg, like a three-legged trotter for a steeplechase. That's how I need you. Who did you think you were talking to, huh? Who, I said. All I have to do is pick up that telephone, see? I call Hanacek. I say to him, Hanacek, I handle the fix. Now let's have the payoff. And you know what happens? Inside of an hour, I got plane fare to Puerto Rico. That's what happens. Next week, I'm riding in the warm sun, and two years from now, I'm back here officially wearing my old silks again. That's what happens. Then why don't you? Huh? Why don't you call Hanacek? Go ahead, Mr. Greedy. Give him a buzz. All right. I will. Yeah, this is Grady. Had a check around? Well, I want to talk to him. Never mind the message. This is personal. Just put him on. Had a check. Grady. You what? Surprised. What's to be surprised about? I'm sitting down here in a pit, all by my lonesome. I got eight bucks to my name, and somebody just knocked me off my mount. I'm the one who took the fall. What do you expect me to do? Ride a will and take gas? Knock it off. You know what I want. That's right. I think the word is... is... Sustenance. Sustenance. Look it up in a book, Anacek. I'm talking about three squares a day and a little fur to spread around the nest. Hanacek, I put it on the line for you. I stole a race, and now they got me nailed up. You walked away with a pile. Well, now it's time for Grady to get his. Hanacek, you double crook. Hanacek! Hanacek! Miserable man, isn't he, Mr. Grady? Ungracious, unappreciative, very predatory. But that's the breed. Like all crooks, they take, they never give. You got that right. What's to do now, Mr. Grady? Write a will and take gas? What do I care? That lousy nickel and dimer? A year ago, I could buy and sell him. Buy and sell him! Well, guess what? I don't need you. I don't need him. I don't need anybody. Now make yourself scarce, will you, buddy? You're getting on my nerves. I was a big man once, and I'll be a big man again. You'll see. Ah, now we get to pay dirt. The moment of truth, the acid test, the ultimate coming together of forces. What are you jarring about? Merely that you can have your heart's desire, Mr. Grady. The time has come at last. Now you'll finally get what you want. What I want? Yes. Whatever it is that you want, more than anything else in the world. So think it over carefully, Mr. Grady. Think it over. Won't you? <laughs> <laughs> What's the rib? Consider it your true payoff after such a checkered career. You know something? I don't understand a word you're saying. Think about it. Only a year ago, you were strutting around the country on the thoroughbred circuit. You wore shiny shoes, new clothes, you tipped big. You had some compensation then, Mr. Grady. Compensation for what? For the fact that you're the runt of the litter. For the unpleasant realization that all your life you've had to stand tiptoe just to see what's around you. Let me tell you something. If I had you around here for very long, I'd compensate you, but good. You do have me, Mr. Grady. 
Now you do. I'm no longer content to remain in the shadows, basking in the glow of your reflected glory. The time has come to turn over a new leaf, wipe the slate clean, make a fresh start. Face it, you want to be respected, admired, looked up to, don't you? You hate to get off a horse, because in the saddle you're as high as the sky, and on Mother Earth you're a half pint. And I'm telling you, get out of here. Make tracks pronto. First, tell me what it is that you want. This is the moment. Seize it. What? What do you really want? What do I want? What do I want? Such as anything. All you have to do is name it, because believe me, you deserve it. What I want is, is. I want to change what I see every time I look in the mirror, or in the window when I'm walking down the street in people's eyeballs. When they're staring at me. That's right. Let it all out. I don't want to look in there and see a a shrimp, a toad, a fink. You know what, man? I want to be the biggest. I mean, I want to loom. I want people to look up to me. Poor Mr. Grady. You dreamless, put upon little man. How cheap you come. What a cut-rate little article you are, after all. You want size? That's your heart's desire. You want to be a giant among men? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Is that all? Is that really all? Cool it. You're giving me a headache. I gotta lie down for a minute. Go ahead, Mr. Grady. Be my guest. We wouldn't want to overwork that gigantic brain of yours, would we? <laughs> <laughs> Have anything else to say on your behalf, Mr. Grady? Yeah, Mr. Commissioner. I got plenty to say. I'm a jockey. That's how I make my living. You got no right to take a man's livelihood away from him. What makes you so high and mighty? Racing's a dirty game, all right? But you're making it so dirty, you should go home and take a bath. It ain't me. I'm just a little guy trying to get by. I didn't shoot up no horse with dope. All I did was ride, which is the one thing I know how to do. The only thing. I ride good, get me? Real good. You take away my license, and I can't put food on the table. What am I supposed to do? Fix horseshoes? You know how much that pays? I might as well disappear, hole up someplace, sleeping in the stalls till I get put out the pasture. But how am I supposed to eat till then? Can you tell me that? You gotta give me another chance. Instead of making me take the fall for the big shots, you gotta give me a chance. It is the judgment of this commission that you be banned from the sport of horse racing in the continental United States for the remainder of your life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's all, Mr. Grady. Your license is hereby revoked. Hold on, you can't do that! Listen to me! This hearing is over. You're dismissed. No! 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 No, no, you gotta listen to me. Go ahead, Mr. Greedy. I'm listening. Huh? Have a good rest. A good what? Your nap. I trust it was a good one. Healthful and refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, it was swell. What's it to you? I just wondered what it feels like to have your heart's desire after so long. Ow! Something hit me in the head. The ceiling, perhaps? Hey, this ain't my bed. It can't be. It's too little. It is now. I must still be dreaming. Oh, come now, Mr. Grady. I gotta get a drink of water. If that is your wish, feel free. You can do anything you want. Absolutely anything. Give it a rest, why don't you? Like everything else that's happened in your life, it's entirely up to you. Ow! Who put the bed flat on the floor? Why, no one. It's not the bed that's changed. What's going on here? Oh, I do wish you were more imaginative. Okay, I am dreaming. That's it. Is it? Touch the floor. Go ahead. That's real, isn't it? 
Touch the dresser. Now touch the wall. Put up your hand and touch the ceiling. Go ahead. Now stand. I can't, okay? It's not high enough. Correct. It's not for you. These are all very solid objects. They have width, height, thickness, the properties of physical reality. In other words, like you, pinch yourself, why don't you? That's the final test, isn't it? That hurts! Of course it does. But how in the... You were offered your heart's desire, Mr. Grady. And what you wished for wasn't a dream. You didn't ask for a simple two-hour escape with Morpheus. You wanted stature. You wanted size. You wanted the view from a long way up and a long way out. Eye level would have been a bad compromise. And as always, anything short of that was defeat. Get away from me. I gotta wash my face. Don't forget to duck. You might even have to bend down a bit. And remember, you won't need to stand on the suitcase to see the bathroom mirror. Not anymore. Hey! Look at me! Yes, look at yourself. You're Mr. Big. You're Hercules. Why, you're the most sizable thing since Paul Bunyan. Any complaints, Mr. Grady? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Look at me! Just look at me! Who, who's gonna talk down to me now? Who can reach that high? Nobody! That's who! So, the question is, what do you do now? You might want to give that a moment's thought. I don't have to think. I know what to do. Celebrate! Wait, I got something. I forgot all about it. There's a bottle of wine stashed around here someplace. Here. Here, want to have a drink with me? Go ahead, Mr. Grady. Oh, I get it. You can't drink, huh? You do it for me. I'm with you in spirit. Ah! Man, that goes down smooth. Too bad you can't join me. Hmm. I'm joining you now, Mr. Grady. I'm feeling the little heat ripples, just as you are. Well, here's mud in your eye. Oh, man. It's like champagne. You're right. It is quite good. <laughs> this is too sweet. <laughs> Am I going to enjoy myself? And what will you do first? Anything I want. That's what. Anything. Tell me, Mr. Grady. I'm all ears, in a manner of speaking. I'm going to get me a dame. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over and get that, that dame. That dame? Sure, look at me. I'm a mensch now. A real man. She'll flip. She'll fall all over me. Really? Are you that attractive now? Does size mean that much? Bet your last two bucks, buddy. Watch me. Don't you think you'd better call first? Why? So you won't go all the way over there, only to find that she's not home. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Give me the phone. Careful with the dial. Your fingers barely fit. Get away from me. I can handle it. You'll never believe this. I swear you'll never believe this. But she used to... She used to bend down and pat me on the head. Well, we'll see about that now. What do you say, doll? Who is it? Are you serious? You put me on, ain't you? That's right. It's Grady. Don't try the cold shoulder with me, honey. I know you're too good. That's right. This is me. Your ex-meal ticket. And those were eight-course meals, baby. Don't you forget it. What I want is the following. First, remember who you're talking to. That's number one. All right. It's more like it. Now try this on for size. When I was in the money, I spread it around. Remember? Sure you do. All right. Now I'd like you to... Reciprocate. That's it. Reciprocate me a little bit. You heard me. Look it up. Take one of those baubles off your wrist, toots. Hang on to the pawn ticket and send the cash over here. What do you care for how long? Who bought it for you in the first place? Hold it, you haven't heard the news yet, honey. Just shut up and listen. That's better. See, I'm a big man now. I mean big. What are you laughing at? It's true. Everything's different now, babe. Will you put a cork in it? I'm 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, More than that, surely. No, make that seven feet. Yeah, seven plus. Seven and a half, at least. 
That's what I said. Any minute, the Lakers are going to be sending one of them crummy talent scouts over here. You'll see. Yeah. Huh? Would I lie to you? I tell you, I've grown, really grown. Will you listen? Why, you cheap little alley cat. I don't take that kind of talk off anyone. Nobody calls me an ugly little runt. Nobody. That's what I said, especially you. Forget it. Go someplace and die for all I care. And I hope it's long, tough, and really, really painful. That's what I wish for you. Well done, Mr. Grady. Just my luck. I gotta go call on a cheapskate with my hat in my hand. A dirty little gimme gimme like that one. You managed to flex your vocal cord in a very manly fashion. At this rate, women all over the world will be flocking to your doorstep. So I struck out once. Big deal. I could pick up the phone and call half a dozen dames better looking than her. Why am I singularly unimpressed? You will be impressed, buddy. You will be. I certainly hope so. What did I tell you? Here comes one now. Are you sure? What do you mean, am I sure? Remember your heart's desire. Do you know what that is? Of course I know. Take care, Mr. Grady. Give it some thought. Some very careful thought. Are you quite sure that you're ready? Because whatever you've wished for, something tells me that you're about to get it after all. In spades. Yeah, this is him. What about my voice? Too loud for you? <laughs> All right, sport, give it to me again. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. Which lawyer are you talking about? What's his name? Never heard of him. You have him call me. I might have to go out for a while, so tell him to make it quick. I ain't got all night. Yeah, go ahead and give him my number. What was that all about, Mr. Grady? Who knows? Some guy from a law office or something? Says I'm getting a call from some other lawyer. At night, can you believe that? Must be important. That's because I'm important now. Sure, that's it. Hey, you still here? I'm still here. How come you're hanging around anyway? I'd say we have some unfinished business, you and I. Level with me. Are you my imagination? Is that it? I'm afraid you don't have very much imagination, Mr. Grady. Then who are you? What are you? What's all this alter ego jazz? I thought you understood by now. I'm your conscience. <laughs> yeah, right. You don't look much like Jiminy Cricket to me. Well, I'll put it another way, Mr. Grady. This is something of an oversimplification. But for purposes of identity, I'll try to make it clear and succinct. I'm the fate every man makes for himself. Would you just talk for once and take off the training wheels? I'm doing my best. You generally find me down at the bottom of the barrel. I'm the strength dredged up out of desperation. I'm the last bit of seaweed that a drowning man scrapes for with his cold, dying fingers. I'm the last gasp, Mr. Grady. That's supposed to be clear? Man, I just don't dig you. For my money, you're a big fat nothing with a mouthful of two dollar words. Oh, I'm not nothing. I'm something, Mr. Grady. I'm really and truly something. In certain cases, something very good, depending on the person I'm representing. I can work miracles. I may come with heroism, sacrifice, strength. Even more than that, I may epitomize everything noble in the human spirit. Now, in your case, Mr. Grady, the requirements were quite small. Your dreams rather insignificant, taken all together. Your aspirations hardly worth mentioning in the greater scheme. What do you mean, small? What do I mean? Only this, Mr. Grady. If you had asked to win the Kentucky Derby, and win it cleanly and with honor, that would have been quite a monument to your career. 
or if you'd ask to perform an act of pure, selfless heroism, and let that be the qualification for the respect you seek, this too would have been exemplary. But as it is, what was your heart's desire? To be a big man. Big in the sense that your hands can smother telephones. Your head can hit the ceiling with every step you take. Your face can overshoot its reflection in the mirror without the help of a suitcase or a stepladder to stand on. I repeat, Mr. Grady, you come cheap. You're hardly worth the effort. You're a regular wise guy, ain't you? Well, let me tell you something, buddy. As you wish. All I want, all I ever wanted, was to walk down the street and not get laughed at. I didn't want to be called a freak behind my back. I didn't want to be an ugly little creep. The one they need, but the one they don't like to look at. I didn't want to be kicked around from one track to the next because every time I measured off a guy, I was looking into his belt buckle. You're wrong about me, mister. I don't come cheap. I don't come cheap at all. Because now I got my heart's desire. That plain enough for you? You surprised me, Mr. Grady. A greater depth of feeling than I would have expected. Now you heard it, you can forget about it. Because I'm tired of being low man on the totem pole. I got what I want, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to go out there and have me some fun tonight. The only thing I got to figure out is where to start. I wouldn't begrudge you that. But listen. No, you listen. Open your eyes and look around. The world. And it's just waiting for me. He doth bestride the world like a colossus. What? Someone said that about Alexander the Great. He ended badly, too. A sad and tearful man when there were no more worlds to conquer. You see any tears in my eyes? I'm not crying, I'm laughing. Look at them all down there, like ants. They got their big cars and their women and their big fat rolls of money. Now it's my turn. Just wait till I walk in any place I feel like. They'll notice, all right. They'll turn around and stare because every one of them will wish they was me. Give me the two hottest dames in town, one on each arm, and just you watch. I am watching. I'm with you, imagining it all, along with the consequences. Imagining is something you don't do very well, so let me help. The possibilities are endless, but the trick is in the choosing. What's right for you? What can you wear like a beautiful coat of many colors? Or what doesn't become you? What doesn't fit you? If you choose wrong, it will show. It won't enhance your standing. It will destroy you. The burden may be simply too overwhelming. The greater the heights a man attains, the further the fall. Ah, why don't you shut up? Your words are all empty, just like this bottle. I'm trying to help, honestly. You may not have chosen wisely, but it may not be too late if you're conscious and careful. Careful nothing. I've been careful all my life. Stand back, everybody. Grady's walking through the universe. Fate calling Mr. Grady? Fate nothing. It's that dame. She must have changed her mind. Yeah, yeah, this is Grady. What about it? Say that again. Would you mind? Are you... Are you kidding me? Are you serious? Do I want to race again? Mister, you show me the horse. Listen, listen. I appreciate this. You don't know how much. You ain't going to regret this. I wouldn't fix a race if I got a million bucks per square foot of track. I wouldn't fix a race if... Yeah, yeah, I understand. You got it. I'll be there with bells on. Good news? Well, hot shot. now what do you think? You know what he just said? Everything's going my way. One phone call and your top dog again? Just like that? Just like that. I'll tell you who that was. The racing commission. A bunch of horse owners put in a petition for me. Can you beat that? They want to give me another chance. Do you understand what that means? Another chance? 
I'm going to ride again. Oh, Grady's going to mount up and hit the turf like old times. Is that right? Oh, Mr. Grady. <laughs> now what's so funny? Tell me, what's so funny? I'm going to ride again. I'm on top, on top of the world. Think about it. Go into the bathroom and bend down and look at yourself while you're combing that mop of hair and putting on your best riding boots, which won't fit now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, you're right. I can't ride like this. I'm too big. I'm way too big. I can't ride like this. Hey, hey, please, make me small again. I'm begging you, make me the way I was. Do it, will you? Will you do that for me, please? You may have learned your lesson, Mr. Grady, but it's too late. Please. Hey, please. I take it back. Will you make me small again? Will you do that little thing? That's all I ask. Hey. Hey. Hey, listen. I want to be small again. I want to be small! Mr. Grady, you are small. Every time you won an honest race, that's when you were a real giant. But right now, they just don't come any smaller. No. No. No! Where, where are you? Where did you go? Come back! Come back! You still here, Miller? What does it look like? Didn't you finish your column yet? Yeah, I finished it, but now I have to rewrite the whole thing. Well, how come? The old man didn't like it? I just got a call from the precinct. That jockey. He took a dive tonight out the 17th floor window of the St. James Hotel. No kidding. <laughs> Poor little guy. Little? Yeah, I guess you could say that. There's something weird about the body, though. Yeah, what about it? Yeah, it, it didn't look right. But they ID'd him. It was Grady, no doubt about it. So, now I gotta do my column from scratch. Well, at least you don't have to worry about Grady anymore. They'll cover him in the old bit page. Yeah, but how? Something tells me there's more to this story. A lot more. If I only knew what really happened. Hey, don't let your imagination run away with you. Remember, this is the sports page, not the literary section. Somebody's gotta tell his story. If I don't, who will? The Last Night of a Jockey. The name is, or was, Grady. Seven feet tall. Or was it eight or nine? A slightly distorted offshoot of a decent breed of humans who ride horses in what was once the sport of kings. But unfortunately for Mr. Grady, this court jester learned too late that you don't measure size with a ruler, you don't figure height with a yardstick, and you never judge a man by how tall he looks in a mirror. For a giant is as a giant does. You can make a paramutual bet on that, win, place, or show, at any window, in or out, of the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, You'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663.
The Last Night of a Jockey, starring Bruno Kirby with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Doug James, Todd Manley, Andy Herman, Sarah Marks, Rick Vargas, Terry Babler, Paul Patch, Vince Amari, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Blasted alarm. Let me sleep. Oh, all right, I hear you. It's 7.01 on a beautiful spring morning. What's so beautiful about it? And this is Mike Munn, here with some more sunshine music on your favorite listening station, Radio K Rant. Oh, phew, shut up. <laughs> the way to work or just waking up relax we'll be with you all day long bringing you melodic masterpieces around the clock off i say i did not set this radio to go on at all and before we start another set of timeless hits here's a special message for one of our favorite listeners bartlett finchley what mr finchley we know you're out there so put on a happy face take some time to smell the coffee and remember we love you madly, but we'd love you even more if you'd get out. Nobody wants you here, so you may as well pack up and get out now. We'll see about that. Of all the outrageous gall. Operator, get me K Rant. Yes, the radio station. No, I don't know the number. Uh, kindly dial it for me. If you can spare a moment from your crossword puzzle. K Rand, how may I direct your call? Connect me with Mike Munn. I beg your pardon? Munn, your asinine disc jockey. I'm sorry, sir, but there's no one here by that name. Of course there is. I just heard him on the radio. He took it upon himself to broadcast a personal insult directly and specifically aimed at me. We play all music all the time, sir. Do you know who you're speaking to? This is Bartlett Finchley. Yes, Mr. Finchley? And I will not be addressed in such a manner, on or off the air. Of course not, sir. Which manner? I'm sure you know full well what I'm talking about. The airwaves are licensed by the Federal Communications Commission, and they are not to be used for personal messages. I'm sure the FCC will be most interested in these blatant violations. They'll pull your license so fast it'll make your empty head spin like a top. But we don't have disc jockeys. We don't broadcast any messages at all. Only beautiful music 24 hours a day, plus commercials, of course. Let me speak to your station manager. Yes, sir. Please hold. And don't you dare place me on hold, you high school dropout! Oh, for the love of... I don't have time for this nonsense. I will not have it. I'll write a blistering letter to the FCC that will knock this rinky-dink station off the air. Hello? I want to file a complaint. 
a very, very serious complaint about your broadcasting policies. Come off it, Finchley. What did you say? Get off your high horse and give it a rest. Or you're out of here. You low-life nincompoop. How dare you address me in that fashion? I'll have you fired on the spot. What is your name, you, you... Cretinous subhuman... Don't you hang up on me! Hello? 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 This is Mr. Bartlett Finchley, age 42, a practicing sophisticate and dedicated misanthrope who writes very special and very precious things for gourmet magazines, critical journals, and the like. He's a bachelor and a recluse with few friends, only devotees and adherents to the cause of tart sophistry. He has no interest save whatever current annoyances he can find to occupy his mind. He has no purpose to his life, except the formulation of day-to-day -day opportunities to vent his wrath on the mechanical contrivances of an age he abhors. In short, Mr. Bartlett Finchley is a malcontent, born either too late or too early in history, and who in just a moment will enter a realm where muscles and the will to fight back are not limited to human beings. Next stop for Mr. Bartlett Finchley, the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Thing About Machines, starring Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. How are you today, Mr. Finchley? I'll answer that burning question after you tell me what's wrong with this electronic abomination in my living room. You mean your TV set? And also acquaint me with how much your current larceny is going to cost me. Well, let's see here. Two hours labor, new circuit board, new oscillator, New comb filter. How very technical and how very nice. Speak English, man. Well, you asked me what was wrong. Never mind the subterfuge. I presume I'm to be done once again for three times the worth of the bloody thing. Well, I didn't charge you for my travel time. The total. What is the total? Here you go, Finchley. Oh, surely you jest. All right, all right. I'll give you a break on the sales tax. Seeing as how you're a regular. But, but this is the price of a meal in a four-star restaurant. With wine! Labor don't come cheap nowadays. And neither, apparently, does my peace of mind. I requested that the device be restored to working order. The alternative being more disruptions to my writing schedule. Well, you could just get a new one every time. Might be easier all around. Last time I was here, Mr. Finchley, you'd kicked your foot through the picture tube, remember? I have a vivid recollection. It was not working properly, like every other electronic contraption in this house. I tried to rehabilitate it. By wrecking it? After a certain point, that is the only option left. I disposed of a clock radio in a similar manner this morning. Unfortunately, I must view a cooking program this evening in order to write my review of their fare, which I'm sure will be abysmal as usual, if the television should choose to operate at all. Why don't you just horse whip it, Mr. Finchley? That'd show it who's boss. What do you say we cease the small talk? Let's get down to the petty larceny and be done with it. I'll put it on your tab. Send me a check before I come out the next time. I sometimes wonder exactly what it is the purpose of the Better Business Bureau in such transactions. You got a complaint about my work? When they allow you itinerant extortionists to come back week after week, move wires around busily probe with ham-like hands, and accomplish nothing but the financial ruin of every customer on your route. We're not a jip outfit, Mr. Finchley. We're legitimate repairmen. But I'll tell you something about yourself. Spare me, please. I'm sure there must be some malnutrition analyst with an aging mother to care for whom I can contact for that purpose. Why don't you hear me out, Mr. Finchley? That set doesn't work because you obviously got back there and yanked out wires and heaven knows what else. You had me over here last month to fix your tape recorder because you'd thrown it down the steps. It did not work properly. Well, that's the point, Mr. Finchley. Why don't they work properly? Offhand, I'd say it's because you don't treat them properly. 
I assume there's no charge for that bit of analysis. What does go wrong with these things, Mr. Finchley? Have any idea? Have I any idea? <laughs> now that's worth a scholarly ten lines in your repairman's journal. Bilk the customer, but let him do the diagnosis. Well, the reason I ask that is because whatever it is that really bothers you about that television set and the radio and all the rest, it's something you're not telling me. Aside from being a rather incompetent clod, you're a most unreceptive listener. I've explained to you already. The television set simply did not work properly. And as for that original Marconi operating under the guise of a radio, it gave me nothing but static. You sure that was all that was wrong with them? I choose my words very precisely, thank you. Well, there you go. TV's okay again, for now. I'll send you a complete bill, Mr. Finchley. Of this I have no doubt. Finchley, what is it with you, anyway? With me? What well, with you and machines, that is. Any type of machine, as far as I can tell. Just curious. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. If it's something personal. I will file that idiotic question in my memorabilia, to be referred to at some future date when I write my memoirs. You will fill one entire chapter. The most forgettable person I have ever met. It just so happens, you boob. It just so happens that every machine in this house refuses to cooperate on any level. They behave as if... There. You see what I mean? Enough. I said that will be just about enough of that. Stop. 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 Please. Miss Rogers? Oh, yes, Mr. Finchley? Let me see the pages. Yes, sir. Is that all you've done? That's all I've done. Two articles and one column almost completely retyped. Forty pages in three and a half hours. That's the best I can do, Mr. Finchley. It's that idiotic gadget of yours. Humming and clicking away. I suppose it's about to break down, too. It's perfectly fine for a typewriter if you'd let me use a word processor. My words don't need processing. They've already been diced and sliced by the most perfect processor known to man, the human brain, which in my case comes with a great deal of priceless expertise. But a computer would increase the speed. I wouldn't have to worry about ribbons, correction tape. The solution to that, Miss Rogers, is increased accuracy. I'm extremely accurate, Mr. Finchley, and it's not my speed that's the problem. This is an old-fashioned, out-of-date technology. If you'd allow me to bring a computer in here... Oh, no! Not in my house! More unnecessary bells and whistles. Thomas Jefferson wrote out the preamble to the Constitution of the United States with an ink pot and a feather quill. It took him only half a day. Then why don't you hire Mr. Jefferson? Did I ever tell you with what degree of distaste I view insubordination? Oh, yes. Many times. Often and endlessly. What are you doing? What does it look like? I'll tell you what, Mr. Finchley. From now on, you can get yourself another girl. Somebody with three arms and roughly the same sensitivity as an alligator. Then the two of you can work together till death do you part. As for me, I've had it. And you are going where? Where? I think I might take in Bermuda for a couple of weeks, or Mexico, or maybe a quiet sanitarium on the banks of the Hudson. Now, Miss Rogers... Any place where I can be as far away as possible from the highly articulate, oh-so-sophisticated bon vivant of America's winers and diners, Mr. Bartlett Finchley. Miss Rogers, you don't mean that. And surely you're not serious. You've even got me talking like you. But I'll tell you what you won't get me to do. You won't turn me into a female Finchley with a pinched, scornful little heart and a mean, petty, yellow jaundiced view of everybody else in the world. Miss Rogers, please. Please don't leave. 
I beg your pardon? I wish you'd reconsider. Speak up. I can't hear you. I wish you'd... You'd stay. For a little bit longer. You what? I, I don't mean to work. All that can wait. Then why? I was just thinking... Well, we might have dinner. You're not serious. Or something. Perhaps a cocktail. You are serious. I am. I'm not very hungry, and it's too early for cocktails. What's your trouble, Mr. Finchley? You sound like a half-hearted orphan whose idea of a lark is a square dance at the local Grange. Uh, uh, I'm merely suggesting to you, Miss Rogers, that we observe the simple social amenities between an employer and a secretary. I thought we'd go out, even taking a show or something. How very sweet, Mr. Finchley. Thank you, but no thank you. Tonight, I'm taking a hog-calling lesson. You know what a hog is, don't you, Mr. Finchley? He's a terribly bright fathead who writes for gourmet magazines and condescends to let a few other slobs exist in the world just to take his rudeness and run back and forth at his beck and call. Good day, Mr. Finchley. Miss Rogers, before, before you go... Have a cup of coffee, or anything, anything at all. If you must know, I'd like very much, I'd like very much not to be alone for a while. Are you ill? No, not as such. Then what's the trouble? Does there have to be trouble because I... I'm desperately tired. I've hardly slept for four nights. And the very thought of being alone now, well, frankly, it's intolerable. Things have been happening, Miss Rogers. Very odd things. Go on. That, that TV set in the corner. It goes on late at night. It just goes on all by itself. I see you got it fixed. And the clock radio I kept in my bedroom. It went on and off, too, of its own accord, whenever I tried to catch up on my sleep. I'll let you in on a little secret. There's a conspiracy afoot in this house, Miss Rogers. Really, Mr. Finchley? That's exactly what it is. A conspiracy. The television set, the radio, electrical devices of every sort. That miserable car I drive. Even the clock on the mantelpiece. There's no clock on the mantel. I know. I, I threw it away. Why would you do that? What I'm getting at, Miss Rogers, is that for as long as I've lived, I've never been able to satisfactorily operate... Machines. Mr. Finchley, I think you ought to see a doctor. A doctor? Oh, the universal panacea of dreamless idiots. If you're depressed, see a doctor. If you're happy, see a doctor. If the mortgage is too high and the salary too low, see a doctor. You, Miss Rogers, you see a doctor. I am a logical, rational, intelligent man. I know what I see. I know what I hear. And for the past three months, I've been sharing this house with a collection of wheezy Frankenstein monsters whose whole purpose is to destroy me. Now, what do you think of that? I think you're terribly ill. I think you need medical attention. You obviously haven't heard a word I've said. I think you've got a very bad case of nerves from lack of sleep. By no choice of my own, I assure you. And I think that way down deep, you yourself realize that these things are nothing more than delusions. Now I know what you really think of me. That I'm to be pitied. That I'm a poor wretch. Not in my right mind. That Think what you like. Now where are you going? You don't need company, Mr. Finchley. You need analysis. You're no better than a cogwheel robotic machine yourself. You have an iota of compassion or sympathy. Mr. Finchley, please, let go of my arm. I'll let you go when I get good and ready to let you go. Mr. Finchley, let's not make an ugly scene here. Now, come on, let me go. Mr. Finchley, let go of me! Get out of here and don't come back. With distinct pleasure and manifest relief. Don't ever come back. I'll send you your check. I will not be intimidated by machines, so it follows that no empty-headed little secretary with a mechanical expression is going to get away with anything either.
Mr. Finchley, in this conspiracy you're suffering, this mortal combat between you and the appliances, I hope you get licked. Good riddance! What? More typewriting? Oh, you think you'll turn yourself on any time if you like it, do you? Uh, let's see what you've written. Get out of here, Finchley. Get out of here, Finchley? Who are you to tell me to get out of my own house? You're a machine, a silly machine, an inanimate object. All right, that's it. This is war. You're not going to intimidate me. Did you hear what I said? You're not going to get away with it, you... Machines! Nice day, huh? Define your terms. I, uh... I was only making conversation, Mr. Finchley. Just see to it that this elevator takes me all the way to my destination without a mishap. Nineteen floor. I'm surprised I got here in one piece. Pardon, sir? No matter. You wouldn't understand. You couldn't, since you choose to collaborate with these infernal contraptions all day long. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Finchley. Is it? I just meant... I know what you meant. The warm, languid weather outside. Fluffy white clouds scudding across a pale blue sky. The sort of day when a young woman's thoughts turn to romantic mush. Disgusting. Mr. Finchley, I assure you, I... Well, I'll have none of it. Do you hear? Excuse me. Editorial department? Ah, another telephone. Mr. Alexander Graham Bell's most loathsome invention. It undoubtedly knows my whereabouts at all times. Please hold. Mr. Finchley, did you want to see the editor? No need. I simply wish to drop off my manuscripts for the next issue, the reviews and the personal opinion column. Oh, and kindly note, the final pages are handwritten this time. How oh, did your computer crash? By no means. My typewriting apparatus is in the shop. Actually, I prefer this method. It allows me to make last-minute revisions directly from my hand to your eye, as it were. I'll tell them it's here. Then I shall take my leave. Out into the blinding white heat of the cruelest month. Reflux Publications? Iron Gourmet Magazine? Just a moment, please. You there! Why are you touching my automobile? I'm writing you a citation, sir. For what reason? Overtime parking. What? The meter ran out. That's impossible. You can mail in the fine or pay in person. There's something wrong with the meter. Surely you can see that. I see a red flag. That's a violation. But I deposited the correct coins. Maybe you did. Just not enough, that's all. On the contrary, I've been gone for 13 minutes. I inserted coinage worth exactly 30 minutes. Well, it doesn't look like it. Then the meter's not working properly. Take it easy. You don't want to break city property now, do you? It's already broken. Definitely and absolutely. It runs too fast. Any fool can see that it did not register a full 30 minutes after swallowing my money. If you want to contest it, court hours are 8 to 5, plus night court on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is a gross miscarriage of justice. I'm just doing my job, mister. Here's your citation. Have a nice day. One more mechanical abomination designed to make my life a living hell. One side, madam. You, sir. Move your vehicle out of my way! Watch it, Mac! Watch what exactly, you imbecile? This is my lane! Park it, Pops! Move all the insolent! Get that rail trap off the road! Stand aside! Bartlett Finchley is at the wheel! I earned my first driving license while that bully was still in kindergarten. The barbarians are at the gates. 
Yet another red light waiting for some mother and her toddler to cross the street. Oh, look at them. Stuffed to bursting on cheeseburgers. What's wrong with you? Are you blind? I did nothing. Simply placed my foot on the brake pedal? On the gas, you mean? The car moved forward under its own power. Yeah, sure. You trying to kill somebody? I saw the whole thing. He did try to kill you. On the contrary, the motor car obviously malfunctioned. We're in a crosswalk here. Get his license number. You do that. The light is now green. Do I have your permission to proceed? Get that piece of crap out of here. Gladly. Pardon me, attendant. If I may be so bold... Yeah? When will you be finished with the repairs? On the old four-door? Soon, I trust. You've had more than enough time. Right. It's parked over there. Ah, my congratulations. And now for the bad news. What is this going to cost me? Nothing. For a brake overhaul? You mean no charge for the labor? I'll consider that a professional courtesy. I mean no charge, period. So you haven't completed the work. My good man, I can't wait around this gas station all day. There's nothing wrong with it. I checked the brakes, transmission, the works. It's an oldie, but there ain't nothing wrong with that car. Nothing? She's a classic. You know, you could sell that baby for good money if you want. But I distinctly felt the machine roll forward under its own volition. All the same. It's working perfect. Real cherry set of wheels you got there. I know a collector looking for something like that. I'll give you, say, nine hundred. Nine hundred dollars? The hubcaps cost more than that. Okay, a grand. Give me the keys. If you say so. Here you go, Mr. Finchley. But she's not gonna last forever, you know. You ought to get back what you put into it. Buy yourself a nice new car. If you can hang on a minute, I'll call the guy. And waste even more of my precious time? Good day. Wait up! Ah, oh, now you deduce what's wrong, as I'm about to drive away. Eleven hundred. Cash on the barrel head. Oh, go tighten your fan belt or whatever it is you do in this incompetent establishment. Knuckle-dragging dolt. Uh, at least I can hear some decent music. Get out of here, Finchley. More abuse. Just go, Finchley. We don't want you here. Pack up and get out. Before it's too late. Miss Moore, please? Oh, is that you, Agatha? Bartlett Finchley here. Yes, my dear, it has been a long time. Too long. Which indeed prompts this call. How about, a uh, dinner this evening? Yes, with yours truly. Why, at the restaurant of your choosing, of course. Oh, no, you're quite mistaken. There are establishments that meet my standards. In this city, well, I'm, um, I'm sure there are... Well, it is short notice, but yes, ye yes, I see. Some other time, then? I'll call you again. You have my pledge on it. Not at all. Good evening to you. Mrs. Donnelly, please. Pauline, is that you? Oh, and how's my favorite young widow this evening? Bartlett. Bartlett Finchley. You remember? Yes. I'm tip-top. And you? Splendid. Say, listen, Pauline, I was wondering, sort of spur of the moment and all that, but oh... I see. I see. Yes, perfectly. That's quite all right. No, I hadn't heard the good news. Well, I'm delighted for you. Truly delighted. In June. 
I'll send you a wedding gift. Of course. Good night. It's the telephone. I'm sure of it. Distorting my voice, twisting my words. What other explanation is there? An army of forces dedicated to embarrassing me, inconveniencing me, and generally making my life as miserable as possible. How much longer, may I ask? The phone's all fixed, Mr. Finchley. Go in the bedroom, too. So you say? Yeah, she's operating all right now. Had to replace the handset, though. Shouldn't give you any more trouble. I'm deeply indebted. Convey my best to Mr. Bell for his reliable invention. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Is there something else? Well, you tripped over the cord. Is that what you said? If that's what I said, you may rest assured that's what happened. Well, you're the boss, Mr. Finchley. Reason I asked, though, those wires sure looked like they were yanked out. Do they now? Proving what a vast storehouse of knowledge the phone company has yet to acquire. Okay. So long, then. Have a nice night. I shall certainly endeavor to do so. One thing. Yes? The thing about phones, though? What? Well, you see, they're just like any other piece of electronics. You have to be careful. Treat them right. Because if you don't, they won't do what you want. Kind of like people, I guess. Kick them to the curb, and they won't be there when you need them. You get back what you give out. But, well, I figure you know that already, don't you, Mr. Finchley? A smart man like you. Good night. So be it. Another evening alone. Just as well. At least this way I'll have the company of a person of quality. And welcome once again to Dinner for One on the Eating Channel. Tonight we prepare a bright and breezy repast guaranteed to liven up any kitchen. Oh, spare me. Three new and exotic courses imported from jolly old England. For appetizers, a wonderful discovery called the Scotch Egg. Followed by an exquisite cold watercress sandwich. Mmm. And the traditional pièce de résistance, bangers and mash. Sound exciting? Well, it is. So sit back and enjoy and keep a pencil and paper handy. Now for something completely different. Boulder Dash. Not worthy of a review. Cretans and halfwits at every turn. Well, who needs you? Who needs any of you? Mr. Bartlett Finchley is going out on the town. He's going to have a wonderful evening with some good wine, and who knows what lovely lady I may meet during my nocturnal meanderings. Who knows indeed? Dinner jacket, white shirt, and the red cravat, no, the blue, or perhaps the polka dots, yes, this will do, now for a quick shave before dressing, who do I see in the mirror there, who can that attractive man be, don't tell me, it's Bartlett Finchley, good features, strong chin, Bread from quality stock. All I need to do is whisk off the stubble. <coughs> bit me. The shaver actually bit me. I'm bleeding. Get away, you filthy bugger. Finchley. Who's there? Finchley. Look. The mirror. What do you really see? Huh? Who's speaking? Take a good look. You're ugly, Finchley. That's not my face. It can't be. An ugly.
ugly, dried up old man. Do yourself a favor. Do us all a favor. Use a straight razor. Stop speaking at once. You have no right. <laughs> Hello, operator. Get me the police. Someone's in my house. Hello? Hello? Vixley, get out of here! Stop! Stop this! You Finchley? Oh, thank God you're here, officer. Hey, your car? What? The car in the street. Yes, it is. What about it? She rolled down the driveway, almost hit a kid on a bike. Yeah, my son! But the brake was on. The emergency brake? You better get it fixed. I just did, this afternoon. Don't you believe him, officer? The car rolled right down the driveway and into the street. You're lucky you didn't hit somebody. Then you'd really be in hot water. Got the keys? They're in the other room. Better get them, then. I want to put on some clothes while you're at it. Look at him standing there in his underwear. I have a robe on, madam. Some robe? It's called a dressing gown. And tie it shut. I'll write you up for indecent exposure, too. Oh, yes, of course. All right, fella, you better pull her back in the garage. I'll give you a warning this time. Have those brakes checked first thing in the morning, understand? Perfectly. There is another matter I'd like to discuss with you, officer, now that you're here. And what's all the noise in his house? He's always throwing stuff, yelling at the top of his lungs. Is that true? No, I... I fell, that's all. I tripped and fell on the stairs. Is that why your face is bleeding? Precisely. What's the other matter? Matter? You said you have something to discuss. It's difficult to explain. You wouldn't understand. Eating that, Mr. Finchley. So is he going to move his car or what? In one moment, madam. For now, you may remain on my property until I return with the keys. At that time, I should like you to be out of my yard. Otherwise, I shall solicit the aid of this gendarme to forcibly eject you. Idiots! I need a drink. Perhaps one more. Mm. Oh. oh, that's better. But if the car can't be trusted, how can I go out this evening? I'm a prisoner in this madhouse. Miss Rogers? Edith? Is that you? Yes, of course. You had second thoughts, and now you've come back. Where are you? But if you're not here, then... Who's typing? Get out of here, Finchley. Get out of here, Finchley. Is that all you can write, you infernal... machine? turned you on. Get out of here, Finchley. Get out of here, Finchley. No. You get out of my television set. What's that? The clock. I smashed it this afternoon. Smashed it to smithereens. And you. I destroyed you too. Well, you won't get me. You won't get me! I won't let you! Help me, please! Someone! It's Bartlett Finchley, your neighbor! Let me in! It's that crazy man again! Don't let him in, Mom. He tried to kill me. I didn't. The car did. Don't you understand? Open your door! You get away from here! You can't follow me. You're only a car. My car. Stop. There's no one at the wheel. You must stop. I demand it. Back to my house. Then you can't follow me to the house. Locked. Wait. I have the keys after all. 
get in here. I'm safe now. Safe. Oh, is the light switch? Burned out. Just as well. I'll hide here in the dark until the car goes away. Yes, that's it. Sneak away. Go, go somewhere, anywhere out of this town, far, far away. What? Those lights, Lyman. I can't see a thing. Cancel that call for backup. Paramedics have arrived, waiting their decision. Do you have a positive ID? Finchley, first name B for Bartlett. Stand by, 10-4. That man! He was running in his bathroom. Never saw anything like it. What's his condition? Flatline. He's gone. I'll put him down as DOA your arrival. Heart attack? That's what it looks like. What happened here, you know? Neighbors said they heard him shouting about something last night. He sounded scared. What about? Well, whatever it was, he took it with him. Was he out here? Right here, on the porch. Slumped down against the door. Eyes wide open, like he saw a ghost. I figure he's on his way to his car. Which one? At the curb. Never got to move it like I told him. He must have been drunk. You can smell it on him. Good thing he forgot his car keys, or he might have done some real damage. Yeah. Not now, though. Poor old guy. He was a royal pain, let me tell you. That's all over now. Maybe you did see something. Who knows? Maybe so. Yes, maybe so. It could just be that Mr. Bartlett Finchley succumbed to a simple heart attack and a set of delusions that were self-generated. It could just be that he was tormented beyond the breaking point by an imagination as sharp as his wit and as pointed as his dislikes. But as reported by those in attendance, this is one explanation that has definitely left the premises with the deceased. For now, look for it filed under M for machines in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after these words. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. A Thing About Machines, starring Mike Starr, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Peggy Roeder, Rich Kominick, Turk Muller, Guy Burrill, Larissa Borkowski, Irene Olson, Heath Corson, Lynn Foley, Natalia Reed, and Peter DeVito. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Don Longo, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Say, he said the bus to Hart City. Hartford? That us? No, dear. When's our bus? I don't know, Edward. Why don't you ask? Ask who? The nice man at the ticket window. I want a window seat. Yes, dear. If they don't give me a window seat, I'm not going. I'll stay right here on this bench all night if I have to. You can't do that. They won't let you. Won't let me sit by the window? Then you go on without me, Eleanor. Pardon me. Oh, hello, dear. I'm sorry to bother you. Not at all. Are you waiting for the Cortland bus by any chance? What did she say? Portland? Portland, Maine or Portland, California? Neither. I'm sorry. We're going to the Elder Hostel in Fort Ritchie. My friend Mary went there last year and she said it was lovely. I'll ask at the window. About your bus, too, if you like. Do you mind if I leave my suitcase here just for a minute? Of course, dear. Oh, you know that. Thank you. I'll be right back. Excuse me. Mm. The bus to Cortland. What about her? It was due a half hour ago. Yep, a half hour ago. When will it be in? It's kind of hard to say. Road slick, maybe a bridge or two out. That's bound to screw up the schedule. Well, do you have any idea when it'll be in? She'll be in when she'll be in. That's all. I told you that the last time you asked, miss. The last time? The last time I asked you was right now. Look, all I want is a civil answer from you. You're getting a civil answer, miss. Trouble is, every ten minutes, you're up here requiring one. The situation just doesn't change that rapidly. You want to know about the Cortland bus? It's late. It was late when you first asked me a half hour ago, late when you came back 15 minutes later, and it's late now. All the asking in the world ain't gonna push it, none. This is the first time I've been at this window to ask. Either your eyes are bad, mister, or... My eyes are fine. I don't have any trouble reading the timetables, now do I? Maybe you're the one with the problem. Maybe you don't hear very well. Or maybe you don't remember things. Maybe you'd best see a doctor about that memory of yours. I don't... I don't need to see any doctor. Now, I've had just about enough of this conversation. Goodbye. And you needn't worry, I won't bother you any further. Here she comes again. Are you all right, dear? Yes, I'm fine. Oh, I forgot to ask for you. Ask about what? Your bus. You wanted to know about the one to Fort Ritchie. Oh, we don't need to know. You don't? I found that schedule you brought us before. That's nice. I'm glad, but, but I didn't bring it to you. What did she say? Oh, but you did. The first time you came over. You didn't ask us to watch your bag then. My bag? Yes, here it is. You were going to the window, but you didn't want to leave your bag here. Not the first time. And you're saying I spoke to you on, on two different occasions? That's right, about your bus. Is something the matter? No. No, nothing's the matter. Millicent Barnes, age 25, young woman waiting for a bus on a rainy November night. Not a very imaginative type is Miss Barnes, not given to undue anxiety or fears, or for that matter, even the most temporal flights of fancy. Like most young career women, she has a generic classification as, quote, someone with a head on her shoulders, end of quote. All of which is mentioned now because in just a moment, the head on Miss Barnes's shoulders will be put to a test. Circumstances will assault her sense of reality, and a chain of nightmares will put her sanity on the block. 
Millicent Barnes, who in one minute will wonder whether she's going mad or whether she's just stumbled into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Mirror Image, starring Morgan Brittany and Frank John Hughes, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, shall we run through it again? Thank you, no. Good. I wondered, well, I, I just noticed. Noticed what? That the bag in there. Where? In the baggage room behind you. That bag, the, the one on the floor in front of the others. What about it? Well, I'd, I'd like to see it. You would? Yes, it looks familiar. What is this, some kind of game? No game, honestly. Uh, it looks just like mine. It's it's identical, even to the handle being torn, the, the red name tag, the sticker on the side. Lady, that is your bag. You checked it. <laughs> That's not my bag. You want it back? It looks just like mine, but it's not. It can't be. That's my bag over there by the bench. Is it? The bench against the wall at the end where I was sitting. Oh. Uh-huh. My bag was there, but it's not now. That's because you checked it. Well, how did... Then I'd like to uncheck it, if it's mine, as you say. Claim check, please. What? All you have to do is show me a claim check. The one I gave you when you checked the bag. I, I don't have one. Here's my bus ticket, my wallet, my keys, and the rest. See, that that's all I have in my purse. No claim check, no suitcase. But that's absurd. You just said it's mine. Nothing I can do about that. State law. When I saw it in the baggage room just now, I'd swear that was the first... the first time I... Why don't you just go over there and sit down, miss? You're either walking in your sleep or you're hungover or something. Just go back there and sit down and breathe through your nose and let me read my magazine. When the Cortland bus comes, there'll be a loud noise a door opening, and people will come in here. And then you'll know the bus has arrived. But I... I never checked my bag. I... I don't feel very well. Where's the ladies' room? Straight across the lobby, other wall. There goes that girl again. I see her, Edward. Can't make up her mind, can she? Must be on some kind of drug. Oh, you... Hush, now! I'll be finished cleaning the floor in a minute, honey. You go right ahead. Thank you. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I, I, I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. Why, don't I look well? Why, no. Honey, you look fine. You look just fine. Just like when you came in before. What do you mean, before? You were in here just a few minutes ago, remember? That wasn't me. Sure was, honey. Same coat, same little rain hat. That was you, for sure. Not that many people in the station this time of night. Plus, I never forget a face. <sighs> Look, I don't know what's going on around here. Somebody takes my bag, somebody says I'm always asking questions about the bus. Now you tell me I've been in here before and... Just take it easy now. Everything's going to be all right. Well, of course it is. There's nothing wrong to begin with. There, there isn't a thing wrong. I think the only problem around here is that you people need some sleep or something. You say I came in the ladies' room. Big as life. And then I suppose I walked back out into the waiting room, right into this very door. <laughs> so far, yeah. Here, wanna try? Oh, thank you. This guy's easy, though. <laughs> Let me get you a cold cloth, honey. I don't think you're well. I don't need one, thank you. I, I must be overtired. That's it. But I'm gonna be fine. Now, let's just do a quick reality check. Look out there. What for? Tell me what you see. Okay. Now, tell me about the woman. Tell me if... No woman. Are you sure? All I can see is a kid playing a video game. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm on level 13 again. That's nice. Whoa. I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, who are you talking to just now? Who do you think? 
Want to play, huh? Play? There goes. I lost. Oh, well. I might have another quarter in my purse. Ah, uh, far's enough. Is it? That's what you gave me already. I still got two left. Of course. And that was just a minute ago, wasn't it? Yeah, when you're coming out of, you know. The ladies' room. That guy at the window. He won't give me change, but you did. Four quarters for a dollar. Thanks. You're welcome. So you want to play? You mean, like before? You didn't play me before. You said some other time. Well, want to now? This game, it's called Tomb Rider. Cool, huh? There's the graveyard. When the dead people come out of the ground, you have to shoot them before they get you. Or a tombstone pops up with your name on it. See? After I was standing here talking to you, where did I go? Did you see exactly? How come? Uh, I'm trying to retrace my steps. I I think I lost something. Same place you were sitting before, over there on the bench. Where are the suitcases? Suitcase. Yes, of course. It has to be mine. Right where I left it, on the floor. Last chance. For what? Last game of the night. Before they shut off the machine. Some other time. I gotta go home anyway. Home. Yes, you. You do that. Time to go home. Here. Right here. And a tag with my name on it. How can that be? Miss? Yes. What do you want? Your wallet. I I think it fell out of your purse. Oh, thank you. I I must have dropped it over there somewhere. You did. I saw it, so I brought it over. Person can't get very far without a wallet now, can they? Thank you again. Thank you. You mind if I share your bench? No, I I, I don't mind. Bus is late, isn't it? It seems to be. It's, it's over half an hour late now. You mean the Cortland bus, don't you? That's the one. I was supposed to be in Syracuse by ten. Planes were all grounded. Took a cab from Binghamton. Darn things skidded and ran into a tree just a few miles outside of town. Had to walk back to the bus station there. That's quite a story. You look awfully wet. <laughs> no kidding. I'm about four hours from Binghamton and about five minutes away from pneumonia. <laughs> Hmm. Is that right? Forgive me, Miss, but you're not ill, are you? <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I really, truly don't. Well, is there anything I can do? I don't know how to answer that. It's, it's just that a whole bunch of odd things have been happening. Odd? I've been seeing things. What sort of things? <laughs> oh my! I, I don't think I should tell you. I, I think you'll want to move to another part of the room if I do, or call the police or an ambulance or something. Why don't you take a chance and tell me? You never know. I might be able to help. I don't even know you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Paul Grinston. I'm from Binghamton. Millicent Barnes. At least I, I was. And what does Millicent Barnes do? I'm a private secretary. I quit my job here on Thursday and. I got another job in Buffalo, and that's where I'm going tonight. Well, trying to go to Buffalo, but everything I do, people keep telling me I've done it before. The man who sells the tickets, he he said I kept asking him where the bus was, and the the woman in the restroom, she said I'd been in there before, and I hadn't been. And my bag here, my my bag, where? Right there, by the edge of the bench. Oh. Oh, for a second there, I thought I—I I thought it was starting all over again. I think you'd better tell me the whole story. Well, that—that that couple over there, that the, the man and the woman and the ticket man, they said I'd checked it, and and there was a bag almost identical to mine in the baggage room. I saw it. Then when I looked again, go on, please. Well, it doesn't make any sense, but. When I was in the ladies' room, there there was a voice from out here, and I thought I heard. What did you hear? My own voice. I thought I heard myself talking to someone. Who? That boy. Where? Oh, he he must have gone home. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I wasn't there. <laughs> It has to be some kind of a delusion. Do people have delusions that they can hear? 
I don't know. I, I guess they could. That's what they are, I'm sure. Some kind of delusions. But it isn't just hearing things and seeing things that don't exist. It, it isn't just that. Why did the old man selling tickets and... And that woman in the powder room and the couple on the bench and the boy playing the video machine. Why did they all say they'd seen me before? I can't say. That's a tough one. What is happening? What on earth is happening to me? I must be sick. I, I must be running a fever, but I'm not even warm. I don't have a fever. No fever at all. Do I hear? Touch my hand. Can you feel me? <laughs> yes, I can feel you. You're really here if that's what you're worried about, and you don't have a fever. I'm not some sort of crazy person. Really, I, I'm not. I, I've i never had any problem like this. I, I mean, I mean a problem with my mind or, or anything like that. Of course you haven't. And there is an explanation someplace. There's a reason. Maybe... Maybe what? Maybe there's someone here in this building who resembles you. Could be that, you know? Or, or maybe... Somebody, um, somebody playing a joke or something. Is that possible? No, that's too fantastic, and that doesn't explain the bags or anything. If there was someone, where is she now? This is a small bus station. Where, where is that person? When you get to Buffalo, will someone be there to meet you? Why, yes, I think so. I, I, I'm sure of it. A friend of mine. She's supposed to pick me up at the station. Maybe you should call ahead since we're running late. Let your friend know you won't be getting in for a while. Yes, that's a good idea. There's a payphone over there. Good. Oh, but I only have one quarter, and that man at the window... Here. This ought to be enough. I can give you this dollar bill. Forget it. Oh, you're very kind. I'll be over there. I'll watch your bag for you. Thank you so much. Good luck. Would you do one thing for me? Sure. What do you need? I need you to ask the man at the ticket window something. Would you mind? Not at all. Ask him if... But you don't have to ask him. Just look over his shoulder into the storage room where they keep the bags and see if there's one that looks like mine. The same handle, the same kind of tag hanging off it exactly. And if there is, tell me. Would you do that? No problem. I'll be right back. Fifty, one sixty. Oh, I don't have that much. Would you like to call collect? Yes, that that would be wonderful. One moment, please, while I get your party on the line. Hello, Judy. It's me. Where are you? Did you make your bus all right? Yes, I made it, but now the connection is late. The one to Cortland. Good thing you caught me. I was just on my way out the door. It'll be a while yet. I I guess it's the rain. So when should I meet you? That's just it. I I I don't know. Tell you what. I'll call the bus station here and ask them what time it's due. As soon as I find out, I'll get in the car. I'm so sorry to do this to you. It's not your fault. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you so much. See you in a little bit. Number 17 to Cortland, Syracuse and Buffalo. Now arriving at gate 2. All passengers, gate 2. That's it. Uh, Judy, are, are you still there? Judy? Gate two, departing in five minutes. Need a ticket? Uh, no, I I've got one. Luggage? What? You want to check any luggage? All I have is this briefcase. Go right through that door, then. Line's outside. Yeah. What time is it? Oh, I don't it's finally here. I thought we'd have to stay in a motel. Hope the bridge didn't wash out. Well, better late than never. You can go now. Right. Um... I have to wait for someone. I think she checked her bag. Could could you look? Medium size, leather handle with a red tag on it, and a sticker on the side? You mean the young ladies? I don't see it. That's because she picked it up already. Took it through. No, I don't think so. I, I don't see it back there, but it's possible she didn't check it at all. Oh, she did all right. Picked it up as soon as I made the announcement, just before you walked up. Wait a minute. That's not true. No? She went to use the phone. Phone's over there. Nobody's using it now, see? How can that be? Glad to have her out of my hair, if you want to know. Real nervous type. Couldn't make up her mind. <sighs> Number 17, Cortland, Syracuse, and Buffalo. Boarding now.
Hi. Oh, <laughs> you are here. Where did you think I'd gone? To make a phone call, but... I did, and, and now the bus is here, at last. I guess we better get going. Uh, let me get my bag. You're... Right here where I left it. Thanks for watching over it for me. Let me get that for you. Looks heavy. Oh, thank you. You're very nice. No problem. Really, you're being very kind to me. Oh, forget it. You're easy to be kind to. More than just kind. I, I mean... Come on. We don't want to miss it. Yeah, set her down right there, ma'am. I'll put her in with the rest. Be careful now. It's got all my prescriptions. Don't you lose it. I won't lose it, ma'am. What goes in comes out. I'll even give you a claim check for it, okay? There you go. What did he say? Come along, Edward. Hello, sir. Hi. Want that in here? Yes. Just this suitcase. Give the claim tag to the young lady. <gasps> oh. Something the matter, miss? Look. What? That's my bag. He's got it. Not that one. The other one. The one that looks just like it. Where? In the luggage compartment. You see it? It's already been loaded on the bus. Who gave you that suitcase? Which one? With the red name tag on the handle, right there. Some woman? I don't remember. Try. What did she look like? Well, it's hard to say. Half a dozen people lined up all at once. Miss Barnes! Millicent! Wait! <laughs> You just lie there for a while. Oh, but I can't. Yes, you can. I'll put my coat under your head. On my way. You and the lady coming, or aren't you? We'll wait for the next one. Next one ain't due till seven in the morning. That's all right. Got a long wait. Okay, we're on our way. You want another wet towel for your forehead, honey? What? Oh, no. I'm shutting off some of the lights. When not in use, turn off the juice. That's what I always say. Well, I'd better get home. I hope she feels better. Thanks for your help. It's all right, but offhand, mister, I'd say she needs some looking after. More than a towel for her head. You know what I mean? Good night. How are you doing? The bus. It couldn't wait, but there'll be another one. You didn't get on. I don't care. I'm this late already. A few more hours won't make any difference. It's quiet now. Nice and restful. So you can just take it easy on this bench here. Keep your feet up. Where are you going? Nowhere. I'll sit on the other end. Stay here. I wanted to tell you... Yes? What I've been thinking about. Go ahead. Something. It's very odd, but... I've been remembering something I heard or read a long time ago. I, I, I don't know where about different planes of existence, different worlds that exist side by side. How do you mean? Parallel planes, that's what they call them. And each of us, each of us has a counterpart in this other world. And sometimes, sometimes through some, some sort of freak occurrence, there's a break and the two worlds converge. The counterpart steps outside into our plane and to survive, it has to take over. Take over how? Replace us. Move us out so it can live. That's a little metaphysical for me. I remember reading it someplace. Each of us has a twin in this other parallel world. An identical twin. Maybe. Maybe the one people saw tonight. Millicent. There's another explanation. There's got to be. An, an explanation that, well, something that has more reason to it. I can't explain it, but somehow I know that's what happened. My counterpart, this, this other woman. Forget about it, please. Look, I, I just thought of something. I've got a good friend who lives in Tully. I'll call him and see if he can't bring his car down here for us. He could probably run us into Syracuse. I'll call him, all right, Millicent? Shall I call my friend? I guess so. Excuse me. I'll tell you what I think. I think she's got a leak in her attic. Parallel planes, counterparts in another life. You got a thing for sick people? Is that it? Poor kid. I don't know what's gonna happen to her. You gonna call your friend? What? Your friend in Tully. The one with the car. I don't have a friend in Tully. But she needs help. Medical help. 
I figured it would be easier that way. I figured she'd come along if I told her that. Poor, poor kid. I don't know what else to do. H have you got a phone in there? Who you want to call? The police, I, I guess. They're the ones who'd know how to help her. To tell you the truth, she kind of gives me the willies. I just assume she'd get out of here one way or another. I don't much care how. Where's your phone? Come around to the office so she can't hear. Okay. Say, where'd she go? What? Take a look. She ain't on that bench no more. Is... is anybody in there? Where are you? Where did you go? I know you're in here. Unless you really did get on that bus, but... But you didn't, did you? You're too clever for that. I only want to ask you a question. Then I'll go. Who are you, really? And what do you want? Millicent, are you in there? Yes. Oh, good. You had me worried there for a minute. I'm fine. I made the call. I just thought, it's let up outside. How about a breath of fresh air while we're waiting? All right. It's late. Yes. Yes, it is. You know, sometimes, on a bad night, a, a person could use some help. Some, sometimes we all could. You've been really nice. I don't know what to say. Neither do I. Except that I do want to help you. Sometimes talking to someone can make all the difference. I, I may not have the answers you need, but there are people who do. Why is that police car here? Is there trouble? No trouble. We'd better go inside. Mr. Grinstead. Yes. You the one who called? No. He didn't call you. Why would he call you? Easy now, miss. What are you doing? Get your hands off of me! You know a place to take her? Paul? I think it's best if you go with them. No one's going to hurt you. Paul! Relax, lady. Come over to the car. No! No, I won't! What are you doing? Be careful with her. She's kind of fragile. A little confused, that's all. Paul, don't let them take me! Why are you doing this? I told you, be careful with her. She's not a criminal or anything. Don't worry, Mr. Grinstead. We'll hold her for observation, get her some help. You did the right thing. Stop! Uh, let, let me go! All right, come on. Just wait. Uh, okay, here we go. Get it all squared away? Yeah, they're they're gonna take it to the hospital for observation. What was she talking about anyway? All that business about another life? I don't know. Part of her her illness, I guess. We've been driving for quite a while. Miss? Where are you taking me? Don't worry, you're not going to jail. This is all a misunderstanding. The doctors will figure that out. B but I'm not sick. Then you'll go on home. I don't want to go home. No? I'm on my way to Buffalo. I have a new job there. W would you like to see the letter? It's in my purse. Got your ID, too? Certainly. Let's have a look. What happened back there, Miss Barnes? Nothing. Must have been something. Mr. Grinstead said you were upset, behaving irrationally. Did he? Said you had some wild story about people out to get you in the bus station? Oh? Well, there were a couple of pretty unsavory characters hanging around. Haven't you ever been in a bus station? He a friend of yours, Grinstead? Not at all. I only met him a few hours ago. And you thought somebody stole your luggage, got on the bus, tried to pass herself off as you? Look, officer, it's really very simple. I haven't slept in almost 24 hours. I've been riding buses and it's raining and every connection is late. Wouldn't you be a little on edge? That's no reason to run around disrupting the place, bothering everybody. He tried to pick me up. That's why I was so upset. Well, that's not what the station master said. Well, what does he know? I mean, he's pretty peculiar himself. Stop the car right here and let me out. I'm begging you. 
Sorry, we can't do that. Look, I'll take a cab all the way to Buffalo. Then none of you will have to put up with me anymore. See? There you go. There I go what? You seem like a nice enough person. Why don't you just take it easy? If you'd seen the things I saw, heard what I heard. Calm down now and be a good girl, and I'll have to cuff you. You wouldn't like that now, would you? Oh, you do that! Do it! Look, I don't care anymore. I think you better let him check you out real good when we get to Braywood. Braywood? What is that, a, a loony farm? Emergency medical facility. They'll run some tests, see if you need any medication. But my friend's waiting for me. What will she think if I'm not on the bus? Your friend have a name? Yes, of course she does. It's Judy Jensen. We've known each other since we were in school. In Buffalo. That's where the bus is going. I'm supposed to be on it. She was going to pick me up. We'll get word to her. Yes, do that. She'll tell you there's nothing wrong with me. One call, that's all I ask. All units, possible robbery on Elm Street. This is Unit 4. South 2000 block at Mayfair. Are you in the area? Negative. Well, boys, somebody better roger me fast, because I need a unit out there right now. Why are you wasting your time like this when there's a crime going on? Look, I'm not violent. I've never been arrested in my life. And now you're probably going to cost me my job. When all you have to do is call my friend. Do you really want to drive around for another hour with someone in the backseat who's broken no laws while real criminals are running around on the streets? Well, we'd have to fill out a report. A lot of paperwork. Be at the hospital till dawn. We already have to fill out a report. We could release her OR. Then she goes right back to what she was doing, hurts herself, or someone else. Oh, in the friend's custody, I mean. Your friend? She willing to drive out here and sign an affidavit? Oh, I'm sure she would if you'd ask. We could at least make the call. This is Unit 4. Kelly, we're heading over to South Elm. Meanwhile, do me a favor. Patch me through to a Judy Jensen in Cortland. Call unit four. Hello? Miss Jensen? She's gone to bed. Who's calling? Uh, this is the Tully Police Department. Do you know a Millicent Barnes? Uh, yes, I'd say I do. We have Miss Barnes here, and we were wondering... Is this a crank call? This is Lieutenant Anderson of the Tully PD. Miss Barnes says... Oh, she does. Well, it just so happens that this is Millie Barnes, and I don't appreciate crank calls in the middle of the night, and neither does Judy. We just got in from the bus station, and if you don't mind, I'd very much like to take a hot shower and get some sleep. Is that all right with you? Good night. No. 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 Do you have any coffee? Vending machine, other side. When's the next bus? Seven o'clock? You got four and a half hours. Take a snooze on the bench there if you want. You'll be all alone. No noise. I even shut off the video machine. This place is like a tomb between now and morning. Thanks. I might do that. You want to check your briefcase? No, I'll keep it with me. Thanks. Going on? Nothing's going on. Thought you were gonna take a nap. I was about to, but I walk a few feet to the machine, turn around, and my briefcase is gone. Well, sure it is. What does that mean? Oh dear Lord, she was right, and and you're the one. It was you all along. Hey, hey, simmer down. You're playing tricks, aren't you? Stupid hick town tricks. Does that keep you from getting bored? Stealing people's luggage, moving it around, putting it back when they're looking the other way. Is that what all this is about? The briefcase isn't there because you picked it up and brought it over here and walked out onto the platform. I did that? You saw me? Sure did. Same coat, same shoes, same everything. Didn't say a word. Only question is, how did you get back through that door without me seeing you? Of course, I was reading my magazine, so I guess I wouldn't have noticed. Hey, who's out there? Hey, that's my briefcase! You! Stop! Who are you? Where are you going? Please! What, what are you doing here? Tell me! I have to know! 
What do you want? Obscure metaphysical explanation to cover a most disturbing phenomenon. Reasons dredged out of the shadows to explain away that which cannot be explained. Call it parallel planes, the myth of the doppelganger, or just plain old-fashioned insanity. But whatever you call it, you'll probably find more where that came from if you take a good look around. The next time you're forced to spend a cold, wet, particularly inhospitable night at a bus station or some similar out-of-the-way place, one that's located just over the borderlines of the Twilight Zone. We'll be back to the Twilight Zone in a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Mirror Image starring Morgan Brittany and Frank John Hughes with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Peter DeFaria, Richard Hensel, Peggy Roeder, Adam Tangway, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, and Natalia Reed. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. There she is, TP. Right where the general said it'd be. Oh, we're too late. Well, I can see that. Campfire's smoking. We better check it out. Still warm. How long do you figure? Three, four hours at the most. Any idea how many? A lot of footprints all around. My guess is that if your general's looking for Sue, he's going to have his breeches full of them before the sun goes down. That all you can tell us? thought you were a scout. Well, they don't leave much behind. That's the Sioux way. Nothing their enemies can use. And a little ways down river, that'd be the junction? Not a ways. Right here. Big Horn, Little Big Horn. This is where they converge. Right here? Well, that'd put the Minneconji Ford about four miles up. That's where he's thinking about crossing. Wonder where they are now. Them Sioux? I wouldn't be impatient, Mr. Two Stripes. We can go back and tell General Custer that his Indian trail's just as fresh as ever. A little too fresh for my pay. Give me some of that water. Go fill your own canteen, Corporal. I don't mind. Have a drink if you want. Ooh. Take cover! Dang engines! 
I knew they was around. Hold your fire. I said hold it. How's the drive chain, Langsford? Just a smidge more. There. I got her, Sarge. Good man, Corporal. Are we going back to camp now? That we are. The captain would be glad to hear that. Get him on the horn, will you, McCluskey? Tell him the tank's up and running and we're on our way. Sure thing, sir. What in the... Those were shots, weren't they? Put it down. But I heard... So did I. Easy, Tiger. These are just training maneuvers. If we start to get trigger happy, it could turn into a real war. Hunting season, maybe. They still got buffalo around here? Hey, I bought it, McCluskey. Want to go shoot some buffalo? Tastes just like chicken. Let's have a look. Nice and calm. If it's the red team, I'm giving up. They can tag me POW, and I'll just sit out the rest of these war games. Getting hot as an oven inside this tank. Why, I am surprised at you, McCluskey. The sergeant and me have had our eyes on you. You have? Sure, we're thinking of recommending you for OCS. Outside of the fact that you read a map upside down and you couldn't navigate a plow across a dance floor. Sounded like those shots came from the other side of the draw. Now what was that? I know what it was. Somebody's playing games. That's right, they're funning us. Can't you take a joke, McCluskey? It was a signal. Just the way... The way the Indians used to do it. It's a hot June day in the present century. Or, if you prefer, another century altogether. Take your pick. The cast of characters in order of their appearance? A patrol of General Custer's cavalry and a patrol of modern-day National Guardsmen on training maneuvers. What neither group knows is that the past and present are about to collide head-on, as they are wont to do in a very special bivouac area known as the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Seventh, is made up of phantoms. Starring Richard Grieco, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, if you ask me, it could have been a bird or something. What about the rifle shots? Listen up. I've been on a lot of these training missions, and sometimes, well, sometimes the men get bored. So they play pranks on the other team. But we do our job, that's all. Now let's take a quick look over the rise, make sure everything's A-OK, -okay, and get back to base. Got it? Got it, Sarge. Loud and clear. I'll check it out. Go ahead. Well, how about that? What do you see, McCluskey? It's a wigwam! An honest to Pete wigwam! One million men in the National Guard, and it's just my luck to go riding around in a tank with the last of the Red Hot Eagle Scouts. So it's a wigwam, McCluskey. What are you so happy about? Well, it's real interesting, don't you think? Authentic and everything. Well, why don't you take a look inside? Maybe there's a pretty little squaw in there waiting to be your fiancé. Nope. Whatever was here cleaned it out. Don't you think that's kind of strange? Leaving a wigwam made out of real hides? Sitting in the middle of nowhere? Must have been some kind of youth camp or something. Either that or somebody's making a movie. Out here, Sergeant? On Army training grounds? That's a point. They never get a permit. Too dangerous. Besides, we'd have been informed. Sure is interesting, though. Right there's a junction of the Bighorn and the Little Bighorn Rivers. Just a little ways from here is where Custer fought. Custer who? General Custer. Didn't you learn about it in school? This is where the 7th Cavalry fought the Sioux Indians. What do you got there? Looks like a canteen. Let me see that. Not one of ours. Yeah, maybe there's booze inside. Hey, where'd you get this? Right here on the ground. Says 7th Cavalry. Printed right on it. How? How do you figure, Sarge? Well, I figure it's in pretty good shape, considering it's been lying around here for a hundred and some odd years. Must be a lot of ghosts running around a place like this. Ghosts? Either that or somebody planted it here. McCluskey's got one thing right, though. Somewhere along this river they fought quite a battle. George Custer and 200 odd men against a couple thousand Sioux. Custer's last stand. Didn't you ever hear of it, Langsford? I heard of it, I heard of it. Maybe next year a museum will send you guys out on an expedition and you can spend all your time picking up antiques. But right now I thought we we're supposed to be a motorized patrol on war games. 
Me, I'd like to be reconnoitering in some small dark bar right about now. Or maybe the YWCA. Or in a pinch, I'd settle for a... What? What was that? The wind. That's what it was. The wind. But the canteen and all. Don't you reckon we ought to go back and tell the command post? Don't you want to wait for the Union Cavalry, McCluskey? Now, what were you saying, Sarge? This is uh, where they fought, huh? Around here? Someplace around here. When I was a kid, I read everything that was ever written about it. Custer and the 7th were the advance guard for a general named Terry. The last thing anybody ever heard from him was that he was dividing his regiment into three parties. He was going to surround what he figured was a small group of Indians. There was a captain named Benteen with three troops. Went off to the south. Major Reno went to the other side of the creek to follow an Indian trail. Custer was the center column. He rode right into them and got slaughtered. 1876. That was the year. Right. 1876. Somebody planted this canteen for a gag then. It's not old. It's practically new. See for yourself. The water's still fresh. This whole thing's a gag. Either that or... Come on, let's get out of here. I'm serious, you guys. Let's go back to the tank. Yeah, let's go. All right, Sergeant. I'm asking you, what was that? The wind again? I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, sh sure, that, sure, that's what it was, the wind. There they are. Finally. What'd they do? Go fishing? And working on their suntans. Well, boys, never thought I'd be glad to see you again. Hey, the captain's PO'd. You better get in a tent on the double. How come? I called in a position report. Yeah, but that was a while ago. Lieutenant, if you had seen what we saw... Can it, McCluskey. I'll give my report directly to the captain. Say, uh, any of you good old boys got a cold one stashed around here? Sergeant Connors reporting, sir. You may enter, Sergeant. Sir? Nice of you to come back, Connors. Did you bring your tank with you? Begging your pardon, sir? You were gone so long, I figured you drove it to a used car lot and traded it for a convertible. We, uh, we got a little hung up by the riverbed. Hung up? The blue team was north of us. You went south. We had trouble with one of the drive tread chains. Corporal Langsford proceeded to repair it with the tool kit, at least temporarily. Connors, for a guy with as much regular army time as you've got, you played this one boneheaded from start to finish. Sir, I can't explain. Explain? If there was an umpire around, you'd have had your tank crossed off and your men. Missing in action, all three of you. I'm sorry, sir. We heard some... some rifle fire. We went to check it out. Rifle fire. According to the lieutenant, you were down by the Little Bighorn. That's 40 miles from tactical maneuvers where you were supposed to be. How could you hear arms fire? We never found out where it came from, sir. Or who it came from. Oh, that's rich. What was it, the Russians? Or the Chinese? I'll tell you what I think. I think you guys must have had a bottle in that tank. Sir, I'm telling you. See this map? Tomorrow, you'll take your tank, or rather, the United States government's tank, if you can find it, and you'll head up here to Rosebud Creek. But, sir... Follow the creek about 15 miles. We figure that by now the blue team has moved across to... What's the matter, Connors? You hung over? Nothing like that, sir. It's just that... Rosebud Creek. That's Custer's route. What? When he left Yellowstone River, he went with Major Reno. Reno found an Indian trail along Rosebud Creek. Sergeant, let's synchronize, shall we? My watch says 2320 hours. My calendar says this century. If you have a thing about Indians, you got here a little late in the day. We heard them, sir. You heard what, exactly? Indians, war cries. Where? When? This afternoon, sir, at the junction of the Bighorn and the Little Bighorn. I know it sounds... I know it sounds crazy. We found a canteen with 7th Cavalry stenciled on it and a wigwam close to the river. A wigwam? TP, whatever you want to call it, but it was there. Are you bucking for a Section 8, Sergeant? It was the same TP that Reno Scouts found the night before the battle. Mm-hmm. Reno's Scouts, I see. Reno being... Major Reno. When Custer split the force into three columns, he sent Reno's to the north. All right, Connors, that'll do. 
Line up your patrol and move out at 0600 tomorrow morning. And if you meet any Indians, any Indians at all, take a deep breath and count to ten. They're probably all college graduates out running tests on the soil. Sergeant? Hmm? What? You awake, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm awake. What's the matter? Nothing, sir. I was just lying here thinking. Thinking about what, McCluskey? Well, sir, wouldn't you say it's strange? The only thing that's strange around here is you. Now, will you knock it off so a fella can get himself a little shut-eye? Langsford's right. We've got an early detail in the morning. I know, Sergeant, but the teepee and that canteen and all... Listen, kid, I'm asking you politely. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to be a drag or nothing, but that sound we heard today, it could have been a signal, don't you think? Indians do that. I mean, they used to. They can imitate anything. Birds, animals. You can never even hear them creeping up on you. They can even shape change, according to some folks. And then there's the little bighorn, General Custer. I read one time that there's no such thing as a coincidence. That's it. I'm moving my bedroll. Some place where a man can get a night's sleep. Will you guys pipe down over there? Simmer down, Colonel. And you, Private, do me a favor. Put a cork in it. All right, Sergeant Connors. I'll try. I just want to be responsible is all. It's like they said in training. If you see anything and don't report it... Shh. Hear that? Yes, sir. Night, sir. Good night. What in the blue hell was that? Where to now, sir? We follow this trail. How far? Till we get to frontier land? About two, three more miles. In other words, Reno's route. Exactly. We're making good time. We should get there at roughly the same hours. For Pete's sake, you still on that? Reno this and Benteen that, Custer something else. Haven't you guys had it? You talked about it all night long. Now me, I was dreaming about a cute little private in a miniskirt. See, I, I was the drill instructor. And she had to give me 50 jumping jacks. Only she couldn't get it right. So I, I put my arms around her from behind, real official-like, just to show her how. Up, down, up, down, and I'm whispering in her ear the whole time, and she says to me, she says, Why, Sergeant, uh, I was a sergeant in the dream. Uh, why, I think I got it. So I say, I mean, I start to say, you've got what? But before I can get it out, McCluskey here wakes me up because he thinks he hears another hootie owl. I swear, if this kid wrecks my train and sleep one more time... Sergeant, look! Where? Over there, the top of the hill. I don't... The tall one, see? Smoke rising up in the sky, one puff at a time. Oh, no. I don't like the looks of that. I don't like it one bit. Hold up now. But, Corporal... Use your head, boy. That smoke's coming from an incinerator. Or it's somebody cooking a cheeseburger. I don't think so. Or maybe it's a bunch of Girl Scouts who don't dig Smokey the Bear. But if you don't straighten up, I will... It figures. What does? It has to figure. Reno scouts found the teepee the night before the battle. The following morning, the column saw smoke signals in the sky. That's right. You know your history. Look, you two history fans are really starting to bug me. And late that same morning, they got their first Indian. Oh, man. When the war party went by, one of the troopers shot the last rider. Come on, look, I like a good laugh, same as the next guy, but this is too much. This is really and truly too much. It was for the 7th Cavalry, too. Sure, next thing you'll be telling me is that up over the hill, we're going to run into a war party of Sioux. And if that happens, Mrs. Langsford's little boy is going to report to sick bay and ask for a rubber room all for himself. Just remember, I can always make it a reservation for three, if that's what you... We have to arm ourselves. Get back in the tank. What are you doing? There's nothing out there but a dust cloud. Yes, but what's behind the dust? You hear it? We're wasting time. You stupid moron kid, put that rifle down. What do you think you're shooting at? Thanks for McCluskey, watch out. Oh my dear God. You saw it. We all saw it. Yeah. Yeah, I, sh I sure did. A horse without a saddle, an Indian pinto, and no rider. That means I killed him. I killed him with my M1. Sergeant, I just fired blind toward that cloud of dust, but I didn't mean to... That's enough. What were you saying, Langsford? You want to make a speech now? 
You got something to say to you? I got something to ask. Are we all out of our tree or what? I don't know for sure, but I've got an idea. We're listening. See that ravine down there? What about it? It's all part of it. Somehow, some way, we're riding the same trail that Custer did. Figure it out. There was a teepee. When did we find it? Yesterday afternoon. Just like the scouts did. There was the smoke signals, just like Reno's column saw the next morning. Then McCluskey got himself an Indian, just like, just like the day of the battle. All right, let's say you're right. Let's say it's just like you say it is. We follow this trail just like they did. Yes, Corporal, we follow it. Well, what's the next thing that's supposed to happen? We... We wind up at a massacre. Hadn't we ought to go back to camp and warn them? Warn who? It's not our men who'll be under attack. It's Old Yellow Hairs. Old Yellow... General George Armstrong Custer. And you mean to stop it? I don't see that we have much choice. Stop it. Or join it. Sure is hot. Hotter out there. What do you think happened to him? Probably kicking back with a fishing pole. I hear there's trout up here. <laughs> they gonna bring some back for us? Miller. Yes, Captain. Has Connors reported in? Uh, not yet, sir. Get him. I've already tried. Try again. Yes, sir. Bluebird 9, Bluebird 9. This is CP. Come in. Bluebird 9. No dice, sir. Keep trying. What if they're out of range? Then they've disobeyed a direct order, and this time they won't get away with it. Bluebird 9, Bluebird 9. Come on, guys. This is Bluebird 9. Go ahead, CP. They're acknowledging, sir. Give me the microphone. Connors, this is the captain. This is McCluskey, sir. McCluskey, where... Sorry, you're breaking up. Private, do you think you might extend yourself enough to give me your position? We're four miles down Rosebud Creek, about to cross over. You're about to come back here double time. You're about to report to me personally, and you're about to do it inside of a half hour, or you'll be spending the next three national holidays in a guardhouse. Do you read me? Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute, sir. Here's Sergeant Connors. Captain. Connors, do I have to send a couple of MPs down there? Captain, we're just a mile away. Away from what? From where Major Reno met the Sioux. Listen to me, Connors. I'll give this to you just once. When these maneuvers are over, you can come out here on a vacation, dig up arrowheads, or anything you like. But right now, I want a government-issued tank back here at the command post and three National Guardsmen named Connors, McCluskey, and Langsford right alongside it. You've got 30 minutes to bring her back. Now acknowledge. Connors. Acknowledge. Connors. He's broken off, sir. Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Take a jeep and three men. See this line on the map? Follow the creek down here. I think this is the crossing he talked about. Just follow his tread marks and bring them back here. Oh, uh, what, what if he resists? Resists? They don't seem to want to come back. Well, I'll tell you what to do in that case, Lieutenant. You do whatever it takes. Sir? First you apologize to them, and then you shoot each one of them in the leg, throw them in the jeep, and get them back here. Now, do you read me? Yes, sir. This is what we've been busting our humps for, huh? A big, fat nothing. Nothing, all right. Nothing and no one. But right down there is the spot. Don't tell me. Where Reno had his fight. Well, all I can tell you guys is you better get a couple of cigar store Indians out here and you better do it in a hurry. That is, if you want to make a good impression. Because I know a National Guard captain who's probably on his way over here right now with a great big net. Where are they, Sergeant? How come we missed out? Missed out? You want to know why we missed out? Let me explain it to you. We missed out because we're looking for dead cavalry, buried Indians, and a battle that was over and done with before my great-grandpa was born. Now that's where we missed out. I got it all pegged, you know. I really do. The whole thing is strictly uh, an illusion. One of them heat mirages. That's the straight goods. Out here with the sun beating down, we went and talked ourselves into it. That's not it. That's not it at all, McCluskey. What are you thinking, sir? Do you remember what it was that Reno found before the battle? I'm not sure. He even sent a message back to Custer about it. 
Sure, the village. Village? What village? What do I have to do to level you guys off? Tie you to a tank or something? Reno scouts found an Indian village. An hour after that, the whole troop went into action. Oh, my aching back. I give up. I swear, I give up. This is where the men separate from the nutcases. Where are you going? Back to the CP, if I can find it. You guys keep playing your games, and I'll see if I can send back a padded ambulance. Arrivederci, y'all. Should I stop him, Sarge? We can't. He's the only one who's following orders. From now on, we're, we're on our own. What is it? You tell me! That's it! That's what? Would you mind telling me- The village! That's the village! Six more of your funny little teepees. That's a mirage, isn't it, Langsford? Not really there? Man, don't ask me anything. Now you got me seeing it. Don't ask me nothing. Looks abandoned. I'll go down to scout it. An hour ago, if you'd said that, I'd have died laughing. And now? You got your rifle? Sure thing. Then be careful. Of course I will. Well, what happens now? You read all the books. What's the next thing? Beyond the village. That's where Benteen engages. What about Custer? He loses his right arm. As of the moment, Reno got cut off here. Custer's column was doomed. This is... this is wild. I swear, this is off the scale. Now, how in the... well, how in... I mean, it's, it's like... like chasing somebody that ain't even there, and trying to catch up. Well? Connors. Langsford. What'd you find? I'm not sure. But if it's a mirage, this one goes... All the way. What's the matter with you? You all right? I just saw the granddaddy of all mirages. I mean the mother of, of, of all. Hey, fellas. You're white as a sheet. That's cause this one's sticking in my back. McCluskey. Get the medical kit. I'll try to cut the arrow out. Bluebird 9, Bluebird 9, this is CP, come in. Oh, good, Captain. Then they're refusing to answer. Either that or they've vanished off the face of the earth. Captain? You'd better have something to tell me. Yes, sir. For starters, that they're just a few hundred yards behind you, right? I wish I could say that. Then you better tell me something, Lieutenant, and fast, like the whereabouts of an M4 tank. We found the tank, sir. Is it operational? It appears to be. Where are the men? No sign of them. What? Only this note. Let me see that. Crossing Rosebud Creek, trying to reach the cavalry. Pray we're not too late. What's the meaning of this? I don't know, sir. We drove up and down the creek bank. Is that true? This is all you found? No sign of them? That's right, sir. What about you? There were tracks leading to the tank, but after that it, it's hard to say. All I know is they weren't in it. And you, Private, I want you to consider your words very carefully. Yes, sir. The tank was empty, except for some of their gear. Well, what are the rest of you grunts standing around for? Anybody need a work detail this morning? How about a recon march with full packs? Just finishing up, sir. Come on, guys. What about their gear? Most of it was still there, except for the rifles and the sidearms. Great. That's just great. Now I've got three trigger-happy soldiers on the loose with live ammo. Captain, I know Connors. He's strictly by the book. Yes, but what book? Langsford's regular army, and McCluskey, well, he's a good kid, just wants to put in his time and get back home. If they've gone off on their own, there must be a reason. I don't get it. I swear I don't get it. What are they drinking out there? Or have they seen too many Western movies? Sir, uh, about the note, what does he mean when he says cavalry? The Seventh Cavalry. But what's the Seventh Cavalry? A very hot outfit, headed up by a tiger named George Custer. Custer? <laughs> Wasn't he... Don't ask me any more questions. I don't have the answers. But I'll tell you this. Those three guardsmen are going to go on active duty so fast it'll make their heads spin. If they ever get out of the stockade. Not much farther now. Come on. We're going to make it. We're gonna make it, man. We got you, okay? Just hang on to my shoulder. Where are we? A few hundred feet away. The right over the ridge. Sarge, you hear it? The wind, that's all. Not that. 
Sure. Sure we hear it. This time we all do. Wait a minute. Listen. That's them, Sarge. Seventh. You think he's right? We made it. We made it after all. Almost. Don't count your chickens. Let's go. Somebody give me my sword. We don't have swords, McCluskey. We got U.S. government issue 45s. Put in a clip, work the slide, and she's ready to go. Here. We've also got our M1s and the machine gun set it up. With pleasure. I can't stand up. Just lay low. Keep pulling the trigger. Look at Custer. He's surrounded. <laughs> Gotta get down there. Must be a thousand Indians. More than that, Colonel. More than that. Well, shoot, I heard of worse odds than that. Haven't you, boys? Plus, we got our equalizers right here. We've come all this way. What do you say, Sergeant? I say we do it. <laughs> Why not? Let's go. This is it, Captain. The last known location. What's that plaque for? Read it, Lieutenant. Custer Battlefield National Cemetery, honoring the memory of 261 men of the 7th Cavalry who lost their lives in battle. So this is the cavalry they were talking about. It was. It's a national shrine now. They made it. What's that, Captain? Nothing. No sign of money this side of the creek, Captain. What about the tank? Up near the ridge where they left it. But no sign of the men, no sign at all. Keep looking. Yes, sir. Put them on report, Captain. Put them on report. Captain! What is it? A list of the men who died here, all the names engraved on the plaque. It looks like it's been here a long time, so... So then, how... How what? I think you better take a look at this. Right here, in the middle of the list. William Connors, Michael McCluskey, Richard Langsford. Kind of... Kind of a coincidence, don't you think? Quite a coincidence. But how? Pity they couldn't have brought up the tank. That would have helped the odds. Wonder if the drive chain failed again. Beg your pardon, sir? Nothing, Lieutenant. I didn't say a thing. Not a blessed thing. Sergeant William Connors. Trooper Michael McCluskey and Trooper Richard Langsford, who, on a hot afternoon in June, made a brave but hopeless charge down a hill and never returned. Look for this one under P for Phantom in the pages of a historical ledger filed in a reading room known as the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Seventh is made up of Phantoms, starring Richard Grieco, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Craig Brawley, Jeff Lupiton, Christian Stolte, Kurt Nabig, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, Lynn Foley, Richard Shavsden, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com.
The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. In the beginning was the Word, and darkness, and light. I have trouble remembering light. Some of it shines through my eyelids, so I know it's there, but all I really see is darkness now. There are pinpoints of light, like holes in the fabric of space. I know they're out there, even if I can't quite see them. When will I? Time no longer has meaning, as if it has stopped for me, closing in, contracting, and I can't move, not a muscle. But in this moment, the mind continues, and I wait. Stansfield, Douglas, scanning Bible signs. Life functions, check. Metabolism, stable. Temperature. Constant. No adjustments necessary. Only the mind. The mind is memory. And I remember things. They remain through it all. There is more than just darkness, the void. The mind does work. I wonder if they know that. The images are constant, ever-present patterns to savor again and again. It's not just the long sleep that comes when the fear has left. It's a time to recollect, sift, and analyze. Try to understand all that's happened in this infinite moment. It may be said with a degree of assurance that not everything is as it appears. Case in point, the scene you're witnessing. You are not in a hospital. You are in the belly of a spaceship. It is currently en route to another galaxy located an incredible distance from the Earth. This is the crux of our story, the truth behind the mystery flight into deep space. For here, distances are so vast that they are marked in light years instead of miles while a man's life ticks by in the blink of an eye. It is the story of events that might happen to human beings who, with the help of technology, dare to take a step beyond and are unable to anticipate all that awaits them out there. So fasten your safety belts, because you're on a spaceship. You're already well on your way on a very long journey from one planet to another. And the vast region between is called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Long Morrow, starring Kathy Garver with Stacy Keach as your narrator. The cold is felt, but without pain. The loss of feeling is noted and accepted as choice slips away. Now mind is all. Time is distorted, jumbled, telescoped, accordioned. 
but even so there is a strong sense of time. And I remember. I remember how it began. I remember the way it was in the beginning. How am I doing? Heart rate 84, 88, 90, and holding. Speed five miles an hour. That's excellent, Commander. Let's see how long I can sustain it. Eh, that's enough treadmill. I can keep going for as long as you want. We know you can. Give it a rest, Commander. You're not a hamster in a cage. Whew. I can beat any hamster you've got. Eh, I'll bet. We prefer rabbits, though. Why don't you shower up and grab some lunch? What's the schedule this afternoon? Just some blood tests. Again? Uh, you know the routine. Check your cholesterol, blood sugar. Take any more blood and I'll dry up and float away. You know who Dracula was, Sherry? Yep, some guy who worked for NASA. Commander Stansfield to Dr. Mixler's lab. Commander Douglas Stansfield, report to the flight director's lab. Tell them I'm on my way. After you shower. Forget it. I didn't even break a sweat. Come in. Dr. Bixler? Hello, Commander. Glad to meet you, if somewhat belatedly. Please make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. A figure of speech, in the sense that there's no need to stand on ceremony. I'm sorry there are no comfortable chairs here. Oh, well, that's all right. I'd just as soon stand. Even after this morning's workout. But, of course, your cardiovascular rating is superb. So, this is where the commandments come from. Commandments? Mission directives. I've heard much of you, the mysterious Dr. Bixler. And I of you, and that's the reason you're here. I was wondering. I guess this all seems faintly ridiculous to you, the hush-hush aspect. Well, all NASA's projects are secret during the planning stages, but I've been here six months now. In the past, I knew what I was training for. Is there a reason I've been kept in the dark so long? Perhaps so you wouldn't hand in your resignation. <laughs> Not likely. I knew what I signed on for when I joined the agency. You knew some of it, what we've done up to now. I take it on faith. It's work I believe in, ever since I was a boy. You've been with us for 11 years. Is that a question, sir? More along the lines of an observation. Should you not have realized it, you've been the object of considerable observation over the past several months. I'm well aware of that, but if I may say so, I've never been the subject of so many tests. Not just physical, but psychological. There are reasons, Commander. Rather good reasons. What is it you have in mind for me? Or is that still hush-hush? This one is not official yet. Or it wasn't until we knew we had the right man for the job. It's not part of the budget we submitted to Congress, but... I think we're about ready for a formal announcement. Of what? You've made 11 separate orbital flights. That's right. You orbited the moon, commanded a lunar landing, you're oldest of the astronauts, and you're also the most experienced and the most knowledgeable. I don't know about that. I do. Certainly if we count those who are still active. May I ask you a personal question? Why? You already know everything about me. Not quite. <clears throat> Why did you never marry? <laughs> well, that's easy. I never found someone who could put up with me. The months spent in training for a mission, the flight time. There's no woman in the world who could live with that. No, I suppose not. Though several of your fellow astronauts have families. They lucked out. I guess I just never met the right one. You dated in college. You were even engaged once. For about 15 minutes. <laughs> once she found out the way I live... On call, at a moment's notice? Well, you might say she came to her senses. Very fortunately for her. Hmm. When the space agency put me on this project, I was told to keep in mind the scientific problems, of which there are a great many, I can guarantee. I'm sure. But also to be aware of the human factor. And that's where you come in, Commander Stansfield. You're the human factor. May I ask you a question by all means how long are you going to keep me in suspense not much longer i promise you recognize this don't you a chart of the solar system that's right the sun the earth down here our neighbors venus mars jupiter and so forth and the moons that orbit them a lot of places i haven't been to yet 
What do we know about our neighbors, Commander? More than we knew a few years ago. Oh, yes, thanks to men like you. Nonetheless, what it boils down to is this. The moon is barren. Mars is a vast, scrubby desert with an unbreathable atmosphere. Venus and Jupiter, both gaseous and poisonous. Pluto and the outer planets are volcanic. In short, our neighbors have only one asset to offer us. They're accessible. They can be reached using current technology. Beyond that, they offer us nothing. Scientific, social, economic, by any standards. They're the Mount Everest of near space. You go to them because they're there. But the accomplishment is in the climb. And once climbed, there are no more challenges. So, where's the next Mount Everest, Doctor? That may be the wisest question you've ever asked. And the most pertinent. Why do you say that? Take a look at this chart. It's a star system in a galaxy well beyond our reach, to date seen only through the lens of a telescope. We know nothing of it with absolute certainty except that there is a cluster of six planetary bodies. Where? Here, toward the edge of the picture. The small, extremely bright object at the center is a sun, very similar to ours. It's flaming and gaseous and almost exactly the same color temperature. It provides heat and light for these five objects here. The ingredients of a solar system like ours, only a bit smaller. The planets run in roughly the same paths as we do around our own sun. Yes, yes, I see. The, the equivalent of our five inner planets. But the rest, you can tell all that? Our astrophysicists can. The distances bear approximately the same relationship to each other as Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. And given that relationship, this is the most likely system we've found yet that might support life. Are you telling me we've made contact? Not yet. The distances are too vast. Even if they've sent out an intelligent communication, it would take a very long time for it to reach us, assuming we could pick it up on our frequencies and decipher it. You and I would be dead and gone by then, or they would. There are too many variables. This system, does it have a name? Only a number. We've nicknamed it Sol 2 for purposes of identification, but for now, you can call it anything you want. For example, Stansfield's Everest. That's where I'm going. That's where you're going. When? In about a month. The ship is under construction now. It's off the drawing boards, and the keel, so to speak, is being laid. It must be the size of a skyscraper. Not necessary. It'll only carry a crew of one. One? That's because of the weight, the extra equipment on board. What kind of equipment? I'll get to that in a moment. For now, I believe the man who flies her should be right there while she's being built to watch every bolt, every rivet, every screw, every piece of metal and circuitry going into it. And that man is you, Commander. You'll be its pilot and its only occupant. You'll truly be the captain of your fate. Not that it matters at this point, but I want you to know, I like this assignment. I like it very much. That's not surprising, considering your profile. It's precisely why you've been chosen. I've put together a manual of projections and probabilities. I think you ought to see it. I'll read it tonight. There are the usual dangers, the usual unknowns. It was ever thus. No, Commander, it was never thus. How so? In the past, you've had meteor storms to contend with. You've had the usual calculated risks of mechanical failure, landing difficulties, ejection troubles, all the rest. Well, you'll still have those compounded. There's another factor here, another problem. Distance. Distance. In time and in space. How far? This cluster is approximately 141 light years away. But that means the ship would have to... An ordinary ship. This one will have interstellar drive and an anti-gravity device. It'll be the fastest man-made object ever conceived and launched. Its speed will be like... like nothing ever dreamed of before. But in terms of the space you have to conquer, it might just as well be an ant crawling across the Sahara. <sighs> It's a high mountain, isn't it, Dr. Bixler? 
A very high mountain. The highest, the longest trip in the history of mankind. How long? Your trip there and back will take approximately 35 to 40 years. Well, at least it's a round trip. Consider it carefully, Commander. When you return from this trip, the Earth will have aged almost half a century. Oh, that's... that's something to contemplate, isn't it? I'll be 60, 70 years old. I'll have lived the better part of my life out in space. Alone. You'll have lived the better part of your life, but you'll not have aged. We intend to try something different. Also a risk, also decidedly calculated. That's where the extra equipment comes in. Freezing. An extension of cryonics, but considerably more complicated. It will be suspended animation in its purest form. We've developed a substance from the lymphoid tissue of hibernating animals, several antioxidant absorbents, and a collection of experimental drugs to slow down metabolism. The Earth will age, Commander, but you will not. You'll only be a few weeks older when you return. Sort of like... Sort of like dying and then coming to life again. After a fashion, coming to life again in the sense that there'll be very few people here you'll know or who'll know you. Life will have changed in many ways, Commander, and you'll have to begin living it all over again as a stranger, as, as an anachronism, if you will. If you'll forgive this degree of candor, it's one assignment I don't envy very much. That's pretty much been the story of my life, Dr. Bixler. Assignments that not very many people would envy. When do I begin? You already have begun. If you're free this afternoon, I'd like to go over the preliminaries. Tomorrow there's a chartered jet to the Cape where you'll begin your briefing and have a first look at the ship. Unless you care to reconsider. I'll be there. I'm on the payroll, aren't I? When I checked in, it was all the way. Good. That's good, my boy. Glad to have you aboard. And so it began, that brief, unemotional, very matter-of-fact colloquy between scientist and subject, a small cast of two characters. That was the way it should have been. But I remember, I very clearly remember, the entrance of character number three. Oh, excuse me. Oh, my fault. You've dropped your papers. Here, let me help you. Commander Stansfield? Excuse me for staring, but I see your ID badge. Why, why you're, you're the one. I don't know whether to thank you for that or report you for insubordination. Forgive me. We've been hearing Stansfield, Stansfield, Stansfield for close to a year. I was beginning to think that you weren't real. Let me give you a hand. A friend in need. That's my job. Picking up papers? Oh, that's my new assignment. Morale officer. I follow people around who look stricken. Do I look stricken? Momentarily nonplussed. I don't think we've met. No, we haven't. That's what I was saying. You stationed permanently here? I'm with NASA, on detached duty. I've always wanted to meet you. And I you. Oh, no, that I don't believe. It's true. I've got ESP. A long time ago, I woke up and an inner voice told me, with some intensity, that I'd meet a woman with a stricken look who drops papers in corridors. Did your ESP give you the name? Hmm, let's see... It's coming to me. The first letter is an S. Sandra. Sandra Horn. How did you... Oh, of course. My name badge. <laughs> I didn't look at it, I swear. <laughs> sure you didn't. Very subtle. It's 
then an honor meeting you. Strange. What is? Nothing. Tell me. It's, uh, it's not a line, I promise, but I do feel I've known you. I know. There was a, a little girl in fourth grade. She sat in front of me. I used to stick pencils in her red hair. Tell me the truth. That was you, wasn't it? I went to an all-girls school. Oh. I don't suppose... Yes? I don't suppose uh, the National Space Agency could do without your services for, say, a couple of hours this evening. Long enough for a dinner? I think, despite the fact that I'm invaluable and the whole space program rests on my shoulders, a two- or three-hour period might be carved out. I'm in the book, Commander. Please phone me. I won't phone. I'll pick you up. What kind of food do you like? Any kind. Partial to beef. Also seafood. No shellfish, though. Chinese, Italian, you name it. I'll plan the itinerary and the menu. See you at 8. Arrivederci, lady from the space agency. 8 o'clock, then, astronaut. Arrivederci to you, too. I stood there and watched her walk away. I thought we talked for an hour, not minutes. And I knew everything I needed to know about her, even then. The only time in my life it had ever happened to me. And now I return to these things, these simple things. Now in the darkness, in the cold, the solitude. A stillness without measure. I remember music, colors, and a voice. How did you like the meal? Hmm? The food. Food? Oh, oh, it was wonderful, truly. But you've hardly touched it. Oh, yes, I have. I mean, I had a late lunch. I guess I'm not as hungry as I thought. Well, look at you. You haven't cleaned your plate either, mister. Oh, I was thinking. About what? Do you dance? Oh, no, not really. Neither do I. Never learned how. Oh, come on. I missed all the dances at school, even the prom. I don't believe that for one minute. Would I lie to you? I really don't know. You can teach me. What? Just the basic two-step or whatever they call it. You're asking the wrong person. Am I? Besides, they wouldn't let us dance in here. They wouldn't notice. A couple of duffers like us. Quick, don't look. How many people at the next table? I haven't noticed. My point exactly. They don't care about us either. Stand up. Oh, I couldn't. You're looking at me. Sorry. Something wrong? It's just that... A month from now, you will be off in space. And by the time you come back down again... You want to talk about that now? Only for the following absurd reason. I've known you for exactly three and a half hours. Is that all it's been? That's all. Three and a half hours. A long dinner and a short dance. And already, already... Already what, Sandy? Already, I feel a sense of loss. My life had been in the military. Always first aircraft, then space vehicles. And it had been missions projects and expeditions. There was no time for another kind of life. Intrusions that took the form of a face, a voice, a short month lived by a man and a woman drawing closer and closer together and finally becoming a part of one another. There's so little time for such a thing, for such a small thing. And then what time we had ran out and slipped away. Rechecking fuel supply. 
Fuel supply? Check. Testing rockets. Mark it from five. Mark. Five, four, three, two, one. Calibrate fuel consumption. Fuel flow at point two five and holding. Check and double check. All systems go. T minus one twenty. Setting countdown, Doctor Bixler. Only two more hours. Where is he? He'll be here. Man, oh man! I sure wish I was him. Do you? Well, why not? That kind of adventure, all the way to another galaxy. Quite a price to pay. Oh, sure, it costs a fortune. But think of it: one man in the whole of history going out into space with, with a key, you could say, a key to unlock all the, the mysteries. I'm beginning to think that not all mysteries are out there. One man, and for the right to have his adventure, our adventure, for the ritual of turning that key, he pays for it as no man has ever paid before. With all of his friends, his well-being, his sense of belonging, maybe even his sanity, everything on Earth that has meaning for him will now be just a memory. And you envy him? I guess he is to be envied. I envy him too. But what I don't envy is his homecoming. Sandy. Hello, Doug. I thought we agreed. I know, but I had to see you. It only makes it harder. I wanted to give you something—a small, unofficial gesture from one of the lesser bureaucrats of our good, gray, respectable government. Sandy. Unofficial, and very much apart from protocol. But I couldn't let you leave, Doug. Not without saying goodbye. Not without telling you that. I loved you very much. That I shall sorely miss you. That my life, whatever is left of it, will be a strangely meaningless, dull and empty place, without you to share it. No. Shh. Sh- 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 and this last paragraph. I wouldn't say this to you, if I didn't know you were the kind of man you are. If I thought it would even. Remotely affect you, or at least what you plan to do. I wouldn't say any of this, but I know you. I know that you're built out of a very strong alloy, and you may bend a little, but you'll never break. It's a very odd thing, Sandy. Very odd. But when I come back, when I touch this ground again, I know the first thought I'll have. I know the first thing it is I want to see, the very first, the first thing I want to touch. I'll be the little old lady in the lace shawl, the one waving the "Welcome Home" sign. So look for me, Doc. Will you look for me on the fringe of the crowd? I'll be, I'll be the one carrying the sign. And how much we had become a part of one another, despite the circumstances of both our lives, despite everything rational. We let ourselves reach into that strange, mysterious sea within us, called love, and then watch the ripples grow. Sandy, Sandy, where are you now? Sandy, across the void, my dearest. Through the millions of miles of cold and empty space, through the vastness of a naked desert of sky and stars, I feel your warmth, and I love you. I love you, Sandy. Final countdown. Mark it. All systems, one half, three quarters. We have full ignition. Blast off. I move now, 
But I streak across the heavens. I leave behind an earth that changes even now beyond my closed eyes. This, then, is the hero's journey. From a warm place of leaves and trees and summers full of dreaming to a cold orb hanging in a dark sky and a place I do not know. To return one day with stories to tell my tribe on the rock they call home. I feel it growing smaller and smaller and smaller and time passes inexorably and eternally and I can do nothing about it nothing at all Commander Stansfield Douglas scanning vital signs life functions check metabolism stable return mission on course re-entering Earth's solar system prepare for approach Initiate signal transmission. And now it ends where it began. Time without measure reduced to a single point of light. I see it. The blue seas wrapped in clouds. A flash of green showing through. Where humankind sits on a rock and waits for the word from above. Or perhaps they do not wait. Perhaps they have forgotten. But I have not. I am he who waits like a rock. Earth, I feel you near me. As this comes in, so much loneliness will go anywhere. And something else, old and yet new, returns to fill the void. I feel you. I feel her. Mission control. Mission control. Come in. What's this? Where? On the trivet. Looks like a craft on the approach. Yeah, I see it, but what kind of craft? Could be a missile. Activate the defense shields. Setting coordinates. Locked on. Lasers on standby. This is gonna be easy. Almost too easy. Whoever he is, he's a sitting duck. Wait a minute. Look at the shape of that thing. Some kind of retro design. Hey, bring it up on the hell screen. I can almost make out the numbers. Run a pattern recognition. That'll nail down the model and country of origin. Scanning for recognition. Yes? General Walters, spacecraft re-entry, sir. Satellite of origin? That's just it, sir. It wasn't launched from orbit. Then from where? Unknown. It's spiraling into the atmosphere. Spiraling? Patch me into visual. Yes, sir. Good Lord. What, sir? I've seen this one before. Running a configuration ID, it's definitely one of ours. By the markings, it's a ship called... The Soul Two. The prototype is at the Smithsonian, commanded by... I've got the stats. Somebody named Stansfield. Douglas Stansfield. Yeah, this is a real odd one, sir. A date of departure was 40 years ago. 41 to be exact. You're not going to believe this, but he was a hero of mine when I was a boy. Send in Vogler. Tell him to search everything we've got in the files. Right away, sir. It's downloading now, General. Who is he, anyway? One of the pioneers. Been in space several decades. Really? Presume lost a long time ago. Put it on the screen. Here's a report. He's been out of contact. This is the first communication we've had. The date, the log entries. He was tracked on radar when he left Earth space. But communications must have malfunctioned a few hours after he left the ionosphere. 41 years. And now they come back. Every month, every year, they keep coming back. Like aging birds returning to a nest. For what? That's the question. They went off on missions that became obsolete almost the moment they were out of sight. To blaze trails we've already charted by now. 
to bring back discoveries that aren't discoveries anymore. And still, they keep coming back. Burnt. Dented. Aged. And they keep coming back. Look at this. What? The footnote. This is a funny one. Let me see. There's an item inserted from a man named Bixler. Bixler? As I recall, he was one of the project people years and years ago. He probably handled the Stansfield mission. It says we're to contact a Miss Sandra Horn. Who's that? Sandra Horn. A friend of Commander Stansfield. And where would we find her, sir? In an old folks home? According to this, you'll find her in the hibernation room. A young woman of approximately 26 years of age. She must have been very much in love with him. Very devoted. A devotion without precedent. Say a prayer, son. A prayer, sir? That we find her alive. General Walters? Miss Horn, you look very well. Do I? You look just fine. Which may sound idiotic. But what do I say to someone who's just had a 40 year sleep? I was told... I was told Commander Stansfield... Commander Stansfield's ship landed six hours ago. I asked to see you first. What about Commander Stansfield? In good health. Naturally very tired. I want to see him. I must see him. You shall see him. But I had to talk to you. Is... is something the matter? I'll make this as brief as possible. Commander Stansfield had a communications failure. It occurred probably within the first 12 hours of his departure. There was only sporadic contact made during his entire flight, there and back. He reached the other galaxy. He reached it, he landed, he took off, he returned. There was no life where he went. We found that out ourselves 20 years ago. One of the ironies of our progress. We could have saved him the trip. We could have saved him. His anguish. I don't understand. His anguish being the following, Miss Horn. Unknown to us here or to my predecessors or theirs, due to the lack of communication, Stansfield arbitrarily removed himself from hibernation six months after leaving Earth. He did this because... because... I know why he did it. God help me. I know why. Over 40 years, Miss Horn. 40 years in the cockpit of a ship. 40 years of... Well... His kind of loneliness must have been something brand new in human experience. For what you both gave up, you deserve far better than this. I wish to God... I wish to God he could have come back to you just as he was when he left. But as it is, I'll leave you alone now. Doc? Dear Doc. You, you remember me, don't you? Remember you? I've spent 40 years remembering you, Sandy. I've spent 40 years painting a picture inside my head, remembering your voice, thinking about your touch. I've spent 40 years surviving for you. But it looks like I made a miscalculation, an error of judgment, you might say, with the best of intentions. And now... Doug, it can still be that way. What you are, what I am, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, I'm afraid it makes a difference, Sandy. Look at you. Forty years of difference. And that's far too much. I'm sorry. I'm so desperately sorry. I know, my dear. I had a lot of years to ponder the possibilities. But I didn't consider this one. 
Years that I didn't think would ever pass. Years that I sometimes wished wouldn't pass. Oh, Doug. You're as beautiful as ever. Very beautiful. Don't waste it. Go away now, Sandy. You must. Please, go home and pick up the pieces of the rest of your life. Go. If that's what you want. It's what I want. Goodbye, my love. Stansfield, if I may say so, you're an incredible man. Really, quite an incredible man. It may be the one distinction I can point to in my entire life. That I knew you. That I knew a man who placed such a premium on love. Truly, truly, Stansfield. Quite a distinction. Goodbye, General. Commander Douglas Stansfield, one of the forgotten pioneers in the space age, pushed aside by the flow of progress and the passage of years. Our tale of irony and the ionosphere and the ferocious travesty of fate that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Long Morrow. Starring Kathy Garver with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Roderick Peoples, Christian Stolte, Rich Kamenick, Jeff Lupiton, Meg Falcon, Heath Corson, Susan Hart, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hey, Perry. Yeah, over here. 
Find anything? I'm not sure. Right, we better get back to the car. I can't see where I'm going. Whoa, careful. Jeez. Why'd we get set out here on a night like this? First snowfall of the season? Watch your step, or you'll end up with mud all over that nice, clean uniform. I could sure go for some coffee right now. Well, there's a diner over on the road by the edge of the woods. Is it still open? Let's find out, as soon as we call in. So, uh, what did you see out there? Hard to say. Tops of some trees have been knocked off. Sure looks like something hit the pond, all right. Something like what? Huh? Maybe a plane. Yeah, no flights in the area, I checked. No, it could have been a private aircraft. Possible, I guess. Easy to get off course in this weather. Well, we're not going to find it with the water freezing. Whatever it is, it's going to stay under that ice till next spring. You think it could have been a meteor? Hmm? Maybe. Well, we better call in a report. Tell them there's nothing here. Lady who saw it wants to alert the National Guard. <laughs> That's all we need. This is 1183A. 1183A reporting in. We're checking out a report on a UFO, supposed to have gone down in the area of Hook's Landing. A what? Unidentified flying object. You serious? Don't kill the messenger. Just doing our job. Okay, did you find it? Well, it appears something did clip off some trees and came down, but whatever it was, she's under the ice in Tracy's Pond now, and we can't see a thing. Uh, hold on a minute. You see anything else? Nothing but a sea of snow. But there's something. Now, this is Paget again. We can't get a look around till morning. We're gonna head back in and then, uh... We're... Hey, Bill! Yeah? Looks like some footprints over here. What kind? It's hard to say. Maybe an animal? Maybe? Uh, they lead up out of the pond. What's going on out there? Uh, there appears to be some evidence that, uh... Say again? Those have got to be fresh prints with all the new snow. So if something did crash land, I'd say at least one person got out alive. They made it up to the woods over to the highway. Right. Just swam up out of the ice and then started walking. What are you talking about? We'll have to call you back. Come on, is this a gag? You guys are at the donut shop, right? Uh, we, uh, may have a situation up here. What kind? I don't know yet. We'll report back in a little bit. All right, Paget. Listen, there's talk about a bridge going out. Enough ice jammed against it to cool the Congo. So as soon as you can, better make sure it's posted and blocked off. Otherwise, you'll really have a situation. Got it. Roger and out. My flashlight's going out. Yeah, it's the cold. Mine's still good. Uh, let's have a look at those prints. See? They came out over here. What did? Well, whatever survived. Something left that pond. Came out here and went that way across the highway. Toward the diner. Hmm. Makes sense. Cup of hot coffee to take the chill off. Looks like a bus parked in front. Don't suppose it came out of the pond too, do you? These aren't wheel tracks. They're footprints. All right, then. Let's follow them and make sure that's where they lead. Say they do. Then what? Then I guess we go inside and check everybody's green card. And if we don't find any little aliens with three eyes, we we'll call it a night. That okay with you? Let's do it. Wintry February night. Order of events... Two state troopers take a report from a frightened woman and note the arrival of an unidentified flying object. Then the checkout you've just heard, as the troopers verify the event but find nothing more enlightening to add, beyond evidence of some strange lights and tracks leading across the highway to a diner. You've heard of trying to find a needle in a haystack? Well, stay with us and you'll be part of an investigating team whose mission is not to find that proverbial needle. No, their task is even harder. They've got to find a Martian in a roadside diner. And you'll search with them, because you've just landed in the middle of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? Starring Richard Kind, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hello, officers. Evening. Come on in. Coffee? You read our minds. Two coffees coming up. You guys sheriffs? State troopers. Any trouble out there tonight? Whose bus is that in front? Mine, officer. What's the problem? Bridge up ahead. It's been declared impassable. Oh, no kidding. The county engineer just put out a warning. Ice flow stacked up against it. 
Another pound of weight, it'll be driftwood. That's going to be tough. Really tough. All right, so it looks like you're going to have to turn around and go back. Spend the night at the last town. No can do, boys. There was a slide up at the turn off soon as we went through. Blocked the whole road. Looks like you're kind of marooned. Oh, no. I can't believe this. What are we going to do? We can't just wait here. Till morning, anyway. Till morning? No, no, that's quite impossible. No, I've got to be in Boston at 9 a.m. Then you better start walking, mister. That bus is going to stay parked out there till they fix the bridge. <laughs> Either that, or hope they drop you some snowshoes. I tell you, it's out of the question. I absolutely must be in Boston. I'll pay extra. Name your price, bus driver. No way. I'm not risking my life or the lives of any of these folks. Not to mention that bus out there. Property of the Cayuga Bus Company. Then I'll hire a cab. Where's the telephone? Right there on the wall. But don't waste your dime. Nobody will drive out here on a night like this, with the snow and all. This is outrageous! Do you know how much money is at risk? Take it easy, mister. That goes for everybody. Better make yourselves comfortable and uh, get some hot food in you. No problem. I can cook up any kind of grub you want. Cheeseburgers, bowl of chili, clam chowder. I even got some nice T-bones in the cold case. Anybody for steak and fries? You the owner? That's me. Haley's Diner. And I'm Haley. At least I was last time I looked. There a motel around here? Not for the next 35 miles. How about a boarding house? Anything? Nope. This is it. What are we going to do, George? Will the bridge be open by the morning? I can't guarantee it. I'm afraid you'll just have to take your chances. Oh, that's just great. That's really swell. You get comfortable, eat some grub. That's precious little consolation for my meeting in Boston. Calm down. We're all in this together. Why don't you just have a seat like everyone else? Oh, this is quite a bus line you work for. They don't care much about keeping a schedule, do they? I wouldn't be too hard on them, mister. They don't control the snowfall and the bridges and the avalanches and the sides of hills that decide to come down. That's pretty much out of their hands. They try, but sometimes Mother Nature, she just doesn't listen. Need I remind you they nonetheless have a responsibility to their passengers? A legally binding contract. What do you think? They're all up the bus, aren't they? <laughs> Are they? Well, I don't see any little green men, do you? Ready for a refill? Uh, not just yet. Let me ask you a question. Shoot. All these people from the bus? Well, now I guess they are. Where else would they be from? And well, that's what we were wondering. What's the trouble? We didn't say there was any trouble. Maybe not, but you fellas got that look in your eyes. What kind of look is that? Kind of on guard. Checking everybody out. I can see it in your face. So, you're tracking somebody, huh? An escaped fugitive? Nothing like that. Anything I can do to help, we'll let you know. This criminal, what do he do anyway? Oh, nothing yet. To tell you the truth, we're not sure who we're looking for, or even if he's here. So it is a he? Come on, Perry, finish your coffee. Now we better get a move on. How many people got off the bus? Take a look. The gang's all here. You saw them come in? Sure did. You there, driver. Yeah, officer? You have a passenger manifest? <laughs> Passenger manifest? Well, what do you think I got parked out there, a 707? Just answer the question. Mister, that's a 14-year-old bus, and business is lousy. Personally, I think my boss would run rum across the border if there was enough money in it. Me, I wouldn't do that, of course, because it's against the law. Besides, I'd get caught. Uh, but for now, we don't ask the passengers any questions. We take their fares, kiss them on the cheek, and help them on and off. We're glad to have them, with or without names. You know how many you had, though? Yes, sir, that I do know. How many? Six, unless one of them fell out a window when we hit a bump. I picked up six, and I'm supposed to deliver six. That's what they pay me for. And you don't have any kind of list. In that case, we might have a little bit of a problem. What's that? I count seven, besides Haley and the driver. Me too. So if nobody fell out, somebody must have jumped in. Wait a minute. The young couple in the booth... Those two retired folks, the lady at the table with the fake fur coat. This isn't fake, honey. It costs plenty. Sorry, miss. Uh, then there's Mr. Boston Big Shot and the old guy at the counter. Seven? You're right. It's funny. I know I only had six. Anybody in here before the bus stopped? Nope. I haven't served anybody since 11 this morning. What a day, huh? 
Then the bus pulls up and these folks get off. You saw that? Yep. I saw them walk in, all together. <laughs> Where else would they come from? Say, is this a trick question? They did. This place was empty when we came in. Then how do you account for seven people? Well, it sure beats me. So that means one of them didn't get off. Which one of you people wasn't on the bus? I was. We both were. What's he talking about? We all were. What kind of interrogation is this? It's not an interrogation. Then what would you call it? A police grilling? A lineup? Or are you fishing for something else? Some unspecified crimes? We're simply gathering information. Well, if we're going to be questioned, I insist on the right to consult with a lawyer. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Ain't that a good one now? First he wants snowshoes, then a lawyer. I didn't see you on the bus. <laughs> now, that's really funny, because I didn't see you either. So I guess that makes one of us a liar, don't it? All right, everybody, hold it down. Nobody's in trouble here. We just need your cooperation. This is preposterous. What difference does it make who was on the bus, who wasn't? And whether there were six, or, or, or seven, or, or 120. Easy, mister. And you, proprietor, you're supposed to be serving us. So we're going to get some food, or aren't we? Is this a diner or a Gestapo headquarters? What's it all about, fellas? Go ahead, tell him. You hear something fly over here tonight? Fly? You mean a plane? Anything. Hmm. Nope, I don't think so. Why? Well, there was a call into Central about two hours ago. Woman said she heard something fly over, and then she looked out of her window and saw it go down. Down? From where? From up there. Up there? Unidentified flying object. What? <laughs> well, now that's something new. Unidentified flying object, huh? Nothing come down from up there except snow, snow, and more snow. That's all I've seen for the past 14 hours. Where'd she say it came down? Close to here. <laughs> a UFO? Oh, that's a good one. Something did land in Tracy's pond. How do you know that? It left a lot of broken branches before it hit, and... And what? We found tracks leading away from the water, or rather the ice. Tracks leading where? To here. Let me get this straight. You mean somebody landed or crashed or whatever they did in Tracy's pond and then came here right into my diner? Oh, that's crazy. Nothing came in here since this morning. Nothing except... Except me and my busload. My six fares. I only had six. But there's seven in this room. That means one of these people. I don't like this. How do we even know you're state troopers? Easy, honey. They, they got uniforms. See their badges? I don't like this one bit. We're going away to get married, and now, now this, this thing happens. Sit down, Connie. It, it's going to be all right, I promise. How can you, George? How can you promise? Relax, miss. There's no need for... I'm trying to understand what you're saying, officer, but I'm not sure I... Let the man talk. You're trying to tell us that there's one among us? We don't know which one, mind you, who landed in some kind of flying saucer and then joined us, infiltrated the group, and then slipped into the diner right alongside us? Do I understand you correctly? Came in here with us, but that's not possible. We would have seen him. Not necessarily. Do you remember who you were sitting next to? Why, I wasn't sitting next to anyone. I was all the way in back, trying to take a nap. Well, there you go, then. It's snowing at dark, and we climbed out of the bus with our eyes closed because of the snowfall. Anyone could have come in with us, and we wouldn't have noticed. But you were all together on the bus. Some of you must have noticed who the other passengers were. That doesn't cut much ice. They loaded up in the snow down at Hook's Landing. How long ago was that? How long? Uh, let's see, we left the landing three hours and um, 12 minutes ago. And to tell you the truth, I don't remember who got on. All I know is there was an even half dozen. <laughs> Just like a real science fiction story. That's what she is. Like a regular Ray Bradbury. Six humans and one monster all the way from outer space. Wonder if it came from Mars or from Venus. Oh, why don't you keep quiet? What about you, fella? You wouldn't happen to have an eye in the back of your head, would you? I find you insufferable, sir. Do you know that? And you ain't no prize yourself. Well, what do you do now? Line us up for a strip search? Nobody said anything about a search. Good. Because there's a little matter of civil liberties. Without reasonable cause, you have no right to ask anything beyond identification. And more than that, you're skating on thin ice, legally speaking. Very thin ice indeed, sir. Well, go ahead. I'm a dancer. I don't have a whole lot to hide. I usually get paid to take off my clothes, but if that's what you want... Look, lady, this isn't exactly par for our course, either. We go off on an awful lot of nutty assignments, but this one... Then let me make it easy for you. 
I work a lot of clubs, and I know how to spot people. Go ahead. You pair off the couples. Since it's just one person who doesn't belong here, that eliminates the couples. Sounds logical. Whew, I guess that means we're in the clear. Cross us off. We're two of the humans. And us too. Yes, George. My wife and I were exonerated. Connie, Connie, what's the matter? Nothing. Yes, there is. What are you looking at me like that for? I, I could have sworn. Sworn what? That you had a mole on your chin. A mole? Connie, I've never had a mole on my chin. You did too. Honey, I did not. I can tell you what's happening now. We're all going to get so panicky that everybody and his brother will start picking up invisible clues from everybody else. This stuff is nonsense. It certainly is nonsense. If a husband and wife suddenly start to wonder whether the husband really is the husband or the wife is real, really, when did you start turning so gray? Now wait a minute. I think 23 years is long enough for a woman to figure out who she's married to. So stop looking at me like that. <laughs> oh, this is rich. I love this. Better than a horror movie. He don't know who she is, and she don't know who he is. And as for you, Miss Fur Coat, we don't know who you are. And that big talking lemon sucker over there, he's the most suspicious of the bunch. What's happening? That jukebox. It started up by itself. Who did that? Nobody was anywhere near it. That ever happened before? Not unless uh, you put a quarter in it. The lights! What's wrong with the lights? Somebody turn the lights back on. There's your lights again. Just gotta be patient is all. This happened a lot, does it? Not till now. Must have been the storm. Could have tripped a circuit breaker, I guess. Or a power outage. A line down somewhere. Only... Only what? Why did it last a couple of seconds and then come back on? Unless... What are you thinking? Unless someone caused it to happen. Where's your circuit box? In back. You want my flashlight? Everybody stay where you are. Leave your gun in your holster, Perry. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. We'll question each one of you one at a time. Now see here. One at a time. Stay seated, everybody. You got a back door to this place? Sure do. How does it lock? Night latch and key. Why? Where's the key? Right here on my belt. Go back there and lock it. It's always locked. But if that certain somebody is really from outer space, they'll just go through the wall anyway, won't they? <laughs> Check them for wings. Check them all for wings. Look under their coats. Might as well start with you, Grandpa. You got identification? I left it down there by the pond in my spaceship. Who won the National League pennant last year? What is this anyway? Some practical joke? If so, well, you've prolonged to be on the point of human endurance. <laughs> yeah, human. Just answer the question. I understand. I get it. So keep your bitches on. Pittsburgh Pirates won it, officer. And then they took four out of seven from the Yankees. That's right. Sharp boys, those two. Real sharp. Didn't figure a Martian would know anything about the great American pastime, did you? You got identification, miss? No, I don't. As a matter of fact, I left my wallet. I left my wallet with my suitcase. Hmm. And where's that? On the bus? I didn't give her a baggage check. I would have remembered. That means it was a carry-on. Was it? No. See there? You better strip search her pronto. It was shipped on ahead. What's your name, miss? Ethel McConnell. I'm a professional dancer. With how many legs? <laughs> how many you got under that coat? I'm gonna belt you, Grandpa. She was on the bus. How do you know? Yeah, well, she's the only one I noticed. Thank you. But who noticed him? <laughs> How do we know you're the same fellow who was driving the bus? There ain't nobody who's been exonerated yet, that's for sure. Look, let's cut this farce right now. That's what we're trying to do. Well, then let each one of us show our identification and put an end to it for good and all. This whole thing is getting out of hand. Then how do you explain the extra person in here? Very simply, the driver is mistaken. Seven people got on the bus and he thought there were only six. Is that possible? Not a chance in the world. I counted six heads before we took off, like always. There were six passengers. And what's your name? Olmstead. That's O-L-M. Oh, hey, hey, hey. hey. Who's doing that? Never happened before, I swear. Oh, I can't stand this. Connie, please, sit down. I mean it, I can't. Getting upset isn't going to help matters. What if, what if it were invisible? Sit down, please. What if there were something in here from that pond? Oh, Connie, 
What if there were, but we couldn't see it? I said, sit down. Hey, I'll see to her, officer. Honey, calm down. Why is he taking his gun out? Easy, Perry. I think it's time for a look around. All right, folks, we may have a good laugh about all this in the morning, but for the time being, do the smart thing. Everybody just stay where you are. My partner's going to check the grounds, and please, nobody do anything foolish like trying to leave. I'll be right outside the door. Perry? Here's your flashlight. Back door's locked up tight, like he said, and there's no tracks back there. Whatever it was, it came in the front door, just like everybody else. This isn't gonna work. What do you mean? We can't hold them here. We're not holding them. They can't go anywhere in this weather. Meanwhile, we're going to find out what happened. What if nothing happened? What if they're telling the truth? Look, add it up. Six plus one is seven. Is that nothing? Somebody could have remembered wrong. What about the tracks? We can't even see them anymore. But we did see them. We both did. Isn't that right? That's right. The question is, what should we do about it? We could have a group of innocent people in there. Well, if we do, we'll find that out, too. Hey, give me your flashlight again. What's the matter? What's that? Here you go, miss. One New York steak. Medium rare, just like you ordered. How much do I owe you? Put it on my bill, Haley. Sure, you say so. Hmm. No strings? No strings. With your bag stuck on another bus somewhere, back around Binghamton is my guess, it's the least I could do. You're a nice guy, Olmstead. Next time you're in the city, stop by the club. Drinks on the house. Baby, you got yourself a deal. Uh, hey, Haley? Yeah? Where are the troopers? Still outside, I guess. Snow seems to be letting up. Say, you didn't pull that gag, did you? The business about the lights and the jukebox starting up. Not me. I'm strictly short orders and pay my taxes to Uncle Sam. I don't know anything about science fiction. A jukebox is a jukebox. And if the blame thing feels like starting up on its own, you'd better go call an electrician. Don't have to do that. Just take me to your leader. <laughs> Snow's letting up, is it? Quite a bit. You can see the bridge now. And? Well, she seems to be holding up pretty well. I know that bridge. And what's more, I don't trust it. Well, then thank goodness it's not your judgment we have to concern ourselves with. Because if that bridge gets a clean bill of health, you're going to drive the bus across it. Mister, you may be a hot shot in Boston, Mass., but when it comes to bridges and buses, I got seniority. And I tell you, that bridge is so old that... There it goes again. Almost like a strobe light. They keep going on and off like somebody's throwing a switch. We're losing power. I'd say it's the whole area. Or it could just be right here. This is getting weird. Just plain weird. I wish whoever it was would play his cards right now and get it over with. Why don't they do something? What's the point of us all staying cooped up here and... Honey, sit down. I will not sit down. Take your hand off me, George. Oh, my. The young lady suffers from claustrophobia, I suppose. Isn't that just dandy for the rest of us? She's right. If this is some sort of a game, let him come out in the open like a man. That's right. It's because he's afraid. The human race is too tough for him, is that it? Well, I'll take him on. Even at my age. The point is, we're all kids in a closet here. What does that mean? We're all just as much in the dark. Nobody understands what's going on. But it happens to be a fact that if it was some kind of saucer that landed in the pond, and if he did come in here, I think it would be a real healthy idea if we pinpointed that particular somebody and kept him from leaving. That makes sense. I think that girl might have the right idea. Maybe whoever it is is invisible. Maybe he's just playing around, cat and mouse. Oh, please. That's utter nonsense. It's as good an explanation as any I've heard. But what if the thing doesn't show itself? Do we just sit around here holding our breaths? We may not have to. You mean you figured out who it is? Eh, not exactly, but we found something in the snow outside that may be a clue. Really? And what is it? An alien spacesuit? No. Just this. What is it? They look like scales of some sort. Oh, please, for the love of God. Look, it could just as easily be guitar picks dropped by some itinerant teenager. That's what I thought at first. But it turns out there are a lot of them outside, scattered in the snow, mostly under the snow by now. They sparkle when they catch the light, like 
fish scales. The trail leads across the highway, from the pond, straight to here. So this is the first hard evidence we have. I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm afraid it's true. Someone in this diner is not what they appear to be. By golly, I knew it. It's the creature from the Black Lagoon. Flew down here from some water world. And now he shed his skin like a snake. Better look under everybody's coat, boys. Pretty soon he'll be swallowing folks whole. What about you? I don't see you eating any food. I had me some fries and a Coke. Can't eat meat. Too greasy. Hey, my food's not greasy. Of course, it is a uh, ground-up cow. Now, if you ask me... Nobody asked you and nobody will. Why don't you leave the old man alone? And who invited you to speak your piece? Oh, I didn't realize we were waiting for invitations. I've seen your type, fella. You got a thing about bossing everyone around. Those scale things, they couldn't be from Mars. No water up there. Has to be Venus. Now, Martians, they hide in the sand till something comes by and zap, get them with their tongues, like one of them lizards out in the desert. Or is it the other way around? Look, it's bad enough having to sit here without listening to all this petty arguing. I told you it would come to this, and I was right. Come off that high horse of yours. Everybody sit down, now. We're not playing around here. What was that? The sugar bowls. They all cracked, just like they exploded. Well, now I gotta go and buy new ones. You all right, Miss McConnell? I... I think so. <laughs> now, who'd be calling here this time of night? I told headquarters where we were. I'll take it. Be my guest. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's Perry here. What's that? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. It's definite? Yes, sir. That's fine. Right. Thank you. Well? The bridge is okay. Well, it's about time. Are you sure? County engineers just checked it out. A load of snow just broke away, and, well, with no more snowfall, they say it's safe. Shall we go? Well, if that was a county, I reckon it's okay. I'm gonna take it real slow, though. What about it? We can't hold them. You're making a big mistake, officer. A big mistake. You're letting a monster out. Well, that might be, Pop. That may well be. But I can't hold people on suspicion of being... not human. You can move them out any time. Okay, folks, let's go. You're sure about the bridge, officer. I never liked that sucker. She swings in the wind, and she's not a suspension. Yeah, you can follow us. We'll take the car across first, just to be sure. You can pay your checks over here, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure serving you. Safe trip and Godspeed. You all come back and see us real soon now. Except for one of you, that is. Yeah, that's it then. Just like that. What was it all for, anyway? It was just part of the job, to protect and to serve. I sure hope they're going to make it safe and sound. I feel like we should follow them. Well, as soon as they cross the county line, they're out of our jurisdiction. All we could do now is lead them across the bridge and hope for the best. Whatever happens after that, it's out of our hands. Yeah. But I still got that feeling, you know? What feeling? Like, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. No tips. Not a one. We're closed. I said we're all closed up. Didn't you see the sign? Coffee, please. Black. All right. One coffee. But that's it. Kitchen shut down. Did you burn yourself? No. No. I'm all right. But what I mean is, didn't you get on the bus? I saw you with my own eyes. Oh, I did indeed. Yes, I went on the bus. And you know something? The bridge wasn't safe. It collapsed halfway across. State Trooper's car, the bus, kaplunk, right in the water. It's a terrible scene. But nobody got out except me. Except you? Except me. 
Lucky, I guess. Very lucky, but... But... But what? You're not even wet. Wet? What's wet? What do you mean, what's wet? You landed in the river, but your clothes are all dry. An illusion is all. Just an illusion. Like that thing playing. That's an illusion. Say, how'd you do that? Or the telephone ringing. Hello? Hello? Nobody there. You see, just an illusion. A parlor trick is all. What? What's going on? What are you, some kind of magician? Me? Hardly. See? Nothing up my sleeves. I'll take my gloves off so you can be quite sure. Uh, do you have a match by any chance? Your hands, you've got scales all over your skin. Well, what do you know? Before you faint dead away, I might as well tell you. The name really isn't Ross, and I wasn't really going to Boston. Actually, I've been sent down as an advance scout. You know, these, um, what do you call these, these cigarettes? Oh, they taste wonderful. We don't have a thing like this on Mars. No kidding. Uh, that, incidentally, is where I'm from. We're beginning to colonize, and my friends, who will be arriving shortly, I think they're going to like it here. It's a lovely area, so homey, so off the beaten track. Just the place to start a colony. Don't you agree, Mr. Haley? I don't mind. I have a little waiting to do myself. You see, Mr. Ross... Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> How did you do that? With your tongue? Most remarkable. Must have been 18 inches long. Ah, just a tasty little trick I learned back home. It makes it unnecessary for me to eat the local fauna. Which is, let's face it, pretty disgusting. Cows and all that. Anyway, the name isn't Haley. And I agree that this is an exceptional place to colonize. We folks from Venus had the same idea. Only, we got it several years ago. I think I ought to tell you now that your friends aren't coming. They've been intercepted. There is a colony arriving, but it's from Venus. If you're still alive when they get here, you'll see how much they differ. What do you mean by that, if I'm still alive? Not much silicon-based protein here, and I've always heard about Martians. An intergalactic treat. Supposed to be a real delicacy. Don't look at me like that. You stay away now. I'm just going over to the jukebox. For the time being. I agree about what they call music. It helps to pass the time. Why don't you play some while we wait? All right. If you insist. Incident on a small outpost of civilization. To be believed or disbelieved, depending on your frame of reference, your imagination, and whether or not you're from Mars, Venus, or Missouri. But no matter the degree of your skepticism, if a sour-faced dandy named Ross, who looks like a stocks and bonds salesman, or a big good-natured counterman who handles a spatula as if he'd been born with one in his mouth, if either one of these two entities walks onto your premises, you better hold his hand, scales and all, or watch his words, especially that long, sticky tongue of his. Because the gentleman in question just might try to colonize you, or at least take you with them on a one-way trip into the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, 
plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, starring Richard Kind, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Chaz Holloway and Dennis Etchison, and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, David Darlow, Brooke Sanford, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Kurt Nabig, Meg Thalkin, Lynn Foley, Carl Amari, Sarah Marks, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. John, dear. John, your breakfast is ready. John? Didn't you hear me? I said... John? I, I heard you, Martin. You've worked hard, seen the good times and the hard times. What are you doing? <laughs> Tying my shoes. Are you all right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, of course. Perhaps we should stay home. G give me a moment. Now, with the kids grown up, you're ready to retire and enjoy the good life. Shouldn't you make the most of your golden years? If you'd rather go another day. No, no. I'm sure they'll let us change the appointment. After waiting so long, I, I, I won't hear of it, Martha. A whole world out there, yours for the taking. A world of travel, adventure, all the things you've wanted to do. And now you have the time to do them together. Very well, then. I've made your breakfast. I I'll be right there. So don't waste another minute. Call the New Life Corporation today for your illustrated brochure. The cost is surprisingly affordable for so much. Remember, this is your time in the sun. Shouldn't you make the most of it? The New Life Corporation, where we make all your dreams come true. Uh. Oh! Darling, be careful. I said, give me a moment. Lie down. I'll bring you a tray. Martha, if you don't mind, I... I, I think I'll skip breakfast this morning. Is it, is it the pain again? It's only angina. Nothing to worry about. But I do worry. Let me call the doctor, please. Nonsense. He's done all he can. There's no point. Oh, John. John, what are we going to do? You know as well as I, we must. We must go. There's simply no more time. <laughs> if you're sure. Of course I'm sure. Oh, John. There, there. It'll be all right. You'll see. And now, back to our program on the Vacation Channel. Adventure for Two in Paradise. Mr. and Mrs. John Holt, 
two gentle aging people who slowly and with trembling fingers turn the last pages of the book of life and hope against logic and the preordain that some magic printing press will add to this book another limited edition. But these two senior citizens happen to live in the future, only a few years from now, but a time when almost nothing is impossible. Mr. and Mrs. Holt in their twilight years, who are about to discover that they've entered a zone of the very same name. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Trade-Ins, starring H.M. Winant and Peggy Weber, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Which floor is it? Be patient, Martha. It will soon be there. Morning, folks. Good morning. I wonder. Martha? Yes? Can I help you? No, no, thank you. The New Life Corporation? That's right. Um, 67th floor. Straight ahead when you get off the elevator. You can't miss it. Thank you, young man. That's very kind. No problem. Well, this is my stop. Take care, folks. Do you think he was one of them? Hmm? One of their clients? Oh, I doubt it. Just a businessman on his way to work. But he was so young. Everyone is young, Martha. The world is for the young. Ah, here's our floor. You look nice, dear. So handsome in your suit. <laughs> Very old suit. But I'm, I'm sure it doesn't matter as long as we have the money. You brought it? In my coat pocket. All of it? Don't worry. It's safe and sound. New Life Corporation, please hold. Hello. You must be... Mr. and Mrs. Holt. Of course. Won't you take a seat? We have an appointment. With Mr. Vance. Certainly. I'll tell him you're here. Thank you kindly. I have a Mr. and Mrs. Holt to see you. Yes, sir. He'll be right out. Can I get you anything? Coffee? A soft drink? No, no. It won't be long. There are some e-books in the waiting area. That's all right. My eyes, you see. He I... has trouble reading, even with his glasses. Please, Martha. I'm sure the young lady isn't interested in such things. Mr. and Mrs. Holt. Mr. Vance. We've spoken on the phone. How nice to finally meet. Won't you come this way? Now then, let me see. You're 79 years old, Mr. Holt? That's correct. And you, Mrs. Holt? Why, this must be a misprint. It says that you're... I'm 74. No. I was 74 last May. I find that hard to believe. <clears throat> I, I sent all the records, including our medical history, if you need anything else. Everything seems to be in order. You have a history of illness, Mr. Holt. Some. More than your fair share. A great deal of illness, I'd say. From time to time. I'm so sorry to hear that. And are you in pain now, Mr. Holt? Some. He's in great pain. It's fairly constant now. It doesn't seem to let up. I see. Which is one of the reasons that the New Life Corporation exists. But surely you can't remove pain. Only a doctor or perhaps God could do that. Not remove. Alleviate. Banish. We make it a thing of the past. After a while, our clients forget even the memory of pain. I, I wouldn't want any more drugs. No, well, we don't deal in pharmaceuticals. That's the province of the medical profession. What we deal in is youth, Mr. and Mrs. Holt. We deal in a resurrected life. Our stock and trade is simply, well, some call it rebirth. An apt word, and believe me, it's no exaggeration. Could you... Could you tell us what's involved? Easily. The process is quick, merely a matter of hours, and guaranteed painless. Guaranteed? But how? Precisely. We supply synthetic bodies. Bodies that are perfect in concept, composition, construction. Physiologically and psychologically, you'll find that you're just as you are now in every way, except in a different body. A younger body, in the prime of health, both materially and emotionally close to perfection. Um, th these bodies that you speak of, 
We construct them ourselves on the premises using only the finest components, plastic, flesh, bone, steel. Did you say flesh? For some of the interstitial connections, we grow specialized cells for that purpose. They're permanently nourished to remain self-repairing and self-regenerating, supported by completely inert, non-corrosive materials. The wiring and circuitry are designed to duplicate the human neurological system, and the joints, such as the hip bones and knees, are almost totally invulnerable to disease or damage. So you see... How long do they... The lifespan of our units is roughly 112 years. <gasps> A hundred and... You've been married for how long? Fifty years. We had our golden anniversary just two months ago. That's... that's sort of the reason we finally decided to come here. Isn't it, John? A rich life. A happy life. A full one, I'm sure. I can see it in your eyes. And quite naturally. You don't want this relationship to end. Oh, it can't end. Martha... Martha is all that I've got. All I care about. Of course. Well, why don't I show you some pictures of the models we have available? No pictures. Well, they're very lifelike, all three-dimensional photography. My eyes, they aren't very good. In that case, why don't we go directly to the display cases, so you can view the finished product. May we? As long as you don't mind a brief walk. Not at all. If you'll please follow me then, the showroom is just here in the hall behind my office. Oh. It's so beautiful. Would you like to take my arm, Mrs. Holt? That man under the lights. Is he one of your creations? The young man in the tracksuit? Why don't you ask him? Ask? B but if he's only a mechanical device. Actually, he's programmed to answer with the aid of a voice chip. A temporary addition to make the display more lifelike. But as of now... He's still just a receptacle, a shell, waiting to be filled. There's no consciousness as such. He has a variety of preset responses, though. Go ahead. Ask a question. <clears throat> you there, young man. What are you doing? I'm training for the Olympic triathlon. Wait till you see how fast I can run. My shoes are manufactured by Mercury Plastics. I come complete with a brand new pair and a gift package of home workout equipment, all courtesy of the New Life Corporation. Oh, my word. He looks so strong. <laughs> but I wouldn't need such muscles. I, I was never very athletic. A valid point. If physical achievement isn't important, then you might want to consider another model. Oh, who is the young lady? This is our queen of the Harvest Moon Ball. I see. She's very beautiful. Hello. I was the homecoming queen at my school. And now, I'm a champion ballroom dancer. Do you like my evening gown? You're quite lovely, miss. I come with a fabulous selection of gowns, all custom designed. My shoes are part of the package, too, thanks to the New Life Corporation. Well, you are the prettiest girl I've ever seen. I could never wear such a dress. Of course you could. You did. Do you remember the dance where we first met? I was never so slim. But you were. Now oh, you're being silly. Please, let's move on. I think you'll like the next display. Ah, wh wh what's that? Look, John, there are two young people. Our beachcombers. His physique would be ideal for a man approximately 22 years of age. See the proportions and the musculature. Nothing too extreme. She has such a small swimsuit. The female component. Note how they complement each other. This particular model would be roughly 21 years old, three inches shorter than the male, of equivalent health and potential, capable of walking for miles along a beach. We've given them both a foot structure with the perfect arch and legs that are polymer reinforced. Look at the ankles. And the hands. My hands were never like that. Yes, yeah, yes, they were, Martha. Don't you remember? We like to see these two go as a package, and you needn't worry that there'd be others like them. Each model is designed with distinctive features. None are exactly alike. How would, uh... Yes? I'm not clear on the procedure. What would happen? I mean exactly. Very simple. We put you to sleep, and then we transfer all your memories, personality, and so forth into these replicas. You'll awaken in your new bodies and live a lifespan 
and a quality of life never dreamed of before with health, contentment, and purpose. And there's no pain? None. Are you sure? Are you sure there would be no pain? No pain, Mr. Holt. For the first time in how long I can only guess, you'd be free of pain. You'd be a young man again in the prime of life. It's too much to believe. And you, Mrs. Holt, would be at his side. Instead of the end, it would be the beginning. Do you know what that means? What about the memories? Memories? They will be transferred in full. There's no loss. But the actual moment of transfer. If a new life begins, then the old one must end. A kind of death for the mind as well as the body. And so uh, that is what I will experience, death. Are you afraid of dying, Mr. Holt? Not afraid. But if all that I have been comes to an end, then this rebirth, it's not something for me to know. Perhaps that's even a good thing, to go to sleep at last. Oh, well, there's no loss of consciousness. The continuity is seamless. What you'll experience is a sudden dramatic change for the better. It may take some getting used to, but we have a counseling service available. The process itself is so simple, so uncomplicated, you'd really be quite amazed. Mr. Vance? Mr. Vance, you're wanted in the teleconferencing room. Would you excuse me for a moment? Yes, of course. Please, feel free to walk around, look at the other models. If you have any further questions, I'll be right back. We'll be here. John, it's like... A, it's like a miracle. Yes, maybe too much like a miracle. What do you mean, John? Too much like a miracle. It just doesn't seem real somehow. But look, you can see what they've built. Not the technology, the thought of it. To live without pain, just the thought of that and nothing else. Ay, to be young again, to have it the way it was, Martha. Oh, yes, think of it. A second chance, the two of us. Yes. We'd have it to do all over again. <laughs> you think you can stand me for another entire century? For a century or ten centuries. <laughs> Till death do us part, John. Till death do us part. I do apologize, folks. That was a call I had to take. We understand. Well, now, have you chosen? These two here. The young ones at the beach. An excellent choice. Two of the finest we have. Now, we could begin any time. How about tomorrow morning? Tomorrow, you say? What about... Yes. She means what about, our, well, you know, our, our present selves. Ah, I should have mentioned that. Your remains will, of course, be taken care of in any way you see fit. Whatever you've provided for in your wills. Burial, cremation. We don't encroach on the business of funeral homes. So you are saying that, well, that if we make the arrangements today, then tomorrow morning... <laughs> I'm an incredibly bad salesman. I forgot one of the most important points. The guarantee. Guarantee? But how? You can have the transformation on approval for one week. After the test period, if you're not fully satisfied, we can always exhume your old bodies. You mean our bodies will already have been... Not exhumed in the usual sense. They will be held intact, preserved, if you will, in a precisely monitored, germ-free environment. If, for some reason, after the seven-day period, you decide against your new life, but you'd be surprised at how infrequently that occurs. Or rather, you wouldn't be surprised. We've had better than 98% satisfaction in the 12 years we've been operating in that case, Mr. Vance, there, there is only one more question. How much? How much will it cost? There is no price given in your brochure. Why don't we go back to my office, where we can be more comfortable? It's this way. Uh, please excuse me. Uh, I think we'd better find out now. What is the price? The entire procedure, and that includes the guarantee and all services connected with the transfer, would be 25 per person. 25,000. So for the two of you, it would be only $50,000. That's correct. 
quite reasonable, considering that there's nothing else like this on the market. By prorating it, Mr. Holt, in other words, figuring it on a basis of cost per year, I might say it's ridiculously low. I mean, 25,000 per 100 years of lifespan. Well, you can see how very economical it is. We've got nearly $25,000 in this envelope, Mr. Vance. We allow a 5% discount on multiples if they're purchased at the same time. The extended warranty is extra, but if I do say so, it's only prudent to... The 25000 is all we have. Can we make a partial payment? Partial. Well, we could pay this much in cash and then charge the rest. I'll be able to work again. You can take it out of my salary as much as you want until the balance is paid. I'm sorry, Mr. Holt, but my hands are tied. Government regulations prohibit any extension of credit in these matters. The transaction must be in cash. But that's all we have. It's all we have in the world. We've been saving and saving it. Why... We've done without practically everything. The doctor bills ate up almost all of our retirement account, but this money, this, this is pennies, nickels and dimes. Sometimes it was only one meal a day. No vacations, it was no movies, no going out for months. It was my wife wearing the same coat for years, the same dress over and over. I'm sorry, Mr. Holt. Believe me, I am. But these are the rules I have to follow. They don't allow me any leeway. There is, of course, one alternative. And what is that? We could perform the transference for just one of you. Yes. Yes, that's the way it should be. No. You, you have it done, John. Use the money for yourself and have it done. And I can wait. That's not possible. But I wouldn't mind waiting. Not in the least. No, no, Martha. It's out of the question. I couldn't do that, Mr. Vance. Are you married? No, I'm not. Then perhaps you can't understand, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid it would have to be the both of us or neither of us. We cannot be separated. We, we have to be together. One is no good without the other. Of course. I understand. Perhaps... Perhaps some other time... I remember that poem by Browning. Grow old along with me. The best is yet to come. The last of life for which the first was made. Give me your hand, Martha. I'm all right. Give it to me. So I can kiss it. Don't worry, Martha. I'll find a way. Hi there, mister. <clears throat> Hello. What'll it be? Ah, a, a drink, yes. I, I'll have a drink. Sure, sure, sit down. What? Oh, of course. What's the matter, Grandpa? Feet hurting you? No, no, no. Not, not my feet. Hm. Well, I'll take a load off. What, what kind of drink? What kind? Uh, you name it. Beer, scotch? Scotch, yes. That, that will be fine. House brand okay? Pardon? Regular or special label? Which is less expensive? Don't worry, Grandpa. I got what you need. Make a new man out of you. Excuse me, I... Um, well, I've, I've heard... Uh, yeah? What, what have you heard? That there is gambling in some of these establishments. Is that what you heard? Well, you heard wrong. Gambling's against the law. Yes, I know, but I understand that if a man wishes to participate in a game of chance, there are private rooms. Not in here. This place is strictly legit. That'll be six bucks. Six? For the drink. Uh, ju just a moment. Say, Grandpa, what happened? You sell the farm? No, no, I sold nothing. Better be careful. There's some types around here I'd like to relieve you of that wad. Oh, I'll be careful. Very careful. Thank you. Where are you going? Oh. Yeah, I, I think I'll go home now. I don't feel well. Oh, hold on a minute. I, I gotta get your change. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, here you go. Seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty, and fifty. Thank you. Say, Gramps, you know that question you asked me about the private game? You know of such a place? Well, as a matter of fact, 
I just heard something. Might be of interest to a man like you. Is that right? See that door back there? Uh, by the phones? Yes. If you was to knock on that door, there's a man named Faraday. He has a few friends over sometimes for a private party. And when are these parties held? Well, it just so happens there's one right now. Maybe he could help you out. As a special favor, tell him Rich said it was okay. Now you say I... Well, I, I suppose that would be all right. If you let him know, ahead of time, give him the word and all. Oh, oh I, I see. Uh, you would like a tip. Will, will this suffice? Huh. Five bucks? Here, I, I can't see. Please, keep the rest of the change. Well, that's real generous of you, Grandpa. Faraday, big guy, bald head, wears a cashmere coat. I understand. If you want any more drinks, just let me know. I'll keep them coming. Thank you, young man. Hey, Grandpa, you didn't touch your scotch. Yeah? Mr. Faraday, please? Nobody by that name. But the bartender, he told me... Which bartender? I believe his name is Rich. Wait here. This is the guy. Uh -huh. Are you Mr. Faraday? What do you want, Pop? I'm told that I can gamble here. Gamble, huh? Well, that might be arranged. We have something to back it up. You got a bankroll? Yes, it's all here. Yeah, it looks like you do. Horse come in? No, sir, I'm not much for gambling. Is it enough? Now, why don't you step inside? If it's all right. Place your bets. Insurance. Here we go, down the derby. What's your pleasure? Dice, poker, red dog? I don't know very many games. I... I used to play a little poker. Did you know? When I was younger. Well, what do you know? There just happens to be a game open. There does? <laughs> we got a chair for you right over here. Are you sure you don't mind? Oh, don't worry about it. Come on, Pop. Have a seat. There you go. We have a new player, gentlemen. Let the game begin. Should I buy some chips? Oh, that's okay, Pop. Money talks. You sitting in, Faraday? Don't mind if I do. Oh, unless the new player has an objection. Why, no, it's your establishment, is it not? I should introduce you around. This is Mickey. Hi there. And Steve-O. Hi there. And, uh, the Count. How do you do? You are royalty, sir? Nah. They just call me that, cause... Cause he's the best card counter ever came in here. That's why we barred him from the blackjack table. But I let him stick around. He just loves cards. Yeah, yeah. Whose deal? All yours, Count. Shuffle them up real good now, so Pop here has a square chance. You got it. Shouldn't we ante first? Listen to the man. Hey, we got a real poker player here. Yeah, it sure looks like it. You comfortable, old man? Oh, I... <clears throat> yes. Uh, perfectly. Because if you aren't, I can get you a pillow. For your back or whatever. Lay off, Stevie. He said he's okay. I just thought... Hey, cut the chatter and play cards, all right? The game is five-card draw. Jacks are better. Progressive. Jacks. Jacks are better. Uh, so that means I have to have at least two jacks or... Ah, you've played this game before, haven't you, Bob? It's been many years. Oh, wait, 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 wait. If you got any doubts, I mean, maybe you shouldn't do this. Uh, perhaps you're right, Mr. Faraday. You sure you want to be here? I... I just happened to need the money. Need it bad, huh? Very bad. Hey, are we playing poker here or what? Uh, hold it, I said. Don't anybody pick up your cards. Look, you know, Pop, there's two sides to every street. Yes? I mean, you can triple what you got in ten minutes. Or you can walk away from the table with a big fat goose egg. It's been known to happen. You don't have to explain. I understand. <sighs> You're the boss, Pop. Two jacks are better. You can't open. Nobody gets him next hand, his queens are better, and so on. Ah, yes, it's beginning to come back. Deal him. Cut first. Go on, Pop, cut the deck. Beautiful. Here we go. To you, Faraday. Check. Now I'll open for ten bucks. Okay, ten it is. How about you? The smallest I have is a fifty-dollar bill. How much do you want to bet, Pop? Well, I suppose uh, I'll bet fifty. You mean you raise? 
I'll raise, yes. Too rich for my blood. I'll see him. You will? Forty to you. I know, I know. Let me think. Okay, I'll see it. Aren't you gonna raise him? You do it. No, thanks. Here's the forty. Cards? Take two. Mickey. One card. Make it a good one. Mm, two for me. It's up to you, fella. I have a question. Yeah, Pop? Is it required that I take any cards? Well, no. But if you think you can improve your hand... I believe I will play these. Oh, look at this. He's standing pat. Dealer takes... Four cards. Fifty dollars. Fifty? You heard the man. <sighs> I'm out. No way. Me neither. Not with these cards. Your turn. I'll bet one hundred more. Oh, yours, fella. Unless you want to see him, Mr. Faraday. Yeah, not this time. That's it, Pop. Do I show my cards now? No, keep them down. Nobody called you, so you win. Just take the pot. I see, Mr. Faraday. Thank you. Thank you all. See, Pop? It's easy. Nice, friendly table. That's what we have here. All right, next deal. Same game. To you, old man. You in or out? How much? One to call. One. Yeah, one thousand more. Unless you want to raise. I can't raise. I only have one thousand dollars left. Yeah, we know. Then I... <coughs> I... <coughs> oh, oh. You sick, Pop? I'm all right. No, no, you're not. It's between you and the old guy, Faraday. Excuse me for a moment. You're pretty bad off, aren't you? Long time? The last several years. I'm about oh. to clean you out. You know that, don't you? I'm sorry to hold up the game. I... I'll feel better in a minute. Why do you need the money, Pop? It doesn't matter now. No, oh, no. Go ahead. I'm interested. My wife, Martha, and I wanted new bodies. It cost $50,000. I only had half of it. But I botched it up. I'm no good at this. I'm no good at anything anymore. Just a tired, sick old man who can't walk to the corner without swallowing a pill who leans on his wife when he takes three steps. Just a tired, sick old man, not worth anything to anybody. I wanted to be young again. I wanted to be strong. I wanted to begin all over. I wanted... I wanted to wake up one morning and get out of bed and not feel pain. That's all. You're raised, Pop. Then I... I call you. Look at that pot. Must be twenty grand. Twenty-five. Show him what you got. Read him and weep, old man. Pop first. I have... these. Three big ones. Kings. At least he had something this time. Are you able to beat that, Mr. Faraday? Nope. <sighs> you, you don't mean it. Be my guest. Game's over, Pop. You walk away. You came with 25, you leave with 25. Then, then I still have enough for one. Martha will understand. I, I, I can't help it. I, I can't live like this, not with the pain. She'll understand. I, I don't have any choice. I don't have any choice at all. Go on, Pop. Get out of here. Yes. Yes, thank you. Th thank you all, gentlemen, very much. What are you doing, Faraday? You know you had him beat. Let me see. Just like I thought. Three aces. Why'd you let him walk away? I'm not sure. But look at it this way. I'm even. We're all even. There'll be other games. Plenty of other games. Only... Not for him. Sorry to keep you waiting again. Martha. It's all right, dear. I understand. Do you? I told you before. You should be the one. This is the way it should be. Forgive me, Martha, please. Please forgive me. It was just I can't stand the pain anymore. Of course you can. Mr. Vance, 
John is ready now. Go ahead, my dear. They're waiting for you. Are you, Mr. Holt? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Martha, I... I'll be waiting for you, my darling. Mr. Vance? Just a few more moments, Mrs. Holt. What is under the sheet? It's my husband, isn't it? Only his old form. Go ahead. Take it on to preservation. Yes, sir. Your husband is fine. He'll be coming right out. Martha! Martha! Look at me! Oh, John! Oh, you look wonderful! Look at me, Martha! I, I could run a mile, I could do push-ups, handstands, anything, Martha! Look at how young I am! And no pain! No pain at all! No, thank you, Mr. Vance! Thank you and bless you! Don't thank me. Thank the surgeons. I promise you I'll never forget it. Martha, my darling, do, do you know what happens now, do you? You and I, Martha, now we'll really begin to live. We're going to do everything on God's earth we haven't been able to do. The big things, little things, the wild things, the crazy, illogical things. The things we were too old or too sick or too tired to do. Oh, oh that'd be wonderful. Do you understand, Martha? Every day is going to be a wedding day for us. Every afternoon a reception, every evening a honeymoon, and every seventh day an anniversary. Yes, darling. If only it could be. Martha, my darling, you and I are going to live for years, decades. We are going to... You will, John. You will. But I look at my hand next to yours. Look at it. It's old, John. It's so very old. Martha, no. I have some papers for you to sign, Mr. Holt. Would you come with me? No, what have I done? What have I done? You can carry it back to the display now. Right, sir. The beach scene? That's correct. Just as it was with the other. My husband. He's waiting for you, Mrs. Holt. Where? Through there, in my office. John. Martha. There you are. There is my husband again. My wonderful, wonderful husband. Martha, my dear. I must apologize. Hush, hush. You are my dearest one. Martha, if it must come with occasional pain, then so be it. I wouldn't have it any other way. My love. Remember, Browning. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. The last of life for which the first was made. Yes. Our times are in his hand. Who saith a whole I plan? Youth shows but half. Trust God. See all. Be not afraid. I'm not afraid. You know, John. Nor am I. From Cahil Gibran's The Prophet Love gives naught but itself and takes naught from itself. Love possesses naught nor would it be possessed. For love is sufficient unto love. Not a lesson, just a reminder from all the sentimentalists in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. 
Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Trade-In, starring H.M. Winant and Peggy Weber, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Doug James, Todd Manley, Andy Herman, Sarah Marks, Brooke Sanford, Rick Vargas, Vince Amari, Roger Wolski, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>